Thank you, ladies and gentlemen. Well, my, uh, as you know, my, my name is David Wynn Miller, but I punctuate my name. George Washington, Thomas Jefferson, Abraham Lincoln, uh, Benjamin Franklin, all punctuated the name same as I did. They were all 34-degree Master Masons. Now, I don't know if there's any Masons in the crowd, but I am a 92nd-degree Mason. Uh, I know you've been taught that Masonry goes to 33 and 34 degrees for Grand Masters. The reason I'm a 92nd degree Mason is because in 1988 I broke the math interface in all 5,000 languages, proving that language is a linear equation in algebra. This hasn't been done in 8,500 years of written language. When I did so, I was able to unlock the two-thirds of all the words missing from all languages in the world, and I can write any sentence in any language, frontwards and backwards, with the same meaning. Once this was discovered, it completely... Uh, 48 hours after I published on the Internet, I had two Secret Service agents from Washington at my front door going, do you realize what you've done? You've just disqualified every treaty, trust, and contract in 8,500 years on planet Earth. I says, well, uh, he says, who did you tell? I says, everyone. I says, I sent out uh, 100 videos, 20 hours long, including a 100-page report on the entire studies, to all nations of the United Nations and over 100 TV and news agencies around the United States. By doing that, I protected myself because when you have a secret that is so profound that it would disqualify planet Earth, it would cause you to get shot. <laughs> and at every seminar, at, by the end of the seminar, there's always a dozen people that walk up to you and say, why are you still walking around? Well, as Pandora... Uh, uh, destroyer of worlds. Now, you might think that that's a bad thing. The word destroyer, D-E means no, and stroy is contract. Of is an adverb which connects to a pronoun in front of it. P-R-O means no, N-O means no, and U-N means no. So the word destroyer is a no, no, no word. Of is an adverb, A-D-V. It's a modifier. Modifiers connect the pronouns in front of it and modify the verb after it. Modification is change, change is motion, motion is action, and action is verb. Therefore, the word world becomes a verb. Do you live in a world of verb, or do you live in a world of a fact? As you all know, the, world is a, the word world is a fact. But because it's the destroyer of verb, I destroyed the world of verb in all 5,000 languages worldwide on April 6th, 1988. And so with that said... How did this come about? Well, in 1980, I went through a divorce. And in the divorce, Judge Stanley Miller said, you cannot uh, be a father to your children. And he took away my children. I'm going, why would you do that? I've been a good father for 10 years. And he goes, because I'm a judge, he says, and I can take away people's children just because I can. I says, well, that's sex discrimination under the 1964 Civil Rights Act for Equality. Uh, I says, I'm going to prosecute you. And he says, you can't prosecute judges. He says, I beg the difference. I says, I know what the law is. You swore to support the Constitution of the United States and the laws written by the United States Congress, Senate, and Legislature. I says, that includes equality. I says, if I don't have equality, that's discrimination. Pretty simple. So I, I prosecuted Judge Stanley Miller in 1980, and he was disbarred as a judge. Six year, seven years later, Stanley Miller got reappointed again. Two weeks later, after he was reappointed, I showed up in his courtroom, had him disbarred again four days later. Because <laughs> seven years later, 1994, got reappointed again. And uh, I uh, showed up in his courtroom two weeks after he got reappointed, had him disbarred a third time. Three years later, he died in 1997 and uh, never served much on the bench. Always was an administrator, but never a, a judge. In, uh, in, as, as a result of that, when the judge took away my children, that violation, that breaking of my heart, put me on a path. And that path was anger. You don't take away a, a parent's child. And the, the pain that that caused, pain makes thought, Thought makes wisdom, and wisdom grows to maturity. So as a result of that pain, I started studying. Now, we go through three phases in life. You do not know what you do not know. 
Well, it's like putting your hand in fire. It looks pretty until you touch it and you get burnt. Well, you know what you don't know about why you got burnt. And I was aware of what I didn't know, so I had to study. And so because I studied, I learned about what, what the fire was. I learned about what the pain was. And from that, I then had knowledge. And when I had knowledge, I knew what I knew. And then I could become a teacher. In 1975, I became a college professor in Milwaukee. And I was uh, taught engineering and uh, metallurgy, heat treating, and blueprint reading. So I've been a teacher now 30, so well, 75, so going on 38 years. I hold a professional license for college. I also have three PhDs and 535 college credits, 17 full-time years of college. Kind of got stuck in college. I really liked it. I worked third shift nights as a tool and die welder, and I went to school full-time days. I had my and the butt to fill in my spare time because I didn't sleep. Um, I went ahead and had a second full-time job, and that was in real estate, teaching underwater welding. Uh, I had my own real estate company for 26 years, besides doing law from 1980 to present time, 32 years. I have 80,000 hours of law experience. And uh, I've fielded, uh, I've done 2,500 seminars, including uh, over 1,000 TV and radio live performances. I did the programs on 9-11 on national television on what really happened there. Uh, there's only a few people in the world that have my background and credentials about what heat treating is, nuclear science, string theories and quantum physics. I have a 200 IQ. I read 400 words a second in math codes. It's uh, something that's uh, acquired art. Uh, you can give me an inch of paper and I'll, of documents, and I'll blow through it in about a minute. And I'll be able to tell you exactly about how many mistakes are in it and then what to do about it. The... Uh, the program today is going to cover many different aspects. So I'm going to go through uh, the parts of speech, which I wrote up here. It took six years of my life to discover this. It isn't really what you think it is. And what they teach you in school is not what you actually, uh, is actually what's going on. And I'm, this isn't to insult anybody, but all of you have a second grade reading level. And it isn't just you, it's the entire population of the planet was instructed and, and through TV, radio, newspapers, and magazines to keep you in a second grade reading level because that way they could harvest the entire population of the planet. There is a few individuals called federal judges and uh, chief federal judges at a state level that control the, what's called, parse syntax grammar and the secrets therein. When I broke the code in 1988, I went to the United States Supreme Court. I walked in there in 1989, and I says, I'm here to prosecute William Rehnquist, Chief Supreme Court Justice of the United States Supreme Court. Immediately, I was arrested for threatening the United States Supreme Court judge and taken into a closed room. Well, when we got down in that room, I had six marshals standing shoulder to shoulder around me, and... William Rehnquist came down from up in his chambers to see me, and I says, I have your signed confession for treason against the United States people. I says, I've, syntax, I've used parse syntax grammar against your opinion uh, since you've been in office. He says, okay, guys, you can all leave now. Mr. Miller and I are going to sit in this closed room. Uh, you've already frisked him. He has no weapons. He doesn't seem to be of stature that can, can overpower me. And we're going to have a little discussion. So for the next two and a half hours, William Rehnquist and I became very good friends. And uh, for the, that, until he died and I removed him from office in June of 2005, we were pretty good friends. I taught him syntax, the math interface on grammar, and he taught me all the secrets of the procedures of judges. But a lot of the things he taught me he was in error of because two-thirds of all the words were missing from the procedures by which he wanted to formulate answers. Now, believe it or not, we are all actors in a play that have been already written. All of you believe that you have a certain amount of, of choice to make in life. But the fact is, uh, and I will do this later this afternoon when we get into some history programs, 
that we are on timetables, timetables that run on seven-year international, uh, on domestic bankruptcies and 70-year international bankruptcies. These bankruptcies control the planet for the last 6,500 years in all countries. All countries worldwide are controlled by the post office, not the courts, not the judges, not the kings and queens, but the postmasters of the world run the entire planet, have for 6,700 years. Going all the way back to Pharaoh, henceforth the Masons. Now, a lot of you um, were in this room today. A room is a closed area, so therefore it's a court. I'm going to show you a dollar bill here, which you're all familiar with. And on the back of the dollar bill, you have the eagle, right? Notice the eagle's wings are turned up. If you notice the eagle's wings here are turned down. That's because it's a phoenix. This is Vatican rule, banking. And the flag here has yellow fringe on it. And the yellow fringe flag has a changes the dimension of the flag. This is a maritime braid for commerce. The fringe changes the description of the flag. It's under Army Regulations 840-10, Chapter 2-6. Allows for fringe to be put on military flags for parades. But anything you put on top of the flag cancels the contract of what a flag is. So even though you think you're looking at a United States flag, United, UN means no, and ITE is citizen. A no citizen's condition of state flag. Controlled by Vatican banking. You're all under commerce. Now who's the Vatican? They're postmasters. They work with Bern, Switzerland through the Universal Postal Union. On the 29th of September, 2009, I did a seminar in Auckland, New Zealand. In that seminar, there were 90 Auckland tribal chiefs of the 1,200 tribal chiefs that live in New Zealand. I then made a statement that the post office since 1800 has never had a correct parse syntax grammar, law, rule, regulation, or code in any language with any people on planet Earth. As a result of that, 72 hours later, three days, the United States Postal Service, which since 2000 has had a quantumized postal treaty with myself and Russell Gould, my business partner, two of us made corporate. On the, 28th, on the 27th of August, 1999, I sued the United States of America for the flag of the United States. I filed a new quantumized mathematical patent on the description of the flag of the United States, 1 to 1.9. And he used a correct grammar called parse syntax grammar. As a result of that, on August 12, 1999, I owned the patents to the flag of the United States of America. And on August 13th, all flags had yellow fringe put on it because it had to change the dimension of the flag. Now, I don't know if you remember in 1968 when the astronaut, for those of you that are old enough, and I don't think there's whole lot of you here that are old enough. <laughs> uh, the, the astronaut stepped off his spacecraft into his footprints on the, moon, on, on the moon, turned around, looked at Earth, and says, oh, look at Earth is a vessel in a sea of space. And that, when I, with that one single sentence, Earth is a vessel in a sea of space, that's maritime. The entire world put yellow fringe on every flag in all 250 countries, in every courtroom, in church, and, and office, making everything on planet Earth maritime. Maritime is controlled by the DOT, Department of Transportation, which is controlled by the, United, by the Postal Service worldwide, Bern, Switzerland. Bern, Switzerland was established on the 22nd of October, 1871, in Hawaii, was the first city, first country as an independent nation to sign an international bankruptcy with Bern, Switzerland for two cents to transport cargo anywhere on planet Earth. And as a result of that, within a period of a year, all 250 countries for, two, for a two cent postage stamp signed up to be, give the post office authorization to transport vessels for a two cent postage stamp. Well, as you know, Think people were thinking of mail to send a letter. A letter is a vessel. Well, the word vessel includes cars, trains, planes, automobiles, 
overland stagecoaches, pony expresses, and human beings. And by doing so, they then captured all commerce on planet Earth by contract for a two-cent postage stamp. A year later, it went up to a buck a, buck a letter. But they got their foot in the door, and that was all that was necessary. Somebody left a little tiny article sitting on a, on a new, on a, in a newspaper in January 8th, 1872, on a microf microfiche dish in, in Honolulu, Hawaii, in, in the Ilani Palace, Ilani Palace Museum Archives building. Hightower and I went into that building that day, and we wanted to look for a flag of Hawaii. And they said, we guarantee there is no information in this building from 1869 through 1875. And they're going, now, why wouldn't there be anything? Uh, Hawaii's the center of the Pacific. Anything moving from east to west and west to east has to stop at Hawaii to get coal, C-O-A-L, for fuel, as everything ran on steam back then. So Hawaii then became the center of the entire Pacific Rim, hub to a wheel. Very, very important location. And by doing so, that started a, a series of events through the Universal Postal Union to capture the entire planet, throw the entire world into a postal zone. And this little tiny article, as it was put into place, uh, was left there. Nobody thought anything of it. Well, we did find a flag on the newspaper. It had eight stripes instead of seven. But there was also a little square, three inches by four inches, with the obituary. The obituary of the uh, Portuguese Masonic Eye, the French Masonic Eye, the German uh, uh, scale, and the English scale. So now we had a ordering all Masons in the Hawaiian Islands to come to Honolulu, Hawaii, to pay homage to King Kamehameha V, who died on the 6th of December. I'm telling you a story because it is relevant to the beginning of the takeover of planet Earth. As a result of this, uh, it takes a steamer three days to go from Honolulu, Altacona, and Hilo, and back again. So three plus three is six. January 8th and 6th is January 14th. January 14th, all the Masons get together with the post office, immigrations and customs, the Supreme Court of Hawaii, Guess what building they're all in? They're all in the same building directly across from the Queen's Palace in Hawaii. Immigrations, customs, the uh, lodge number one for the Masons, the Postmaster General of Hawaii, all in the same building. <laughs> and they cut a treaty. The treaty says that uh, there was, in 1848, a law was passed in Hawaii that if Hawaiians are dead or off the land for 20 years, the land is free for settlement. So they went ahead and the Masons signed this contract to take over the Hawaiian Islands. Now there's a law called the Rescissions Act. It was, goes all the way back to the Civil War. The Rescissions Act says that no law becomes legal for three days. And this three-day notice, if you ever look at when contracts are signed, even when you all did your mortgages, either bought property or sold property, you couldn't put, pick up a check in your closing for three days. That's because of the Rescissions Act. That's Title 15, Section 1636 and 1639. Now, the Rescissions Act then went into effect on the 17th of January, 1872. Put a 20-year moratorium on it. It's January 17th, 1893, when the United States took over the Hawaiian Islands. For those who don't know anything about the Hawaiian Islands, takeover. Except it wasn't the United States of America that took over the Hawaiian Islands. It was the military, and the military is controlled by the post office. It was the United States Postal Service that took over the Hawaiian Islands. Now, as a result of this takeover, the injustice that people were a victim of went out there and sued the state court. The state court says, we don't have jurisdiction. You're in the wrong place. So the Hawaiians then went to federal court. They walked into federal court, United States District Court, and the district court said, you're in the wrong place. We don't have jurisdiction over you. You're a sovereign people. So they went to the United States Supreme Court, Washington, D.C. United States Supreme Court, Washington, D.C. 
you're in the wrong place. You sued the wrong people. They're going like, all right, we're being victimized. They stole their land. Who's guilty? So from 1890, September, uh, January 17th, 1893, all the way up until January 6th, 2009, nobody knew who was guilty. As a result of that, because I'm a Mason, and I syntax Manly Halls, the secret of all nations, with Masons throughout the history of this world for 8,500 years. I have the book. There's only five copies on planet Earth, and I own one of them. And when I syntax that book, that book is 18 inches tall, one foot wide, and two inches thick. It's now six inches thick because of all the missing words were put back into it. it covers everything on the planet, every religion, uh, the tarot cards, uh, witchcraft, uh, grammar, all the parts of speech, parse, how words come together. It's got all the secrets in it. But the secrets were only written in adverb verb, not prepositional phrases. So when I, when I rewrote it with the correct parse syntax grammar, I then had missing secrets. I did the same thing to the, to the Quran for the Muslims, and I did it to the Bible, King James Bible. I was able to discover the secrets, putting me as the chief federal judge of the United States of America, prosecuting judges for the past 32 years. That's what I do. I prosecute judges. I'm the bad boy. <laughs> as a result of this, the reason I told you this is because everybody wants you to walk into the state court. Well, state is undefined. You live in the state of Indiana, right? That's not a true statement. You live in the Indiana Territory. The state of Indiana is the name of the vessel in dry dock called your courthouse. All courthouses are foreign vessels in dry dock controlled by the Department of Transportation. In other words, the port authorities control vessels in dry dock. All judges in the United States and all courthouses are paid by the port authorities. That's a very big secret. The port authorities are controlled by the DOT, Department of Transportation, which is owned by the post office, which owns the treasury and the military and prints the money and pays the military to guarantee the value of the money. The United States District Court, United means no citizen. State is a condition of... District, D-I-S means demon god of the underworld for T-R-I-C-T, trickery. This is Latin, in a closed area called court. So when you walk into the United States District Court building, you are in a vessel, a foreign vessel in dry dock, could be a spaceship from any planet, but not from Earth. So you've left planet Earth. You are no longer in the territory of Indiana. Now, all the, all the laws written in Indiana for Indiana people do not apply in a foreign vessel in dry dock, you speak a foreign language called Babel, you are a foreign entity, and as a federal judge, when you walk in front of me, what do I have in front of me? Do I have a document that is actually says something, or is it written in adverb verb by babbling attorneys and lawyers? What I have in front of me are your vessels, your body. Hold a thought in your hand. Show me the three-dimensional object of a thought. Do you know that a thought is not of this world? A thought isn't found on the periodic table. It's not a solid, it's not a liquid, it's not a gas, it's not a chemical. And yet we all have thoughts. It's an energy, comes from our aura, electrical chemical energy, but it is not of this world. A thought can pierce dimensions, can, can, can change through time and space. I can hold the entire known universe, which they say is supposed to be 8.4 billion years old from the Big Bang, in the palm of my hand with a thought. Or I can crawl inside the middle of a quark of a hydrogen atom and exist there with a thought. So a thought is a very unique thing. We can close our eyes every night when we dream, and we can be anything we want to be in this world of thought. And I know everyone in this room has had weird dreams at times. And in those weird dreams, you, you see things that don't exist in this world. Because you're probably transporting, because the thought is not of this world, into other realms, other planes of dimension. Well, this is what's unique. I can't see that as a federal judge. The only thing I can see in front of me is a vessel. 
does this vessel come before me with, with the correct passport, with the correct paperwork, with a lawsuit written in the correct parse syntax grammar? Or does the vessel come before me on my foreign vessel spaceship from another planet, and are you trespassing without any rules, regulations, or codes? Well, the only thing I have as a judge in front of me is a vessel that's trespassing. And everybody knows there's a law for trespassing. And I don't care what language you speak, and I don't care what, what uh, educational levels you have, what country you come from. Everyone understands the word perjury. It means to tell a lie. So the minute you open your mouth, we presume you're smart until you talk, start talking. And because you're talking in babble and you're talking in adverb verb fiction, now you've committed perjury. A vessel that's trespassing, committing perjury in front of me. I've got two felonies in front of me. So it doesn't matter if you're here for traffic, doesn't matter if you're here for foreclosure, doesn't matter if you're here for divorce, marriage, doesn't matter what you're here for, the only thing I've got in front of me is a physical evidence and now time of a trespassing individual committing perjury. Now I can make a determination as to what your fine is going to be. How rich are you? How much money you got in your pocket to bail yourself out and leave my vessel? You can go down here to the port of Chicago or Gary, Indiana, jump on a, a Chinese freighter with a Chinese flag on it without a passport, and I guarantee you'll be arrested, put in a brig, and taken back to China, where you'll be prosecuted and spend eight years in prison for trespassing. And then the, then the State Department can bail you out and bring you back to the United States. It's no different than a courtroom. It's a big old trap, folks. People have been walking into it since 8,500 years. Really great piece of engineering. Just a little heads up on that. The reason I tell you the story about Hawaii is because it's the beginning of something that was very cynical. To capture planet Earth. All money on planet Earth is controlled by the Postal Service. Who's on, uh, what's the decimal point for one? 1.00, 1. right? Who's on a $100 bill? Benjamin Franklin, first postmaster general of the United States of America. President Grant was a postmaster general during the Civil War. A country divided into one half. Decimal point for one half is 0. .50. Who's on a $50 bill? Grant. Abraham Lincoln. Oh, no, go before that. George Washington, letter carrier, Continental Congress, 1875. And he was uh, a letter carrier. And on September 17th, 1789, uh, 1789 the United States of America signed the Constitution of the United States of America. And so, therefore, he was the first president, pre, meaning no, SI is simulation, and DENT is denture, contract. Anything, the word no is a negative. Negative is zero. Zero times any fact, simulation, or contract becomes zero. Therefore, the math interface says that a pre-simulation denture, better known as a president, is a person who only says nothing about nothing. Have you ever seen a president that ever made any sense? <laughs> okay. I know it's a joke, but uh, it's a good one. Yeah, it's, all, it's all played out in syntax. So the, the, the grammar that's used for modification is, is what they keep us down with, the, the way, what they teach you in school. Now, lawyers and attorneys are all licensed to lie. They, they, they write everything in adverb, verb, adverb, adjective, pronoun, and pronoun, adverb, verb. They don't use prepositional phrases because they don't, they're not allowed to use a fact. No law of fact shall be tried in court. And if you want to put that in there, of law, and everybody uses this term, you know, attorney at law, attorney of law, whatever. Parts of speech, no is an adverb, it's negative. Law now becomes a verb, negative, or is a neutral. Negative fact becomes a negative verb also. Shall is a pronoun in future time connected to the adverb be, which now modifies a verb in past time. In is an adverb making court a verb, of is an adverb making law a court a verb. 
Now we've got one jurisdiction, ladies and gentlemen. We have a verb law, a verb court, a verb tried, a verb law, a verb fact. Now we have one jurisdiction called fiction, fraud, illusion. Every word in the English language, and I spent 8,000 hours and two years with a staff of individuals with dictionaries. We looked up every word in the English language that starts with a vowel and two consonants. It means no contract. Every word. Now, when you look at any contract or any newspaper or magazine, you see a, a, the word starts with a vowel, A, E, I, O, and U. And it's used as a single syllable. It means no contract also. Opinion. O is a no. P-I-N is to attach or grab. I-O-N is contract. Opinion. No attached contract. Therefore, that's why it's called an opinion. You can have a gain, G-A-I-N. You put A in front of it, again, you have no gain. You can have an attorney, A-T-T, -T, no tort. You can have an illusion, I-L-L, -L, which means you cannot see a contract. Imagination, I-M-M. -M. You cannot mangle. You can't mangle something, therefore there's no fact. So the imagination, I-O-N, means contract. A-N-T-E-N-T-I-O-N-T-Y. Any vowel that appears in front of a vowel that ends a word means contract. It's a two-letter contract. That, that's, that's how you can tell these things. Uh, this is called parse, P-A-R-S-E, parts of speech. S-C is Latin for speech. P-A-R is parts. So what I did was I studied parse. I studied syntax. Syntax is how two words come together. And the word grammar is how a sentence is constructed. Do you know that all grammar, a correct word, word sentence, only has one verb in it? The average sentence written by an attorney has anywhere from three to five verbs in it. Some sentences have adverb, verb, adverb, verb, adverb, verb, the whole sentence is written that way. There's not even an adjective or a pronoun, a preposition, article, or an effect. When, they went to, when you were in school, fifth grade, we studied prepositional phrases. That was the preposition, article, and noun. Made up your prepositional phrase. Mrs. Lusher was a my fifth grade English teacher in Marion County Grade School in North Grove, Indiana. I grew up with the Amish, the Mennonite, and the Hoosiers. I, I, I come from North Grove, Indiana. My family's been there since 1840, uh, 1834. North Grove, Indiana was where the first house in the state of Indiana was built by my cousin, fifth, my fifth cousin on my mother's side. But we came here from Pennsylvania. I'm Cherokee. My great-great-grandmother was full-blooded Cherokee, and my grandfather came to Switzerland in 1780, settled here in North Grove, Indiana. Uh, half the people in the town are related to me as great aunts and great uncles, and going all the way back to 1834. My, uh, my cousin, who I played with in 1957, was born in 1838. She died in 1957 when I was eight years old. 114 years old she was, living in the same house her parents built in North Grove, Indiana. Isn't that something? She's in the Guinness Book of World Records. She's one of the oldest people living. And I think she's probably one of the oldest ones in Indiana. And I used to work on the farms with the, with the Quakers and the Amish here in Indiana cutting hay and we're on driving tractors and I had my fun playing in the hay in the harvest time. So I'm fully aware of the politics and everything. And Mrs. Lusher, my English teacher, was my next door neighbor. We had a 800, we had an 80 acre farm with uh, 40 pigs. Uh, we had 40 head of cattle and uh, we were farmers too. My mom and dad gave that a shot. We had six, I had six brothers and sisters, so big family. When they, we studied prepositions, pre meant no, position. 
an article. Anytime you have a volume two constant, say RT, we have no, no uh, ownership. So if you have no position and you have no ownership, you have a no-no. N-O is no and U-N is no in Latin. Better known as the noun. So what we did is when we, when we disqualified this in 1999, we had to come up with a brand new answer for a mathematical interface on grammar. So we, we did this. We had a position, dropping the word pre. And the word lodial is spelled L-O, which is location, D-I is original, A-L is contract. And if you have ownership, in other words, for my pen, for is a position, my is lodial, and pen would then become a fact. Now, if I, use, if I just were to drop one of these two positions here and say uh, my pen and drop the word for or with my pen and I drop the word with and just say my pen, my becomes an adverb and an adverb modifies a verb. Modification is change, change is motion, motion is action, action is verb. See, in all ADV, Volume two consonants, modifier. EDJ, adjective, color, modifier. PRO, no, 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 UN, no. They gave us a lot of negative choices, all to go with this sentence here. When you graduate from judge school, you learn this article. Do you learn this? All judges, attorneys, lawyers, politicians all swear the same oath that no law or fact shall ever be tried in court. And no is a negative. That's why the sign says no trespassing, no parking, no uh, don't walk. And see what the sign should read, for the trespassing on this land is with the fee of the $5,000. For the parking of the car in this space is with the fee of the $500. That's a performance contract. Everyone understands performance contracts. Now I have the Pizza Hut next to the Outback Steakhouse. Very popular places on Saturday night and Friday night. And they, the, the people come, came to my seminar from uh, Pizza Hut. They said, you know, we've got two spaces reserved for delivery. And everybody parks in there. And my delivery guy's got no place to park. I says, well, put a sign up. For the parking of the car is with a crushing and melting. <laughs> the sign next to it says, for the parking of the car is with the fee of the $500. No one ever parked in those two parking spaces again, <laughs> except the delivery man. <laughs> Problem solved, because everyone understands the performance contract. Now, here's another little, little quirk uh, point of information. Uh, somebody impounds your car. Parked it where it wasn't supposed to be parked, and they towed it, put it in an um, impound lot. And the guy wants some $250 for towing and $100 a day for storage. Well, anybody that's in possession of your vehicle that doesn't have title to it is renting your vehicle. So you send him a true bill for renting your automobile for as long as he's had it. If you want to go down to the local courthouse, you can pull up a lawsuit by Avis Rent a Car or Hertz Rent a Car, copy it and sue the tow truck company. Or if a police officer orders a tow truck, com com tow truck company to remove your vehicle from the highway and uh, he won't give it back to you, send him a true bill for towing, uh, I mean for rent a car. Your car will be back in one day, maybe a couple hours. <laughs> Works every time. Just a little, little plug there. <laughs> the, uh, The fraud that takes place here is, is profound with, these, with the courthouses and the courts. And, you know, people say, uh, we're, we're in court, and the judge says, this is Judge Wasilewski, he says, you know, David, uh, after he took away my children in 1980, I went to trial 65 consecutive times, two weeks apart, under what's called a writ of de novo. Now, this is a, a pronoun, adverb, adverb, verb. 
But if you put for the for the writ of de novo, then this becomes a five, a six, a seven, a five, a six, and a seven. This is French, but D means the in novo, it would then become a fact. So I filed for the writ of the de novo. Now what that means is if you violate violate equality, that's discrimination, that's a crime. 1964 Civil Rights Act violation. So for the writ of de novo is your ticket to get a free trial for anything. I don't care what it is. They cannot move forward on any topic. If they want to foreclose your house and they use adverb verb, they didn't give you equal protection of the law. That's a prepositional phrase for the protection of the law using the correct parse syntax grammar. Therefore, you can sue for a writ of de novo just for the be correct on the grammar. It doesn't matter if you've got a mortgage or a deed of trust. Uh, Indiana uses the terminology mortgage. California uses the terminology deed of trust. Deed is a pronoun of an adverb making trust a verb. The word mortgage, by it stands alone on top of your document, is called a pronoun. There's no prepositional phrase. You know, if I hold up this object, you see a pen. In Spanish, it's, it's scribola. And if I hold this object about 5,000 languages, I'll get 5,000 different sounding effects to what it is. Does 2 plus 2 equal 4? How many of you think 2 plus 2 equals 4? All right, just all's fair. Did you hear what I said, what I meant, what I said, what I said, what I meant, what I said? <laughs> I can do this 150 different ways before I'm going to get it right. So don't ever pre presume what you think I said, because if my lips are moving, I'm lying to you. That's what a judge said to me. He says, all you've got to do is prove it. He says, and in 8,500 years, Wasilewski says, no one has ever proved it. And I said to him, I said, oh, I, says, I know what you said to me. You said to me, wait a minute. He says, you mean to say, if I say yes, you're going to say no? He goes, yep. And if I say no, you're going to say yes. He says, that's right. And he says, all right. Does three plus three equals six? He goes, yeah. He says, no one ever went to war over a math problem in the history of mankind. No religion, no political organization, no condition of state. No country ever went to war over a math problem. Two weeks ago, President Obama and President Bill Clinton stood on the podium at the Republican convention on national TV. And the closing statement by Bill Clinton was, no one ever went to war over a math problem in the history of mankind, and we're doing it correct. That's an exact quote from all 2,500 seminars I've done. And by the way, I was Bill Clinton's counsel for the sex trial. Remember the phrase, for those that are old enough, uh, the question was, what is sex? Bill Clinton goes, depends on what the definition of is is. <laughs> <laughs> and then Bill Clinton turns to, to, uh, tur turns to uh, the judge and says, uh, I just showed the American people a verb is and a noun is. Would you like me to show them another verb and another noun? And the judge stands up and says, there will be no further questions, Mr. President. This court stands adjourned. Well, every newspaper, TV, announcer, magazine, had a comment about that. It became a very, very, very famous phrase. And that famous phrase was one question and a demur, where demur means to answer a question with a question. And the trial is over. And so the, the uh, nobody knew what it meant. I knew what it meant. I was his counsel. Senator Bill Clinton says to me, Dave, he says, that worked really good. He says, but i got to go in front of Congress, he says, two weeks. I have to tell, I have, and I can't take my lawyer with me. He says, well, you're a lawyer, Bill. And he says, I'll tell you what you do. 
You remember the movie A Few Good Men with Tom Cruise and Jack Nicholson? You want the truth, I'll tell you the truth, but you can't handle the truth. Jack Nicholson won Best Actor for that. For that phrase on the witness stand. And the movie won Best Picture that year. And what it was was the... uh, Go back to the $1 bill again. A little history lesson here. Now, March 1st, 1997, um, I was doing a seminar in uh, Los Angeles, California. And in that seminar, somebody asked me a question. Uh, what do you know about trusts? I says, well, what do you want to know? He says, well, I've got a trust here. He says, would you look at it? He says, sure. There's 40 people in the audience. Hands it to me. I says, well, this is garbage. He says, what do you mean it's garbage? I says, well, the Parse Sintas grammar is all wrong. So I went ahead and I took just the first paragraph and I syntaxed it, put it up on the board, told them what it meant. Then I wrote it in the correct language. Two IRS agents were in the front row, front, front row, jumped up and realized that I just broke $40 trillion worth of trust held in the United States. That's 25 million trusts. As they hit the door, trying to get out the door at the same time to get to the pay phones, because back then we only had pay phones, they locked their shoulders in the door jam, and it looked like the key saw cops trying to get out of a phone booth. <laughs> <laughs> well... They, everybody had a really good laugh as these two clowns were trying to get through the door, but what they were doing is trying to get to the phone first. And the next five days, they harvested $100 billion in trusts across the United States under false and misleading statements under parse syntax grammar. I broke the world of trust. Well, what they did is when they took those $100 billion, they sold that money on Wall Street. The second week, they took another $100 billion and sold it. Third week, they took another $100 billion and sold it. March 1st, 1997, the United States stock market stood at 6,000. On March 21st, it was at 5,300, dropped 10%, 600 points. So I called up the Postmaster General of the United States, and I said, why are you guys selling your money? Why don't you buy dot-com stock with it? As the electronics, there's going to be the new phase of planet Earth for communications. The fourth week, when they took $100 billion, they also went ahead and they took the other $300 billion they just stole out of the trust industry, and they bought stock with it, causing the stock market to jump 700 points in the fourth week. And it went, they continued to harvest this, the trust industry, which was money that was not in circulation. And the stock market went from 5300 to 14200 all the way up to 911. And then 9-11 brought everything back down to 6,000 again because of, of the new terrorist bill and all that stuff. We'll get into that later. But going back to Bill Clinton, uh, he says, how am I going to go in front of Congress here in two weeks? I says, well, you're going to hold up a dollar bill. Walk into Congress. Say, Ladies and gentlemen, before we get started today, I'm going to tell you the truth. He says, but you won't be able to handle the truth. Phrasing Jack Nicholson. He says, you know, we're going to take you back to when you're 10 years old, fifth grade English. He says, uh, first off, we have a line that goes around the money here. March 1st, 1997, I sued the United States Treasury under maritime law boxing. And that's why all your money today doesn't have any boxes on it. If you've see the 10, it's got a circle around the 10. And the 20 has a circle around the 10. So does the 50s and 100s and the 5s. They're all the same. No more boxes except for the the $1 bill. That's because there's so much Masonic information on the back. The pyramid has 72 stones on it. That's for 72, the rule 72 of banking. You take the interest first and you walk down to the principal. The all-seeing eye is Masonic. The capstone has never been completed because the process of discovery is always in motion. But going back to the beginning, it says the United States of America. Now, we all study that prepositions were of, and the article was the. When you separate the prepositions, they all become become adverbs. That means you have 68 prepositions and 38 articles. Together, you have 100 adverbs. So thus, an adverb now modifies united to be a no citizen. UN is no, ITE is citizen. ED is in past time, which means you have no now time jurisdiction. It's also an adjective 
Because whenever you put two nouns together called the United States because it's a title of a country, United becomes a fact and States becomes a fact. But when you put a fact in front of a fact, the first fact becomes an adjective, which now turns the second fact, and an adjective is coloring or modification, which now changes the fact into a pronoun. P-R-O means no, N-O means no, and U-N means no. The pronoun is now connected to the adverb, A-D-V, vowel two consonants, no contract. And then the adverb modifies, modifies change, changes motion, motion is action, and action is verb, and America becomes a dangling participle verb on the money. Now, A is a single syllable. Therefore, A means no. M-E-R-I is Latin for mercy, and C-A is Latin for sheep. No mercy for the sheep. So we pay 65% taxes. <laughs> But because America is the verb on a corporate instrument. Now, we have two signatures on the money. Therefore, this is a corporate instrument. Corporations are under Title 15, Section 1692E, false and misleading statements. Carries a penalty of $25 million and 30 years in prison for every note published under Title 15, Section 78FF. Under Title 15, Section 1639A, there was no notification given to the United States population that the modification of grammar under Title 18, Section 1001, which is the fictitious conveyance of language, was going to be used on our Federal Reserve notes on our money. So to protect the fraud, we put a box around it. Anything in a box is an enclosed area and can't be considered. It was engineered, folks. Not a mistake. Engineered. Just like you build a space shuttle, it's engineered. If it's perfect, it works. Well, we had a perfect fraud. What's the first two little words over here? It says, this note. It doesn't say for this note, or by this note, or of this note, or with this note. It says, this note. Therefore, we drop the preposition. This becomes an adverb, making note a verb. Does this look like a verb to you? Mm, misrepresentation. So now we have a Title 18, Section 1341, mail fraud. Carries a $1 million fine and 30 years in prison. Title 18, 1001, fictitious conveyance of grammar. Title 18, section 13, uh, I'd rather, Title 15, section 1692E, false and misleading statements. And we have Title 18, 1621, perjury, because we didn't advertise it. Now we have four criminal acts that take place on the dollar bill. Bill Clinton then says to Congress, you know, in two weeks I've got to address the union and do my union address. I have to tell the world that America's a verb on the money, and then articulate the criminal activities that's taking place here and disqualify all U.S. currency to 150 countries worldwide depend on for commerce, food, and energy. Or we can seal a case. All those in favor of sealing the case, raise your hand. <laughs> two hands goes up, and he walks out and doesn't say a word. <laughs> now, who controls money? Universal Postal Union. Universal Postal Union gets the word, and all 250 countries are told to stand down Bill Clinton's case is sealed, and nobody talks about Bill Clinton's indiscretion. Shortly thereafter, Hillary Clinton runs for president of the United States against Obama. Does anybody talk about the indiscretion of Bill and Hillary? Not a peep. Not even North Korea, not even Afghanistan, not even the Middle East countries. All the people that hate the United States are all told by the Universal Postal Union, you will keep your mouth shut and don't talk about anything of Bill Clinton or he's going to spill the beans on the, on the language. Squeaky wheel gets the oil. You think you got freedom of speech? Yeah. It stops with the money. Who controls the money controls the world. Always follow the gold. So therefore, uh, Hillary doesn't make it. Obama's elected as the 47th consecutive left-handed president. Romney is right-handed, by the way. There's never been a right-handed president. What does that tell you? Who's going to win the election? Obama, yes. Or me. I have 5 billion people on my website. I have the 58% 50, of the world's population studying parse syntax grammar. I could very, very easily be as a written-in candidate come November 5th, or 6th. Yeah, November 6th, that's right. Tuesday. Uh, just like uh, Lewinska did in Poland. Stood up, people found him to be an honest person, and he got 92% of the write-in vote. 
became the best president Poland ever had for 10 years until he took a bribe and got thrown in jail. True story. So the, uh, the money, the money is a key here. Follow the, always follow the money. Now, you came here, most of you, uh, some of you are involved with mortgages. The mortgage that you are in possession of was written entirely in adverb, verb, adverb, adjective, pronoun, and pronoun, adverb, verb. The mortgage has 6,000 mistakes on it. It is a perfect document that has absolutely zero facts on it, and it was not signed by your bank. No mortgage in the United States of 64 million mortgages was ever signed by the bank since, 18, uh, since 1934. Stalin captured Russia, nationalized it in 1917. He went to Rothschild and said to Rothschild, I need money to fight the Bolshevik Revolution. Rothschild says, you can have all the money you want. Remove the article from your speech in Russian. And Stalin killed 80 million Russians who refused to use adverb, verb, grammar. That was a secret. Because there was no TV or radio back then, uh, it was very easy to genocide a population and without having anybody know it. They did the same thing in Hawaii from 1800 to 1829. 38,000 Hawaiians had their heads cut off because they, the Hawaiian language has no vowel in two consonant conception, and they use prepositional phrases. And because they wouldn't speak an adverb verb like the church wanted them to study, they cut off their heads. And finally, after doing enough of them, they, people got the, got the message that if we don't follow this new adverb verb program, then that we're going to be dead. So that's how they captured Hawaii. So this, this brainwashing of the adverb verb scenario became relevant. And so Stalin was able to get financing and captured Russia. 19, in 1934, Mao Zedong nationalized China, which had 1,200 dialects. Now they only have four. So we need usually three. I just came back from 23 days in China. Uh, that was quite an eye-opener, going to China. Everything you hear about China? Total nonsense. <laughs> I'm here to tell you, it's total brainwashing. Those people are, if I dropped, if I blindfolded you and dropped you off in China right now in the countryside, you'd think you're in Indiana. It's flat, all farms, people working, growing corn, wheat, barley, everything. Just they don't have any equipment. They're all out there working by hand. And they're, they're, they're pu pushing carts. They don't have tractors pulling things. Some of the, some of the bigger farms... Have a, we'll use a tractor. And these tractors are pretty old. They're like 30, 40 years old. I didn't see any, any modern equipment anywhere, but I saw a lot of labor. Now they got 1.4 million people, a billion people. So they got plenty of people. But most of the country is either mountainous or desert, so there's very, few, very small farm areas. I drove uh, probably 600 miles totally around China's countryside. Uh, when I got off the plane in China, I was met by a, a translator. As I have held an ambassadorship with China since 2002, as a result of with the United Nations and my plenipotentiary judgeship. So when I showed up in China, they they met me as a returning ambassador to China, and I was put in the presidential suite at the Bird's Nest, which is the Olympic Village in Beijing, for 10 days with a chauffeured limousine, at the state's expense. But then what they wanted me to do was syntax, their electronics program. So I took an 1,800-word uh, uh, patent on a new electronics cell phone. The new cell phone is transparent aluminum, 3 by 5 inch screen, 3D holographic. It has a 200-loom video projector. And then when you set it down, it has pop-up, air touch, keyboard, just like Minority Report. Really state-of-the-art stuff. And it's not a four gigabyte, it's one terabyte. We're, we're talking 128 gigs on a 20 nano chip to a, to a terabyte for efficiency, memory, 
the 200 lume is in high resolution Blu-ray, uh, and it puts out a four-foot screen. Set it down next to your computer, it talks to your computer, transfers all the information from your computer into the cell phone, and puts it up on a four-foot screen. Just for oh, it also has a two-inch by two-inch transducer. Sub, it's called a subspace transducer. It's a microphone. It's a speaker, and it's also an antenna. Has a 38-mile range. Can operate 100 feet underground, <laughs> underwater. Can read minerals up to 100 feet underground because it works in subspace. Now think of the hydrogen atom. You have an electron and you have a proton. This goes into space between the electron and the proton. As you know, all objects that we touch are held together by atoms. Atoms run on electromagnetics. But this operates in the space between the atoms and the electrons in subspace. Therefore, it can transmit 38 miles between uh, towers and also operates underground. So this is the next stealth technology. That doesn't exist anymore with this new technology. The military's had this for 12 years and has been de declassified because everybody, all the other militaries in the world have it, so they're going to make it available to the public. So this is going to be the new cell phones coming out. Even though your Galaxy 3 might be pretty special at the, the cell phone store, this, this next generation cell phone is going to be something else. It's going to be Star Trek material. And, well, you've got a really good patent here, right? Written in adverb, verb. And I was at this meeting with five electronics firms that the uh, Chinese government invited me to be there. We had a, the guy that developed the subspace tra uh, technology back in uh, 2000, uh, Michael. And Joseph was a Nikola Tesla electronics genius. He built four of these uh, Nikola Tesla coils. So bring these two guys together, and they got these, this great electronics patent. But what's, a, what's a, the, an object, just like this pen, what's an object worth if you don't have a patent for it that's written in quantum language? They can be protected worldwide. So they brought me in because I'm the only guy on the planet that writes quantum. So I went ahead, and I, we showed it. We brought in two university professors from Beijing and one from Hong Kong on, on grammar. And they looked at it and said the patents couldn't be rewritten in less than four months. I, uh, I says, well, give me your patents, and I'll bring it back tomorrow morning, and we'll all get together. So I rewrote it overnight. It took me eight hours to write 1,860 words in quantum and restructure it. So every sentence was certified mathematically frontwards and backwards. So when we, we went ahead and we brought this patent back the next morning, uh, we had two three-star generals. One two-star general was flown in. We had five electronics firms, three translators, uh, and the five presidents from the electronics companies. Uh, along with, and they said, and it was one nuclear physicist from Beijing also, uh, as I've got a four-year background in nuclear physics, because uh, I was with the Polaris submarine program for nuclear degeneration of steel when exposed to plutonium for reactors. I did the work on that. The, uh, they came back and said it would take four months to do a translation. I did it in eight hours. Then they said, can you write it in Chinese? I says, well, I don't speak Chinese, which is, as you know, symbols compared to our alphabet. I don't speak it, read it, or understand it, or write it. So I got on Google Translator, and word by word, it took me one hour to 1,860 words. And I rewrote it in quantum Chinese, frontwards and backwards. Then he asked me, could you, because I reprogrammed my computer immediately as I worked a math interface on this, I then had interfaced the math program in 150 other languages. And my website is also written in 150 different languages. So the, the, uh, it took one hour for me to translate from quantum English to quantum Chinese. It took me one minute to translate from quantum Chinese to quantum French, German, Italian, Spanish, um, Arabic, and in Indian, 
And what they realized was that now they have a quantum program for a $20 trillion a year jump in contracts for international trade. We also gave them the international transportation of money contracts to transport money between one country and another for the new international quantum banking programs that Russell Gould and I have put together. All 150 nations worldwide have been given the patents to this technology for free. I've made this all available so the whole planet can switch over simultaneously. You can't have a world of fact and the world of fiction exist simultaneously, as fact and fiction can never meet. So in 2000, we educated the entire planet banking industry, and we gave them all of these 115-page bank treaties written in quantum grammar. It took us seven years to put together. Uh, this is a 32-year program, by the way, that I've been working with on personally, and uh, been in the architect of this whole thing to change the entire planet from a world of verb into a world of fact, so no one can ever go to war again. Now, what's important about all this is that uh, mankind has been throwing stones at each other because of international communication treaties, because mis miscommunications. Uh, but no one ever went to war over the math problem. Now, how many of you know about the object in Greenland? A couple of you, okay. Well, would you, for those of you that don't know, there is a spacecraft that has melted out of the ice in Greenland. As you know, the North Pole has melted completely. You can go from London to Moscow or to Russia by going over the North Pole now. All the ice cap is gone. The last place that has ice on it was Greenland. Greenland had a 18,000 foot ice cap on it. Well, the spacecraft that is anchored in the center of Greenland created the last ice age 50,000 years ago. It's a weather machine. It's 55 miles wide, 300 miles long, and two miles high. The people that lived in it were called the Moyes. If you draw a straight line from the spacecraft to the Washington Monument in Washington, D.C., through the Yucatan Peninsula Great Pyramid at Mitsubishi, it ends up on Easter Island where the Moyes have been dug out of this dirt. The heads on Easter Island? Well, two years ago, they finally went ahead and they excavated and they're all 85, 65 to 85 foot people, full body carvings. Hmm. And these were the people that lived in the spacecraft that was uncovered, that's melting out of the ice in Greenland. So when you think you're, we've been alone, these people have been up there for 50,000 years. The spacecraft is still active after 50,000 years. It has a 200 mile dampening field where no electrons can flow into it. In 1947, a B-52 bomber flew into that pattern into the dampening field when trying to fly between Maine and London. As a result of that, they lost power and crashed in Greenland. As they sent in rescue B-52 bombers to rescue them, they hit that same dampening field, but they, they, they veered off. They just ricocheted off of it. And by testing, trying to get to these guys, they were able to bring a circumference and find out that there was an object 200 miles to the center of this field. On the southwest corner of Greenland, there is a small community. It's the only community on, in the, on the island of Greenland. That community is a military post, CIA, that uses a compressed air generator to operate diesel engines to run a caterpillar to run back and forth to 200 miles from the base to the object in Greenland. A lot of our technology comes from the reverse engineering out of the spacecraft. It is still functional and is still in operation. So it's, uh, it's pretty important what this thing is. All the nations worldwide are up there with the United Nations and they're all acting, you know, working together. Point is that we're not alone out here in this universe. The reason I bring this up is, if no one ever went to war over a math problem amongst humans, don't you think it would also be logical that we wouldn't go to war with E.T. when he shows up? And if E.T. does show up, what are we going to do? Babble? Start a war between a different pl another planet because of miscommunications? No, we need a communication base that is so mathematically certified, both frontwards and backwards, that when we say something, it means exactly what we say, so that there is no subjective interpretation, translation. 
So it's very important for us to be correct 100% of the time when we're dealing with ET. Otherwise, they're going to throw a rock at us like they did 375 million years ago at the Yucatan Peninsula and get rid of the, the uh, dinosaurs, which you all know about. So we don't want to, we don't want to have rocks thrown at us. So let's, uh, so the, the planet, all the governments of the planet are looking at this math interface as being a correct way to communicate, stop wars on planet Earth, as well as communicate with ET when they show up. And as you, many of you who do the research and get on the internet know that there's probably a lot of different ETs already influencing this planet with all of our little toys that we have, our cell phones and computers and TVs. So it is relevant. The school systems in China are adapting our quantum program. All the universities and colleges are going to be teaching it this year. As a result of these patents that came out from my 23 days in China, they realized that they were going to order all 150 trade partners to, to follow suit. Otherwise, they wouldn't be able to do business with China. The biggest new thing that's coming on the market is the word lithium. Lithium makes for the batteries. Now, China currently controls 80% of the lithium on planet Earth. 20%, the other 20% was known to be in Mount Weld in Australia, better known as the Linus, Linus Mine. It's a one cubic mile of, of lithium that they've uncovered. Uh, Columbia, three years ago, somebody wanted to find out how big the salt flats were. So they drilled down 47 meters, uh, excuse me, 15 meters into the salt. And they found a 25 square mile lithium, a pure lithium bed of lithium. Enough lithium for the next 200 years to build about 600 billion automobile batteries. Yeah. So now if you add thorium to lithium, you can get eight times more power out of the same, same size battery. Think of an ordinary car battery made out of lithium thorium that would have the power to generate a, drive a car 400 miles with a four minute recharge, that's all. Now, that's technology. I know battery technology. I built my first perpetual motion motor when I was 16 years old, my first laser beam when I was 12. I've been on the cutting edge of weird, futuristic stuff ever since I was a little kid. And if you do enough research on me, you're gonna find out that I was taken when I was eight years old. I went into a UFO for three and a half hours. They put a machine on top of my head. And whatever they, they did to me, they put all this information into my head and why I've been able to build this program without any interruptions from anybody for the last 32 years. And uh, I fielded over 100,000 questions at seminars, and uh, I haven't missed any. So you cook up the best question you can think of, and I'll tell you the facts. I'll tell you the facts going all the way back 8,500 years and how it's going to influence all the cross-referencing with it. People go like, that's impossible. You can't know that kind of information. This is, ask me the question. We'll find out. Now, I did a seminar in uh, Bellingham, Washington. I had 86 people in, in the audience, and I told everyone, I says, I'm going to answer all your questions today. And one gentleman on the left, on my right side here, he goes, stands up. He was about 75 years old. And he says, that's a pretty bold statement. He says, you don't know what kind of questions we're going to ask. So how can you, how can you say you know, know all of our answers? I said, tell you what, you be the official question counter. I says, and you count how many questions I'm going to answer in the next two days. So he went ahead and he, he counted and at the end of 5 o'clock on Sunday, he stands up and he says, well, that was impressive. You answered 125 questions successfully, including history, and I agreed with every answer you gave. And he says, I got, two I got two more questions. He says, who is God? He says, well, that's probably the easiest question I've been asked since, since, I, got, since I started this. Now, remember I said at the beginning of the seminar, what is a thought? Hold a thought in your hand. A thought is not of this world. Okay, everyone in this room studies this word God. Matter of fact, we have 5,000 different sounds of words for the word God. It's a very unique word. Now, you also, when you study God, you also study the devil, what evil is. So you have to, it's called perspective. You have to know what's good and you have to know what's bad. 
So you have an understanding of what choice is. Now, because you have choice, you can choose to be a good person or a bad person. Now, everyone in this room, you will read different books at different ages at different times. You will talk to different people, your brothers, your sisters, your parents, your ministers at the school, at, at, at the church, uh, teachers. And all through life, you accumulate information. The end result is we all have a thousand separate definitions that we have accumulated to answer one word. So, and that word, God, because you all have a thousand different sources of, of, of research to answer that one word, now says that God has created man's image. Image, imagination, creation, art. So each one of you formulates your own definition based on your own subjective interpretation of your own educational capacity, your own IQ. IQ is based on the amount of percentage of your brain activity that you use for thinking. To come to a conclusion, to stand in front of a mirror, look at yourself and say, I know who God is, based on these definitions. And no one, I don't care who you are, can tell you who your God is because they weren't there for your thousand points of study. And everyone in this room has a different thousand points of study and answer the same word. And you also have a thousand points of study to answer the, the bad things. What is evil? What is wrong? What is a lie? It's called perspective. So we all choose to be good. We all choose to be correct. And we all choose to stand in front of a mirror and look at yourself and say, I know who God is. And I believe in that person or I believe in that entity. And that's the definition of what, who God was. And everyone in the audience applauded because who is it? It's your own subjective interpretation of what you understand that word to mean based on your ability to look yourself in the eye and say, I accept this to be the fact. And that's as simple as it gets. He says, okay, he says we all agree that that's the definition. He's got one more word for you. What do you know about women? And I says, absolutely nothing. <laughs> he says, see, you can't answer every question. And 38 women stood up and said, that's the right answer. And all the, <laughs> and, and all the men in the audience applauded. We're going to go through a sentence structure now. The first part of a sentence, we use the word for. If you look at my website, it's 400 pages long. Every sentence starts with the word for as the preposition. We use the as a neutral article. You have, when it comes to articles, or what we call lodio, we'll put a square bracket because this means no contract. You have a and the, this, these. Those are the five that I use. In, uh, in my program. Pretty simple, it seems how you have, you have 38 articles and we only use five. Second part is, there's a consequence. Now a consequence is a fact. In other words, I stand here and I look at this room, and I have knowledge. My knowledge allows me to understand people, tables, chairs, architectural structures. Uh, I specialize in 115 different fields, being an engineer, background, metallurgy, heat treat specialist, chemist, uh, biotech, medical fields. I understand medical fields. I can look at every part of this building. I'm a master mason, bricklayer, concrete, lay tile, carpeting, 6,000 yards. 
I hold uh, knowledge of 180 different fibers used in carpeting, chemistry to put those things together, which your clothes are made out of, cotton, wool, polyester, rayon, all the different combinations of that, uh, whether it be the coefficient of expansion, allows me the metals, gases, chemicals from all the, all the different parts of the periodic table and how they're used to create different elements. I was the cook for Chemtron electrodes, made super metals, stuff that never was ever heard of before. 1988, I wrote the math interface on all, on all metals. I was, was called the polymer technology, proving that all metal is plastic, that all glass is plastic, that all plastic is plastic. And so the, the consequences of, of having knowledge creates a cause. As we get older, we acquire more and more knowledge, which allows us to understand the consequences of the facts. The third thing we're going to do is we're going to think. Thinking, I'll put that in ING. Thinking is a verb. which is motion. Now, running is not a verb. Jumping is not a verb. Driving is not a verb. And thinking, you have to, you have to think before you can do all these things. Order of operations, folks. You always have to follow the order of operations to have a legal contract. Even writing the sentence, writing the sentence is not See the pen. See is a pronoun, thus an adverb, making pen a verb. That's a second grade reader. See the ball. See Jack run. See is an adverb, making now run to Jack to be an adjective of the word run, which is a pronoun, which means nothing. You see, these are first grade readers. They're a complete lie. Don't, don't get your kids tied up in that. You want to teach them how to read? Go to my website. That'll really fry them. <laughs> Four, when you think, okay, we look, this is, we'll, we'll put this to be sight, because, or see, you see stuff, and you need a see, you need a see pass, uh, rather see treaty, and you need a see, S-E-A, pass. See, pass means that you can move a vessel in a sea of space. So when you have knowledge, you have these positions that you're going to see and absorb points of information. You hear points of information. You're using your five senses to absorb information. And with that information, we then store it as a computer. So the consequences is a storage, just like a computer. And we keep all this information in until we're asked the question. Then you go into motion, just like when you're entering the keyboard. You might put stuff in. It's going to store it. When you want it out, you hit enter, ask it a question, and you hit enter, and it does a search. It goes thinking, and now it gives you a claim. With is a, is a, is a possession. Possessive, which becomes your claim. Now, claims are, you only have two different things. You either have a plus or a minus. You're either going to have a, an award, not award. You're going to have a, a value. See, the word a, a means no award, a, W-A-R-D. Award. Now, the word award is because the contract is written in adverb verb, means you get nothing. You might get a future tense, futuristic Federal Reserve note. Or you might get a promise, pay to, in future time, which is a pronoun adverb scenario. But you don't have any now time facts. So therefore, with the possessive, you possess a claim. The claim has to be defined. So we're going to go here five of the contract. Now, the contract has to be of the contract terms. Number six is 
with the correct sentence structure, communication, parse, syntax, grammar. Okay, what does that mean? Well, there's a thing, you hear the word right, you hear the word truth. Truth is an opinion, by the way. Everybody believes in God, that's your truth, but that truth is based on your opinion of subjective interpretation, so therefore truth is an opinion. And O means no, and P-I-N means to attach, and I-O-N is contract. So you have no attached contract because your subjective interpretation of your ability to communicate with any other individual is based on that other a person's ability to understand what you're saying in the first place, which is babble, <laughs> because it's all adverb, verb, scenario. Now, I may be talking to you in adverb, verb, because that's the only language you understand. If I get into, if I stood up here and talked to you and uh, for this knowledge of this individual is with the claim of the correct parse syntax grammar, uh, start using prepositional phrases, uh, this would not jar well with your perception. And you, you'd kind of get lost. So it takes about 200 hours to adapt to this technology. And you will get a migraine headache because you're all brainwashed not to see an article. You might think that's a joke. It's not. Sublimic messaging through TV, radio, newspapers, and magazines, school books have been there your whole life, right in front of you. We hide it in plain view, just like we hide a flag in plain view, and we cancel this contract by putting a Coke can on top of the staff, which is a phoenix in this case. If the wingtips are down, it's a phoenix. If they're up, it's an eagle, which is postal. So you can either be under postal guys or you can be under the Vatican guys. Either way, you're under somebody's guise, G-U-I-S-E. It's not a disguise, it's a guise, G-U-I-S-E. This meaning no guise. This means no, by the way. Finally, number seven is by the author. Authority. Authentic. Authorization. And what's the symbol for gold on the periodic table? AU. He who holds the gold makes the rules has the authority. Ever wonder why gold was the key? Why it was AU and not something else? Because gold is spelled G-O-L-D. Not AU, but AU is authority. And throughout history, gold has been the medium, going all the way back to the beginning. About 8,500 years ago, they decided that gold, because of its, its beauty and both its ability to withstand tarnishment, would be used as a standard metal on this planet. It's also an industrial metal because gold is a molecule that you can make a 128 gigabyte uh, circuit board on a 20 nano chip. And a single atom of gold is, can be a, a transistor, a capacitor, a diode, based on its configuration and where it appears in the circuit board. They would build a circuit board against that wall with 128 gigabytes of information on it and then photocopy it onto a 20 nano chip and then grow that in a cloud chamber of argon and that's how they would build those chips. So that's how technology, and then he's just stack them together. Everything's done with laser welding, uh, electron beam welding, because you know the human, the, the computers are unique. They build themselves now. A one quarter inch green <coughs> one quarter inch quartz crystal, run by two green holographic lasers, are an eight hundred gigabyte. Uh, processor with a 64 terabyte memory capacity. Speed of light is 186,000 miles per second. <clears throat> the information is recorded inside a, a quartz crystal. Our human brain is a 500 terabyte capacitor. That's what you're rated for, 100, 500 terabytes. And uh, these little puppies are only quarter inch and they have thousands of one full square inch, which are 64 times 64, which would be 30, 
3,600 trillion uh, capacity per crystal. And they have thousands of these banks of information run on green holographic lasers. Computers are building computers today. They're, they have advanced, art, we've had artificial intelligence to make determinations about uh, what a lawsuit is and how it's run at the United States Supreme Court for 12 years now. About the late 2000s when they in, implemented the artificial intelligence to make decisions. And when the computer figures out that we're the virus, <laughs> <laughs> enough said about that. So, these are the parts of what a sentence is. Now, a sentence has to be written frontwards and backwards. If you notice, we have <clears throat> for of, is, with of, with, by. Now, after the with of, we can have as many of these, like I have one sentence in the book, last page of the book here. This is my book. It's 96 pages long. It's written in nine-point print. It's the only book in the, in the world that's written in quantum language. I have no competition. I have no plagiarizers anywhere on the planet. It's kind of unique to be a one source of 8 billion people and nobody's given me any competition. I have a monopoly on this thing, virtually. And it isn't because I have a monopoly. It's because it's so, it's so unique. The condition of math, the condition of a fact in a world of 8 billion fictions is so unique that it stands alone and there's no plagiarizing. The, all the judges, all the attorneys on planet Earth and all languages have been ordered to find, to search history, go into the archives of written history going back 8,500 years. Is this an original program? The answer was yes. This whole thing is 100% original, that there's never been anything like it on the planet for communication skills. So the books... The books took me, this is 8,000 hours, or 80,000 hours of my work put in 96 pages. Uh, this is part of it. All the new stuff is updated on the, on the internet, on my website. But this gives you a, about an 80% solid base that you can hold in your hand and read. And it takes about 200 hours. I charge $200 for the books because they're, <clears throat> they're the only ones like it on the planet. There's no competition for it. So... They're, they're very unique. People that have them, guard them. They don't, they don't treat them like garbage, like the local newspaper, because when you put value on something, it becomes valuable. If I gave you this, this marker, you'd use it, put it down, and walk away. If I charge you $200 for this marker, you'd put it in a glass, a, a glass jar, put it up on your fireplace, and say, that's valuable. You know? because of what it means to you. Education is the same way. You go to college and you pay for an education, you put value on it, you stay awake in class. If somebody else gives you a scholarship and your schooling is free, you sleep through class. Or you put a tape recorder and say, I'll study later, but you don't learn anything. Yes? And what the, does it teach you how to write sentences or to read? Or yeah, to it's got all that. As a matter of fact, the, uh, the back of the cover page this is, the, this is the key to the book. This, this one page took six years of my life to, to write, 12,000 hours of study, to go and work, travel all over the United States. I spent a great deal of time in the uh, fifth basement under the Philadelphia uh, Library. It's a top-secret library uh, facility with, art, uh, with books that go back six, 700 years and once I get into the old books, I can syntax two-thirds of all the missing words. What's unique about what I do is you can put anything in front of me and I can tear it apart and tell you what it meant, what the condition of thinking of the individual was, how it cross-referenced with history, and then rewrite it in the correct format, showing you the secrets that were built inside of each word through the parse and the right way that the math shows that the sentence should have been written. Even if a person wrote a sentence incorrect, I've memorized the book on synonyms, the book of Parse, the dictionary, uh, Encyclopedia Britannica, World Book, uh, uh, Rules of Trusts writing, and with that amount of cross-referencing as a historian, also did 12 years on uh, uh, 
genealogy, knowing where the planet started from and how the different our different uh, ethnic groups have moved across the planet with 13 tribes and how they've interfaced with each other. So my <clears throat> my background is is very unique. I sleep three hours a day. I didn't sleep for eight years completely. I was uh, for those that don't know, I died on December 3rd, 1975. I had my right kidney removed. Both of my adrenal glands were surgically removed by a South Korean doctor uh, in an operation. I had died. I had gotten sick. My left ki- right kidney was killed in a. I was caught in the 1968 riots in Milwaukee, and they kicked my left, my right kidney, like you tee a football off, seven times. I got pinned down by eight boys. Uh, after I got out of work, I had arrested one of them. Uh, for shoplifting. I worked at Sears and Roebuck. I was 18 years old. So there, his little gang of guys jumped me when I got out of work at 9 o'clock at night, and they tried to kill me. Uh, they killed my right kidney. And it took seven years before it finally knocked me down. Even though it was dead inside me, my body had created a callus around the kidney. It was about the size of my fist, and it was just black tissue. Because of the poison leaking into my system, it created a super, super immune system fighting this poison on a full-time basis for seven years. When they removed that, the doctor, who had never operated on a human being before, cut my my, my right adrenal gland out with it because it's attached to the kidney. Then he thought he was supposed to remove my left kidney, which was healthy. So he cut that in half and took out my left adrenal gland and half my left kidney. Well, it left me, I went into anesthesia shock, and I was flatlined. I died on the operating table. They couldn't jumpstart me, and I wound up in a morgue, cut in half with my heart hanging out of my chest for 35 minutes without a heartbeat. I mean, it's in plain view, you know, the coroner and the nurses down there. And then as soon as they signed my death certificate, according to the coroner, they had an exact time and location. So whatever the future event took place, they had a recording of an individual in a morgue at an exact point in time with an exact match, and I was jump-started. My heart started beating, and they rushed me back upstairs, and they put me back together. I woke up two hours out of surgery and stayed awake for eight consecutive years, going to school full-time and working two full-time jobs. I walked out of the hospital in 72 hours. Recovery time is two weeks. For the, loss of a kid, for the loss of a kidney, and I walked out in 72 hours. So I, uh, I got on this, uh, this kick of studying. I was going to save my own life because I only had half one kidney, and he said I'd be dead in three years. Well, I'm 63 years old now. I was born on September 17, 1949, and I haven't aged in 35 years. I stopped aging when I, my kidney. See, what happens is, two years ago in London, they discovered the gene that causes aging in the human being. When I died when I was 25, my aging genes and my cells died also, and my DNA, according to what the doctors have been able to surmise. So my aging gene, because it's, it's gone, I stopped aging at the age of 25. I've probably aged five years in the last 35, 38 years. So I, like my cousin was 114, I probably will live to be a, still be young like this when I'm 100 years old, which would be cool. But, <laughs> but it's, it's uh, with this program being as unique as it is and so important to the existence of this planet and all species on this planet, it's unique that I was chosen with this as a meek person. Now, what does the word meek mean to you? Some people say it means timid or shy or weak. The word meek means I have absolute power over all things on the planet. And I have discretion. In other words, I'm a teacher. That's what the word meek means, that I have absolute power, but I teach people. I don't hurt people with this technology. Even though I am the judge prosecutor, because the judges are the ones that go out and harvest the people, I sit down with the judges and I say, listen, here's your signed confession. You can choose 30 years in prison, or you're the guy to create, you've buried the bodies, now go dig them up. Or retire. That's it. you got three choices. Because if you think you're going to continue, ain't going to happen. So, and that's unique. And I've been, um, I have a lot of people all the way across the world, at the top of the food chain, ambassadors, 
presidents. Uh, I was elected King of Hawaii in June of 1997. That's not a joke. The 72 Hawaiian families got together, and they ele elected me the King of Hawaii. But I am a king over one thing, parse syntax grammar. Now, grammar controls contract. So all contracts, treaties, and trusts with the United States government and the Postal Service are a result of what is written on paper. I don't interfere with any culture on planet Earth. I don't interfere with any uh, political organization, uh, religious beliefs, nothing. My sole purpose is contract. What is a preposition? What is an article? What is a fact? Or if I should rephrase it. What is a position? What is a lodial? What is a fact? So when I was elected king, I was a king of contracts. That anybody, any two people, any any two tribes within the Hawaiian 72 tribes. Same thing with the 1,200 Maori tribes and the 3,460 tribes of Australia. I hold those positions also. That I was elected into a position and adapted by their tribal councils to be in charge of contracts. And countries all over the world have asked me for, uh, for help in the suppression that they've suffered from one country taking over their country. Take Ireland, for instance. In June, July, I did a radio show for the Irish Republic on their, uh, by uh, Internet radio. It was uh, supposed to be a 20-minute spot. lasted two hours and 45 minutes. When I got off the radio, the next day my phone rang, and it was the... Uh, Irish Parliament called me and said, could you write a constitution for us? And they said, <clears throat> how long, how much time do you need? Three, four months, they said. I said, how about tomorrow afternoon? He says, you're going to do a constitution for us in one day? He says, yeah. I says, I'll deliver it to you tomorrow. It'll be 59 paragraphs long. And I did. I, overnight, I wrote a, wrote, wrote a constitution, supplied it to the Irish Parliament. They took two days to pour over it voted on it unanimously, took it to the London Parliament, and London Parliament poured over for three days. And in July, August, uh, I think it was August 2nd of 2011, Ireland received their independence for the first time in 660 years from England. Two days after that, Queen Elizabeth was on BBC announcing that all United Kingdom constitutions were null and void because I syntaxed them. She pulled my passport for New Zealand and Australia. So I syntax their constitution disqualified the United Kingdom worldwide. When they pulled my Canadian passport, I, mag I syntax the Magna Carta. It was sold at Christie's of London for $6.7 million as a historical document with no value. When the United States Congress, Senate, Legislature, and Supreme Court gave me a hard time here a couple of years ago, I syntax the Constitution of the United States of America, wrote a new constitution for the United, Na uh, United Nations. And now the Constitution, the Bill of Rights, and the Declaration of Independence is going to be auctioned this year in Washington, D.C., because it's a historical document and it has no value. Benjamin Franklin was a triple agent, French attorney working for the English Crown to capture the United States and give it back to England, which he was successful in doing through adverb verb. When I did a seminar in Atlanta, Georgia, for uh, 72 people, we had the uh, senator from uh, Georgia. He came to the seminar along with uh, several Supreme Court ju uh, judges from uh, Georgia. I said to him, you know, uh, you guys had a civil war down here. And Grant went ahead and he, he and Lee got together and you guys signed a, uh, a surrender treaty here. I said, a syntax that's written in adverb verb doesn't say anything. I said, the southern states are as independent as a conf of a confederate agency as the north is. I says, you guys were never conquered by war. This is Title 28, Section 1359 is collusion. You had a gun to your head to sign a contract. The contract was written in adverb verb. Both people had a second grade reading level. You don't have a contract. You know what happened the next day? The confederate flag was raised above the capital in Atlanta, Georgia. Made all the newspapers around the world 
And all the southern states put up the, the Confederate flag on top of the Capitol buildings, Florida, South Carolina, Georgia, Alabama, Louisiana. Everybody's going like, what's going on? It says, you can't surrender to a gun in your face. We were, when the Constitution of the United States ended on November 2nd, 1859, the United States of America did not exist. The South was an independent country. They created the Articles of Confederation. Article was a pronoun, of is an adverb, making confederation a verb. That was a lie. So they don't exist either. It's an illusion. So their illusion versus the United States of America, of is an adverb, making America a verb. Illusion. How does two illusions create a fact? They don't. So therefore, everybody's still independent. And I spell independent, I-N-D, of all two consonants, no contract, because it's an opinion. So you got 8 billion people with an opinion about where you stand and who you are. <laughs> <laughs> so the, uh, when they put up the flags, the United States Supreme Court came back and says, we don't have jurisdiction. And they were right. And they, they see, all these years, 150 years went by, and nobody knew what they were doing until I stood up and said, hey, the king has new clothes. Yeah. And everybody knows the king has new clothes story. Question. I just want to go back to the book. I think on your website, I, I saw something um, referencing to some DVDs to study along with the book. Uh, we, all the DVDs from every seminar I've done since 1999 are on the internet. Free. Just type in David Windmiller videos. Anything you want. Facebook, MySpace, Twitter, Google, AOL, Yahoo. Uh, I can't even think of all the rest of them that are up there. Gmail. And you'll get all the videos you want. There's 200 hours of different videos, seminars. There's the, uh, Facebook has got the 17-hour uh, series from Australia. I took, a, I went down there. That's when they pulled my visa. You see, I'm a federal judge in New South Wales, Australia, Auckland, New Zealand, and also a full barrister with the British United Kingdom. Now, I was awarded that because they couldn't win. They lost 129 cases to me. I've indicted 129 of their judges. And they don't know what to do with me, so they had to make me a barrister and a federal judge, thinking that that would be okay, you know? Well, the very last trial I was at, uh, the, in the Land Environmental Court, the judge stood up four times and bowed to me. All of the lawyers coming and going in the courtroom during the time of the one-and-a-half-hour presentation I put on uh, in front of four TV cameras. I mean, these are the big TV cameras they had in the room there, which were broadcasted all over Australia to all the, all the courthouses so that they could watch. And then I told the judge, I said, you know, judge, you've been on the bench 28 years but you're the new kid on the block. You got pulled for this duty, and you've only been sitting on the bench here in Land Environmental for three days. I says, and they put, they set you up to come in front of me because they knew what I was going to do, and none of the other judges that were older than you wanted to get caught, caught in my crosshairs. And I says, I'm the only judge in this court. <clears throat> I says, that, that seal you got behind you is a good cartoon. I called it a cartoon. The judge turns around and looks at it and says, yeah, it's a cartoon. <laughs> the first day I was in court with these people, uh, underneath the, the seal of all the courts, they have a, a ribbon. And the ribbon has words on it. Between the words, they have dots. Because it's a seal, a dot is used in two locations under syntax. On a seal, it's used as a prepositional phrase. On money, it's used as a prepositional phrase because of the restriction of space. So the dot between words, in other words, if I were to have a, a word here, if I put it here, it's called a period. But if I put it in the middle, that's a prepositional phrase. So if I did this, and I said, for the possession, this would be, this would be for the with, of the uh, of the the with the possession, each dot would represent a prepositional phrase. 
And that's syntax, folks. I says, Judge, you're here talking to me in adverb verb. You're here filing paperwork in adverb verb, and yet your seal on the back of the wall says you you are advertising syntax, which means you have to be correct. Otherwise, you're guilty of perjury by signed confession. I says, and I handed you a correct parse syntax grammar lawsuit, and I am the only federal judge, and I held up my oath, in Australia. I have the only correct written contract in front of you. I says, so I have the flag, I have the oath, and I have the paperwork, and the paperwork is the court, and I signed a stamp. Where's your signed stamp? I'm postmaster, banker, and judge of this courtroom. Judge stands up and bows to me. And after the fourth bow, he walked out of the courtroom, bowed to me backwards, surrendering the court to me as a chief federal judge of Australia. Then I went up to see the Supreme Court, and they locked me out. <laughs> <laughs> So they wouldn't, they wouldn't even, and then uh, two weeks ago I was in Honolulu, Hawaii, and I walked into the federal building, and the guard goes, you're Judge David Wynn Miller. And goes, yeah. He says, I got a flyer on you. He says, you're not allowed in the building. <laughs> he, he, he says, uh, he got on the radio and he called the marshals. He says, you, gotta, you can only be in the building if the marshals are escorting you. So I had five more, rad- you know, the guys that run the, Metal detectors, five more sheriffs come walking over. And they're, they're all standing there in front of me with their arms folded. I says, I must really be a dangerous person in your courthouse here. He says, well, you're here to pro- arrest our judges. I says, yeah, I have warrants for 33 judges in your courthouse, signed by the United States Supreme Court and the World Court at The Hague. I'm the chief judge of Hawaiian Islands, federal judge. I says, you guys are only district, which is demon god of the underworld for trickery judges. I says, so you don't have any standing here. I says, I've got the only standing. I says, not only that, you anchored your vessel, which is your courthouse building, on our island. He says, I'm the elected king of Hawaii, and you've got your, 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 your vessel anchored on my island. Do you have a drogue law? That means to anchor. In the correct parse syntax grammar, to anchor your vessel on my island? I don't think so. Do you have a sea pass, S-E-E, to pass through... Uh, the, the, uh, our borders? Do you have a sea treaty, S-E-A, to move your vessel amongst the sea of space? You don't have any of these, these treaties? Hmm, it means you're trespassing. This is, and I've got warrants for your arrest. So then three marshals come down. Yeah, what are you doing here? I says, I says well, I'm here to see the U.S. attorney here in the courthouse. I says, I'm going to indict Judge Kobayashi over in Maui for treason. All right, we're going to have to escort you upstairs. So I get off the elevator, there's five more marshals, two city of Honolulu sheriffs, and two city of Honolulu police officers, plus five rental cops. So we got 14 people standing in front of me. <laughs> mm, I must be a really dangerous guy. You're here to it. We're, go- we're going to have you indicted for, for harassing our judges. I'm going, well, first off, they're not judges. They don't have an oath of office. Number two, I have warrants for their arrest. Number three... All of you gentlemen standing in front of me don't have an oath of office to carry a gun or a badge. I says, I syntaxed it. I says, I have my oath with me. I says, and I've been, I says, I was elected as the king in this, so I have diplomatic immunity. I'm a sovereign. I'm the only sovereign in the United States. I have my own country. My own country, and guess what the land of my country is? The land of the courtroom during the time of contract. No one has ever claimed the land of the courtroom during the time of contract. So every courtroom I go into on planet Earth is my country on planet Earth because I was appointed to me through the United Nations, where all 200 countries treated with me, saying, when you come into a courtroom, you are the senior chief judge under land of the contract, and because your contracts are written in quantum grammars, which creates the constitution of the land of the contract. The courtroom. And the courtroom is not a geographical location. It's paper, folks. The land of paper is the contract. Because the contract of the paper is not bonded to the room, the room is just a point of convenience. So what is a courtroom? A courtroom is a piece of paper. 
And the words on the paper are the thoughts. Hold a thought in your hand, show me the three-dimensional object of the thought. So therefore, the understanding of the courtroom is the correct parse syntax grammar on paper in a geographical location that is neutral called the land of the courthouse or the land of the courtroom. Now, you may, let's say we were in court today. And every person in this room sat here in front of me with a different contract, one for divorce, one for trespassing, one for uh, shoplifting, one for uh, traffic, drunk driving, uh, underage. <laughs> and, and as a result of that, does, any, does your contract for traffic have anything to do with his divorce or his marriage or, or his trespassing? The answer is no. So each one of your paper contracts that you have is a vessel in a sea of space. And your name is on that document. Therefore, that is your bill of lading, your passport to be in the closed area called court. And the, con the condition, the contract, the words on that document, if they're written in adverb, verbs say nothing. Therefore, they're called art, A-R-T. Follow in two consonants, no contract. How do you spell ink? I-N-K. I-N means no, K is knowledge. You have no knowledge because you put ink on paper and adverb verb. They've been advertising in plain view to ever all of us throughout your entire life. And just like all the pictures on the wall here, they're all in a box, which is a, called framing. And framing is a box under four corners, which is an enclosed area and can't be considered, so you can't be insulted by any one of the pictures or have any subjective interpretation as to the condition of what the people look like because they're in a box. The lawyers and the attorneys and this whole thing about syntax is in front of you every place you go and everything you do all the time. The unique thing is that we are here, uh, and I'm talking to you in, in a, as a real in real time, and uh, we're all on the same plane, P-L-A-N-E. That means you can see me and you can hear me. Now, sheet of paper. Mm. I just disappeared. You can't see me anymore. I'm on a stage. Even though it's two hundredths of an inch thick, called a piece of paper, I changed my plane. I just disappeared. Now I'm on a stage. On a stage, you can't see me. You can't hear me. You can't be insulted by me in any way, shape, or form. It's only your subjective interpretation as to what you see and hear now. That's why actors... Federal Rules of Civil Procedure 44.1. All judges are actors. And they're on a different plane than you are. Therefore, you can't see them or hear them. That's why they're immune, because they haven't said anything or done anything. Now, who sits in front of the, the actor on the stage? The clerk of the court with the computer. Now, what do you see or do? The whole time the judge is up there with his computer screen, He's typing here like this. He's telling the judge what to do because she's on your plane and she's the puppet master and he's, he's, the, uh, he's the actor being told what to do. So the clerk of the court, who takes the, 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 the paper? Right. Who takes the... Uh, uh, the clerk of the court... Takes your money, gives you a receipt. That's called banking. You go to the bank, clerk, the, the uh, teller at the bank takes your money, cancels your check, gives you, gives you money, which is uh, doing a transaction. Just like ordering food at a restaurant. You order your food, the waitress writes it down on a piece of paper, which is a bill of lading, takes it back, brings out your food, gives you a receipt, if you MasterCard, you sign it. <clears throat> if it's cash, you take it up the cash register. You do banking. She gives you a receipt. You give her money. You pay for your cargo. You go to the court. You hand her the vessel. You see a space. The vessel is, comes to the port of the court. The vessel gets docked. Therefore, we put a document number, a docket number on it, docking the vessel. You pay $350 docking fee. And now you have a document. DOC, DOC, DOC. 
You see, we're, we're using the terminology and bringing things into first-person knowledge now so you're aware of what's happening. When the document comes to the port of the court, the document has a stamp on it. The stamp is autographed by the postmaster delivering the vessel to the port of the court, who also puts a stamp on and signs it. Therefore, we have postmaster to postmaster docking a vessel. The vessel is an independent. Now, this is something some of you know or don't know. All judges are actors. They do not become a judge until they automatically sign, they autograph this document. If they autograph the stamp of this document, then they are the judge in the case. A judge who does not sign this document is not a judge. When you walk into the courtroom, the judge is up there and says, did you sign the paper? The judge says, no. That's not the judge. That's an actor. Who did sign your paper? The clerk of the court did. She's the judge. So you can say, judge, you're not on my plane. Get out of my courtroom. Now, when I walk into a courtroom, I walk in there and says, judge, you're excused. I'm going like, this is a state court. I'm in charge. I said, bailiff, I deputize you as my tip staff. Arrest the judge for trespassing in my courtroom. I have a federal oath. I have a federal oath of office. I have it in my possession. I've signed a stamp. I'm on a federal plane. That's a federal flag. This is a federal court. We're here for money. This document says there's money on it. This stamp is $1 stamp on it. This is postal money. We're in a postal vessel in dry dock under a postal stamp. This is a federal flag. I says, this vessel has jurisdiction, and I have an oath of office that matches this contract. I am the only standing federal judge in this courtroom. I'll arrest that man as an imposter. That judge is usually running out the door as fast as he can get before the bailiff can get a hold of him. <laughs> then I turn and I says, I've got a, I've syntaxed the uh, district attorney's paperwork here, and now I'm prosecuting the district attorney for a $25 million fine and 30 years in prison for false and misleading statements to damage a citizen. And about that time, he's running out the door. And if he's standing on his ground, then I got the bailiff arresting him. And if you've been in court and you've seen this happen and that, you're going to like, Psst, never seen that before. <laughs> <laughs> the other attorneys do the same thing. It was in, when I was in Australia, we did this. And a district attorney, uh, my client was a dwarf, stood uh, three feet, nine inches tall. And when she walked in there, everybody kind of got out of her way. And I was there, and the judge goes, are you a representative? And he says, no, sir, I'm a claimant. Well, who's that? And he says, she owns the property. I'm a claimant on her property. Well, you're, you're not on title. I syntax the mortgage contract for New South Wales. I says, it's false and misleading. I says, because I syntax, I'm a claimant on the document for false and misleading statements. I syntax the prosecuting attorneys who want to foreclose her property. This man has committed a felony against this court. He's got a second grade reading level. Doesn't have an oath of office. Doesn't have a, he's not a barrister. I don't know what he is, but he's got a wig on. He looks like a clown, personally. <laughs> <laughs> and this guy is like, how can you uh, talk to me like that? I says, because I'm a federal judge in New South Wales, and I have a federal oath, and you we're in a state court, mind you. And I says, and as a state it says, you may be a state judge, but you're not on our plane. Therefore, you've not come to court. Clerk of the courts, I says, I hereby deputize you as my clerk. I says, bailiff, I says, you're now my tip staff. I says, this is a federal court. Arrest this person for treason against the people. Arrest the judge for imp impersonation. And the judge stands up and goes, uh, we're going to continue this uh, and uh, for another 45 days. I said, you can't continue anything. I already arrested you guys. You're out of the picture. And this guy turns to these 12 barristers sitting behind him, and he goes like, this guy just handed my head to me in a basket. He goes, do something. And they all took their coats and pulled them over their heads, and they all talking through their coats going, he's your problem. <laughs> <laughs> when, you, when you file a lawsuit, this one here is... This is just a copy of one of my O's. What I do is, 
We have a stamp on one side because it has value. We have a flag making it federal. And when I, this is, a, this is an authentic oath, and I think this one is for, uh, this is my Hawaiian oath, oath of office. And this makes me a federal judge in Hawaii. And when you put value on the front, you have to endorse the top of the back, just like you endorse the top of your checks at the post at the at the court. I mean, at the at the bank. Now, the reason what is an endorsement? Okay, we we write. Now, if this was seventy five feet long, we'd call this uh, uh, as a single document. We'd be bonded. We roll it all up, call the scroll. <clears throat> and so, now that it's been rolled up. We put the wax seal on here, going all the way back 6,700 years, and the king would then use the ring to put the seal on. And the, the ring, the seal, was the same as an autograph. And when you unwrap it, the seal is at the top of the back of the value. Therefore, you have an endorsement. That's been practiced for 6,700 years without fail. So therefore, it's legitimate. And question... It's like that. Like no, I don't sign it. This is called an autograph. Autograph. <clears throat> the colon is for the David hyphen win of the Miller family. My degree sign is because I'm a 92nd degree Mason. The Masons all over the world have said the Masonry stops at 34 degrees. How can you be a 92nd? Well, the different cities I travel to, and I've been in over 1,200 of them, have challenged me, have come to meetings, have gone to lodges. And when the Masons and I get together, they bring their books. I have my books. I have Legenda, 1859, signed by me in 1859. And that's another story you don't know about. <laughs> yeah, your question. You mentioned the uh, continuance of 45 days Some reason when the judge walked in, they were all prepared to rise. He goes, "No, no, just you know, stay seated." Did he have his robe on? Yes. Okay. By the way, the robe means I'm mourning justice. What does it mean? So He's in mourning for justice because justice is dead. In this conversation, you, you could kind of tell they all just on this inside track, and. One attorney asked for a 90-day continuance. 45 and 45 is 90. And then the judge goes, well, if I did as I wanted to, I would continue it for 122 days. And they all laughed. Every one of them. Laughed? Yeah, they, it was like this big chuckle. You know, They all knew what he meant by it, except for me. I didn't know what was going on. That's my question. This was on uh, September 6th, the 122 days come, if I count all the days, mm -hmm. comes out January 6th, 2013. Okay, you got 45 days, trust law, off, offer, 45 day answer, uh, You the state court? County. State court. Uh, then you've got, uh, that's 90. If you add 45 to that, you get 135. So that doesn't work. So what they're doing is, there's a 10-day offer, a 10-day answer, uh, a 20-day answer, and a 10-day response. That gives you 120 and then you've got your three-day rescission law. That would make it 123 days, which would expire. So he had to make it at 122 days. So he was under the one-day limit under the rescissions law. Otherwise, he'd be in violation of notice. 
This is an offer. This is an acceptance. These are two 45-day trusts running. This is a vacated contract on its face. Okay, it's not legal. Okay, what you have here is this. You have a, uh, everybody okay with this, or do you want, want to get into more of this? Huh? I have one more question. With the, uh, the colons in front of the name? Oh, that's a prepositional phrase, for the, for the David right. hyphen win, full colon, which means for the David win of the Miller family. If you don't have the colon in front, then you do it like David dash win. Colon. This is a pronoun in front if you if you leave out the colon, this is this is a pronoun uh, of the Miller, which means this is a nothing of the Miller family. So therefore, it's a, a, a mistake. So you got to put it in there. Okay. There's 528 symbols in the in the under Microsoft. If you get in your computer, you can look them all up and pull them up on the screen. Uh, it's probably a good three year study on symbols. If you want to get into it. Uh, we use like like the address. Uh, like my address in Milwaukee. This is a tilde hyphen tilde hyphen, and then Milwaukee. And this is a tilde. Milwaukee is not the name. It's a location. Wisconsin, it's a location. And you put tildes. Tilde means location. Anybody want to correspond with me and by letter or mail me things? That's, that's where you send it. David Wynn Miller. 5166 North 63rd Street, Milwaukee, Wisconsin, 53218. That's my address. What would happen if you put a hyphen between the building and the wall? Would that be wrong? Like, no, you don't. Not here. When you start, you just use your tilde. Now, here would be, would that be right? this is a comma, hyphen, tilde. Yeah. Microsoft will also give you. We'll, we'll give you, uh, we'll say this is correct. If you, lo if you drop off the hyphen, you're going to get an underlining, which means you're using the wrong symbolizations. So you've got to have a comma. Now, when you write the state, this is a letter, this is a number. These are two different, two different entities. You don't, even though this might be a, a WIP or WI dot uh, for postal codes, Whenever you go from a word to a number, like this here, you don't need the. Uh, this this actually has a have to hyph, have to have a hyphen here too. Uh, but from the number to the street, you can use the the hyphen. Is it incorrect if you put a tilde after the hyphen between street and the hyphen? You can put a tilde here or not put a tilde here. It's irrelevant, but it's. You'll get a flag on it from the computer if it's wrong. Okay. Yeah, Microsoft took Bill Gates back in 1995 when I went public. Uh, anybody using prepositional phrases, even writing a single legal sentence from my book on the Internet, would kill your computer. And for about 18 months, they were frying computers left and right. But there were so few people back in 1995. It was only in, in a, a few hundred people that were actually involved. Uh, and then in, so I went to Seattle, Washington, I met with Bill Gates and I said, listen, you got 47 million people on your website and your contract for Microsoft is a complete adverb, verb, lie. Feeling lucky today under Title 15, Section 1692E, <clears throat> under false and misleading statements for a $25 million fine per person, put the antivirus in there and take it out. So. A couple days later, no more problems. So then, uh, <clears throat> computers upgraded, right? People that had the old computers, and I've got a couple of the old ones from 1995, 
where the antivirus never went in. It's still trapped in the hard drive. If you plug it into a new computer, it'll kill it. It'll actually start on fire. <laughs> I'm serious. And some of the old computer hackers go, that can't happen. So they fried up two computers going, we ain't going to take our new one <laughs> and cook it. But, but uh, there's a few of the old dinosaurs still laying around with that old virus, that old secret virus laying in it. But nobody uses 95 computers anymore. We got the old 80, 80, 86 processor yet, someplace in my basement. Sorry, I got a question. Okay, shoot. What does that do for us if we go to the ground? <clears throat> well, as soon as you autograph your name in that manner, it says that you have been, you've been exposed to this technology. All the judges know, all the judges in the United States, 11,000, both state and federal, have been trained in this technology for 17 years. I've been teaching at Scott Sale, Arizona, since 1995 in Reno, Nevada, at the Judge Institutes, through both video and my program, both on the Internet and in the books. They're made aware of... Every year we give the, pass out the books to the judges here in New Zealand, Australia, England, the United Nations. They get copies of my books so they can stay up, <clears throat> stay up to speed on what's happening. Federal government, the FBI, has got a huge file on me. Uh, the, my passport has about 40 pages of credentials on it for all the treaties I have worldwide with all the different countries, banking, ambassadorships, uh, lawsuits. Uh, and usually when I go through customs, it's uh, going in and out of countries. I got to book like four hours between flights because it takes two to three hours for the immigration people to go through my files before they allow me to pass through. It's getting more and more difficult to move around. Uh, I usually call them ahead of time so they can run my passport and pull the stuff up so when I get there they are fully aware of why I'm there and what I'm doing in the different countries I go to. So, questions? So if I have been using my autograph without the colon in front and my four papers and I start using it, but we should start listening to me. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. See, if I wrote my name in, in cursive, like that, the word cursive, the word curse, to talk to dead people. And this is an adjective, adjective pronoun. This is also classified as italic, which means it's removed from the paper, so it's blank. So when I autograph my paper, I should print it like you have done. Correct. You do it like this. Okay, so I But can, if you're not a mason, don't put the degree sign on there. I do that. But they're fully aware of that. So my autograph should be printed upper lowercase. Everybody should be printing. This was taught to you. When I was a kid in school, they cracked my knuckles with rulers because I would write what I, I would write correct. They made it mandatory that everybody use cursive because they wanted you to disqualify your contract by using cursive, by dead language. And then, then they've got this one. Everybody know that little one? This is an adverb. This is a verb. I swear to talk to dead people in the future tense <clears throat> to make fiction, the being an adverb with no contract of an opinion, so as an adverb to make an illusion, me as a adverb, I feel like an adverb today, folks, uh, to modify the verb God. 
which is uh, incorrect. Now, when, uh, for those, I don't know how many of you know about the 1996 seminar I did in Indianapolis, Indiana for 47 ministers. Broke my own rules. Velma. All right, let's shut my own phone down here. Vibrate only. Okay. Uh, in June of 1996, I did a seminar in Indianapolis, Indiana, for 47 ministers from 16 different religions. We had Muslims, Jews, Christians, Hindus, Buddhists. I mean, you talk about a room full of people. And I was to do a 12-hour seminar in front of all these ministers on syntaxing all their different Bibles and uh, can conduct this thing for 12 hours and keep peace at the same time. And that's, <laughs> that's, that's somewhat of a... Everybody that looked at that said, are you crazy? That's like walking into a lion's den with steaks hanging all over you. <clears throat> so I went ahead and uh, I walked into the room and we had a Jew, a Christian, and a Muslim sitting next to each other. And within five minutes, the three of them talking back and forth were trying to ch take the chair, pull the chairs out of the floor and kill each other with them. I mean, they actually had the chairs up and they were ready to hit each other. I mean, Wait a minute, you guys are men of God, right? You're supposed to be compassionate people. I says, let me ask you a question before you kill each other. Does three plus three equals six? And I want to show a hands, and all 47 hands went up. It says, hey, Mr. Jew, why didn't you kill the Christian in the Muslim because, he's, because three plus three equals six? He goes, well, that's a math problem. He says, no one ever went to war over a math problem. I says, oh, you guys understand that. And he says, do you know that every single one of you in this room put an adverb in front of the word God? And everyone all got to think, what does it say? The church of God. Adverb, verb, adverb, verb. The house of God. Uh, church of Christ. Church is a pronoun. It's an adverb making Christ a verb. It says, every condition that you have said here, you've put an adverb in front of your belief. And I'll just like that, everyone in the room goes, well, God's not a verb. He's a fact. Just, no, what did you work, what'd you all put it down in writing for? I mean, you put your signs up in front of the... Well, that's what the lawyers told us to do when they wrote the signs. I says, yeah, lawyers are liars. So are attorneys. I says, the whole thing is to keep you kept in the world of fiction. Now, where did laws come from? Every law in the world came from the religions. The, the religion came first in the community, in the, in the, the uh, ministers, <clears throat> the bishops, the cardinals. Uh, anybody who was a church leader, a religious leader, engineered condition of brainwashing for 8,500 years going back in, to the beginning of, of written history. And I took time to do the studies on this, and that's why I can make the statement to everybody. I'm not here to disqualify anybody's religious beliefs. It's just subjective interpretation of knowing how they, they got you, how you got into the situation in the first place. So it's important that, that all of us are uh, aware of our, of our heritage. And what we're doing is we're bringing things into a quantum, a mathematical procedure of knowing where the secrets lie. When you're able to learn syntax and get into the Bibles, any Bible you want to choose, and identify those parts of speech and put the missing words in, you're going to see new definitions. And they can be written both frontwards and backwards. And that's the unique thing. The math interface on grammar was very simple. I spent three years with all different kinds of, of different programs in math, trying to break this code. And the, the code was x plus 1 equals 2. 2 minus 1, ah, yeah. So 
So you got, you got x plus 2 equals 3, 3 minus 2 equals 1, 1 equals x, x times two, 3 equals 6, 6 divided by 3 equals 2, 2 equals x. In other words, we add, subtract, multiply, and divide to find out, by doing math backwards, what the secret is to correct the math. And no one ever went to oral math problem because they said we just do it backwards and check your math. That was pretty simple. So what I have in my hand here is a pen. I throw that pen up in the air. The motion of thinking didn't change this fact. So motion, and the courts always want you to file motions, but they change the facts with motions because what they're doing is they're modifying the facts with adverbs, creating verbs. But the verb, that now they want to say the pen does an adverb making pen a verb. They want to take this article and, and change it into something that's not. Therefore, you commit perjury. So if we go back to this problem here, if we have a fact here at the beginning, and we have a fact over here, we have a fact here, and we have a fact here, this must be a correct program. The thing that appears in front of a fact is a conjunction, which is and and or. Those are the only two conjunctions in the English language. What you have in front of that, when you factor these, when you factor them out, is you've got a, a, plus three, a plus two and a minus two, a multiple three and a division three. Okay, when we were in, in grafting, here's a negative two and here's a positive two. When we go up and down the scale, it's motion. Therefore, we assign the, the, uh, the number to a verb, and we factor that out, because a verb doesn't have any modification. That's your thinking of a sentence. What is left is add, subtract, multiply, and divide, which are opposite operations, better known as the preposition or the position. What is a position? A position means we will use the... We, we're going to have a contract first before we get started. We agree that we're going to use the ABC alphabet to identify this pen or this object. With the ABC alphabet, we're now going to take this object and we're going to spell it pen, P-E-N. What is the pen for? The pen is for writing. So we're going to have an a alphabet, a spelling, and a definition. Therefore, we know what the position of this object is. Now, who owns this pen? For my pen, with my pen, of my pen, by my pen. You see, now I can go ahead and identify this because of lodial positioning of ownership, which we used to call the article. But the article, uh, when you had a preposition, it meant you had no position, so you could presume anything. If, pre if you had no preposition, and no ownership, but an article, which meant no contract, you had a no-no, henceforth a noun. But now we had to change it to a position, lodial fact. With that said, we now have a, a word that has 900 definitions. I proved that every word in the English language has 900 definitions because we have 68 articles and 38, I mean, 68 prepositions and 38 articles that gives you 1,800. When you multiply it, divided by 2 is 900. So with 900 definitions for a pen, I can say, for my pen, for your pen, with your pen, with my pen, of your pen, of my pen. Every time I change the preposition, I change the definition. I can say his, yours, uh, hers, this, the, a, and... And keep going through the whole list. Put them all down, cross-reference them all up with the word pen, and I got 900 definitions. Put two, de two definitions together, 900 times 900 is 810,000 variables with two words. Put a third one times 900, and you've got 720 million variables. Put a fourth one, and you have 64, 640 billion variables. A fifth one, you have 700... Uh, 540 trillion variables. They said, well, the computers are only rated for 
uh, the capacity. Write a 200-word sentence, and we're talking about a number with 200 zeros after it, variables, to write a legal sentence. They're saying that computers don't have enough memory capacity to write one sentence. Try writing a whole book or a 400-page website and do it correct 100% of the time. When you're working in a math problem, you've got to be correct 100% of the time. There is no room for error. You know, they build a space shuttle with, with 3 million components. It goes to the moon. They screw up with one. Any number of, of variables, 3 million correct things times zero, still equals zero. That's why the space shuttle blew up on the, in 1983. I was there at ground zero as that thing came over the top of the uh, Kennedy Space Center and blew up right on top of me. To be there at the only one of 50 space shuttle launches to see that one. I was there four times to see four successful launches. But I got to see that one blow up. You know, it's, it's a rare, I've done, been in a lot of rare positions. I was in Hurricane Camille, Biloxi, Mississippi, when it, when it took out Camille and, and, and Biloxi Air Force Base, the Keesler Air Force Base. I was at ground zero in a body cleanup in 1969, in August. There's, uh, there's a lot of unique things I've been exposed to. Been in tornadoes, been picked up, had my car picked up in a tornado, survived that. The man in front of me died. His car got flipped over and blew up. He was destroyed. Just 80 miles an hour, that much, to travel 15 feet. He died, I didn't, because he was 15 feet in front of me. The amount of things, why you're here, why you're supposed to be here, all the split-second things that happen in your life, but the snap of a finger. I was 18 years old. I'm standing up against a tree. I'm playing with a 20-gauge shotgun shell while we're at rabbit hunting. And I bend over to pick up. I, I, I drop, the, uh, I drop the, the shell. And as I bend over to pick it up, a 30-30 slug split the black of my jacket open. Did I drop that pen? Or was it knocked out of my hand? And I bent over to pick it up just as the slug split through my jacket. And uh, I still have the bullet hole in the back of my middle of my back. A scar formed years later. And it's quite prevalent. It's about an inch in diameter, about a quarter inch deep, where the bullet went through me. But why am I still here doing this? Is because I'm supposed to be. And if they are successful in assassinating, in assassinating me, they just go back and reset the clock and jump over and fix it. Because this math interface on communications will stop wars and guarantee that planet Earth does have a future, not only with our own people, our own races, our own tribes, or with ET when he shows up. Because eventually we're going to evolve. We're, we're, we're out there in space. We're broadcasting. You don't think those signals don't go out? And somebody's going to be listening someplace and just show up here? You know, do the math. We're a young, we're a young planet. We're, we're, we're a young species amongst the billions of years that this, that this world's been around. We always, the proof of that is in the spacecraft up in Greenland that they've been here 50,000 years ago. And those guys were 60, 65 to 85 feet tall. They had dinosaurs. The world was big way back when. Now everything is small. Question? Yeah, you talked a couple times about ETs. What exactly are they or what, what's the purpose? ET can be many of anything. That's, it means extraterrestrial, which means not of this world. And, you know, there's been millions of sightings worldwide of uh, spacecrafts, right? Even a couple weeks ago, opening night of the Olympics. Anybody watch that on TV in London? They had the fireworks went off above the stadium. And that's a no-fly zone because of security. And there was a UFO above the stadium, about 50, 60 feet in diameter, because the, everything went up in so many different spectrums of light. It was cloaked, had a cloaking device, but because of the amount of of light frequencies from the explosives of all the different fireworks, chemical light, it illuminated the spacecraft above the stadium. And it was on YouTube, and over 200 different countries videotaped it. 
And they try to play it down as being a balloon in the air. There's no balloons up there. There's no blimps. There's no aircrafts. But E.T. was up there watching. Uh, I, I say that at all. I do this at all the seminars. Small craft would not have power to travel between point A and point B because of the of the universe, how big it is. In other words, closest star is four light years away. Orion. The because an object no bigger than this room would have a fuel supply capable of doing something like that. So my my take on this is that it, these are time machines from Earth, from our own future, because they're only visible for a split second. And the same craft has been videotaped and photographed millions of times over the last 70 years all over the planet, identical to the one above the stadium. Sorry, those pictures still on YouTube? About no, every one of them on the Internet has been taken down. Nobody's got it. I, there was a few sites that were up there, but the government's been chopping them off left and right. Anything with the... If you, if you type in, uh, but people do have copies, and they're putting them up as fast as they tear them down. So if you type in UFO over uh, Olympics opening day, it'll, it'll pull up a whole bunch of different sites and see pictures of it. My surmise is that these are time machines that come back in time to view or stop events that would destroy the planet. Some crazy guy setting off a dirty bomb, for instance. They, they run the video backwards and find out who's responsible, come back in time to remove this individual. In as much as mom and dad never met, instead of turning right at the corner, he turned left and never met his mate. Therefore, the individual was never created. The crime never took place. It's something as simple as that. Being able to fix the time-space continuum because, you know, in the course in the Cold War from World War II until present day, they built 88,000 nuclear bombs that didn't detonate any of them because of what happened. Um, everybody knows Oppenheimer, the guy who developed the atomic bomb, World War II in uh, Area 51. His brother died two years ago on his deathbed. He told, he gave the G, uh, GPS location of two B-2 bombers in Germany that had flown through the Philadelphia experiment at the time it took place in 1944, the window was, was opened, and the two B-2 bombers flew through that window in 19, uh, in 20, 2007 or 2008 it was, and they flew back in time and landed in Germany in 1945. And they, they built this hangar, and they had this, this hangar completely covered over with dirt, 20 feet of dirt, with these two B-2 bombers with four nuclear bombs in there, but they didn't have fuel for them. Otherwise, they could have flown those bombers into New York City from Germany. Uh, and uh, on his death best, he gave the GPS the location of those two, and they were dug up. That was up on YouTube, that they had recovered these two bombers that had flown back in time and verified that the window is still open on the Philadelphia experiment. There's, there's events that are taking place that are becoming more and more relevant to, to the relevancy of what quantum language is and its importance in the timeline of this planet and why I'm allowed to teach this and how specific events have taken place that I've uncovered in contract language like the beginning of the post office, how the fraud took place, and been able to unravel who do you prosecute in court. When we go to court, uh, this here is a federal lawsuit that I wrote. This deals with... Uh, um, see, this one is for, this is the International Maritime Organization. Russell Gould and I put this one together. But this is a document contract, federal postal court, federal court venue document. It's postal, folks. We have federal federal flag and a federal post-it stamp. This is a federal court we're suing. 
When this goes into when this goes into this commission under maritime law, this is the court. This paper is. And when it's filed at the maritime commission, this was filed creating this vessel in a sea of space to be the court. They have to come into the understanding of the syntax within this document and say, all the Maritime Commission officers have to say, show me your correct parse syntax grammar oath of office. Show me the correct parse syntax laws, rules, regulations, and codes that allow you to do and capture the things you capture. We have rewritten your lawsuit or rewritten your, your, your charter in the correct parse syntax grammar. And we are now treating, tr forming a treaty with you through the Document Contract Postal Vessel Court Corporation. That's myself and Russell Gould. Yes? So if you taught this stuff to them, you mentioned in 2000, why are they still going on in their fiction? They're only advertising the fiction to you as the pop population. Why? Because if they were to stand up and say, okay, we've got a quantum contract here, and the whole planet is sitting there in fiction, It'd be like the president getting on CNN and explaining the dollar bill to you, disqualifying all money. You can't have, the whole world has been 8,500 years in fiction with all their, their fiction contracts. So you have to be responsible at all times that when we want to switch gears, I only have to educate 1% of the population. Those are your political leaders, your judges, your attorneys, your politicians, Congress, Senate, the legislature of all 250 countries, all the bankers. Simultaneously, where the, the United Nations stands up and says, we're going to switch gears today. Everybody changes on the same day. Is that going to happen? Yeah, it's going to happen. Just like they had the new money come out. They went to the euro. These were different exercises in, in communicating a change, a dynamic change of a large area of international trade, commerce, and contract and see how the people accepted it. Well, it worked for the euro. It worked for when the new money came out. Nobody got crazy. Stock market didn't go nuts. So any time frame? Well, 12, 21, 2012 is a couple of weeks away. We'll find out because that's what all the, all the calendars say is the beginning of the end. Yes. So are we going to have um, an Amero? Well, okay, the Amero is Canada, Mexico, and the United States, and Central America. In other words, everyone on the North American continent using the same currency <clears throat> and tear down the borders between Canada and, the United, and Mexico so that you have, it would be one country under the postal. The Amero is, is a reality, but it's not in place yet because of the trade, the value of trade between the different countries. The contract that surrounds the Amero is written in adverb verb. That's why it has not been implemented. It may be implemented with the next presidential election, provided the treaties have been reconfigured. Uh, when I went to China, we took the new transportation money contracts in quantum grammar, these are the upgrades from 2000 on the international trade agreements we wrote with the different 70, 82 country banking. And those have now been implemented. We spent $2,500 on mailings to mail out the new contracts to all the same countries that we are treated with beforehand. We sued all 50 election boards with the correct parse syntax grammar election forms, which are seven and 25 government agencies here about uh, six weeks ago before we went over to China. Uh, those were all sent out registered mail, pink card return receipts. We haven't gotten back a single pink card. <laughs> However, when I walked into the federal building, the marshals surrounded me and said, the Justice Department is extremely interested in you. We've got so much, we've got so much flash, flash, taking place on the computer on, on you, uh, you're a real hot box. He says, well, I'm a presidential candidate. I says, I filed my papers. I says, so under, under the guise of the Secret Service. So they escorted me out of the building, 
all six marshals and said, you're not allowed to be in our building. You're a, you're a presidential candidate. You, you're under Secret Service, guys. You can't be in a federal building. You're a sovereign person. And you're also an Article Three judge. Anybody know what an Article Three judge is? You've probably never heard of one before. Well, even the marshal service said, we've heard the word Article Three judge. We've never met one before. You're a genuine sovereign and an Article Three judge. And uh, an Article Three judge is a judge on contract, folks. I don't work in a courtroom. Don't sit in a courthouse anywhere in the world. The courthouse is the paper. The paper is the contract. The contract words on the paper is a constitution. The constitution articulates under law of the flag and postal codes the geographical location in terms of a constitution... Title 28, 1331, venue authorization for a clerk to file the paperwork, a 131361 13, authorization for a judge, and a Title 28, Section 636 to order the court open. In other words, ordering the piece of paper to be an open court, and whoever signs the stamp endorses it and puts their name on it as a federal judge is the federal judge on the paper. Because it's a federal stamp and a federal flag, there is no such thing as a state court. Any state court touching money, doesn't it say federal reserve note? You can't be federal in a state entity. If there is no money involved in a state court operation, they must get you to sign a bond making your body collateral for the bond. There's no paper. You become a value as a bond, that's why you have to bond out of a state court. They can't create money. They're not federal. They're state. And the courthouse is a foreign vessel in dry dock. So you've left Indiana, Indiana Territory, and now you've entered the condition of an illusion who makes you bond yourself. Once you're bonded to the vessel in dry dock, the sheriff can leave the, the courthouse, and the sheriff is only there to protect the judge, and go out and capture you as a bounty hunter. And that gives him his authorization to leave the vessel and go out onto the Indiana Territory and capture you. If you don't bond out, you'll never leave the foreign vessel in dry dock. Because if they don't own you, they can't leave the courthouse to come and get you. Now, when you file one of my lawsuits in federal district court, once it's contracted with the clerk of the courts, which is responsible to receive vessels and dock the vessel, a district court judge is not a federal judge. They must sign the federal oath and must sign the federal lawsuit to be a federal judge on the lawsuit. The, the federal judge is going to come back Federal judge is going to come back and uh, here's your case number. It's 12 CV 123. That's what the clerk puts on your paperwork. The judge is going to come back and he's going to answer you 12 CV lowercase 0123. It's a different case number. Or they're going to come back and say C12123. That's another case number. Then they're going to come back CV120123. Lowercase CV. One two zero zero one two three twelve uh, uppercase C V zero one two three. These are all then you're gonna say, well this is a, this is the case number here. No, all these are different case numbers. Now if you had taken one of these and put them as the key to get into your computer, you think that any of these are gonna open up your computer except the correct one? Same thing is true when you go looking for the case number at the courthouse. They punch that in there. They're not going to find your case number. Then they're going to say, well, you paid 350 bucks for this case number, and they dismissed your case under this one. Or the judge sent, come to court with this number. The lawyer filed this one. The lawyer answered back to this one. The judge dismissed your case with this one, and they want you to come into court to arbitrate this one when this is your original number. Okay, once your original number is filed, we run 45-day trust law and three-day rescissions. 
Once the, those 48 days go by, you have now a document contract, I mean, I, uh, a fault document contract claim, four words, writ of the fault document contract claim. We filed the lawsuit. We filed the correct parse syntax grammar. We took the... Let's see here. There it is. This here is your deed of trust to your property here in Indiana. And we identified every single word by placing a number on top of it. All 6,000 words. So we couldn't, if we, take, if we take this document and write the word adjective on top of the word red, we wouldn't have enough space, right? So we use the number three in place of it. When we do numbers, you can read 300 words a second when it comes time to correct this document. You know that? It just takes a little bit of practice, and all of a sudden, like, you're aware you can read 300 words a second in number codes. The mind can comprehend 10,000 thoughts a second. So doing 300 a second is just, once you get used to it, it's a breeze to blow through contracts and read in number codes. Question? Okay, birth certificates. When you are born, the United States government allows you 45 days under trust law, and on the 45th day, you're declared to be a dead person because your name on your birth certificate is nom de guerre. Okay, on that 45th day, they then take your birth certificate and sell it to the Internal Revenue Service and issue all $1 million worth of cash to go into your account. Why do they do that? Because they need money to account for your wages, Medical expenses, automobiles, buying houses, uh, and then accumulated interest to pay for your retirement at 65 through 100. If they don't put a million dollars in cash into a numbering system as a value for the energy of your life, there would never be enough dollars in the system to support the entire planet's operations as the population expands. This is a good thing. Number two, under the redemption, it's called redemption, which was created by Janet Reno in 1995 under Bill Clinton. Redemption was engineered to capture anybody that would steal money from, the, from this treasury, from this number, and put them in prison for 30 years for bail, mail fraud banking. Why? Because the redemption program was set up in adverb verb, and if you use adverb verb, you activate the Title 15, Section 1692E, and, and Title 1578 FF for a $25 million fine and 30 years in prison for bank fraud. And if you don't study this program, thousands, tens of thousands of people were put in prison for using the redemption and stepping on that, that trap. Lost their homes. Uh, Peterson, Clark, and Schweitzer, Leroy Schweitzer, promoted this thing and went through and harvested over 2,000 families across the South and the West, lost their homes, went to prison. They could, took their farms, their cars, their homes, their pension, everything, put them in prison, which resulted in, for those that are old enough, the Freeman standoff in, in Montana, Montana Freeman, 1995. And guess who prosecuted the 100 FBI agents for fraud and misleading statements on that exercise? I did. I'm the judge. And now the same U.S. attorney that was involved, went up against me in 1995, is involved with the Kansas case I'm involved with on a foreclosure. When my name popped up last week, she went ballistic. <laughs> she says she lost that case in 1995. It was a bird, a burr. You know where burrs go. <laughs> and... Uh, as a result of that, she, she is just livid. She wants my head on a, on a stick. I'm going, well, have fun. I says, well, first off, you got a second grade reading level against my 28th grade reading level, and I'm going to have you for breakfast. So it's just a matter of a couple of weeks before we file the indictments against her. Now, question. What happened to the Freeman? 
Uh, well, here's the state of Montana. Here's, here's uh, where the Freemen were held up. Here's Billings, Montana, and I was right here in Cat Creek. Now, when I showed up in Billings, I got off the plane, and a, a gentleman met me, and he says, come on, we're going over to my, to my ranch. Well, I had corresponded with this man several times. When I got to the ranch, there was about 20 guys with shotguns. And he said, you're going to stay here and write a lawsuit at gunpoint, and you're going to write this lawsuit to get these guys out of trouble up here. Well, it took five days to put together the lawsuit to do it. Then I went on the radio to do a radio show in Billings, Montana, about Parse Syntax Grammar and how the fraud works. The FBI, five minutes after we started broadcasting, blew up all four radio stations in Billings, Montana. So we called another radio station uh, 200 miles away, and we, re we sent out the broadcast, went out on Republican Christian Radio worldwide as to what was going on. <clears throat> 38 miles south of the compound, there is a, a limestone quarry 125 feet deep. One of the, some of the other free thinkers, I guess you could call them, freemen, witnessed two 105 howitzer cannons being moved at night down the country road very quietly. And they set up two 120 millimeter cannons in the quarry. They then evacuated everybody within five miles away of the quarry because they would hear the blast of the cannons when they were fired. The idea was to shoot a shell 20 miles up in the air under a full moon and have it fall down on top of the compound, blowing a hole in the ground 100 feet wide and 50 feet deep, saying they had explosives and blew themselves up, hence without solving the problem. In 1820, the area, now Lewis and Clark showed up up here in 1834 on the Yellowstone with Sashagawean. In 1820, an Indian treaty was cut up here with the French. The farm of the freemen had never been ceded into the United States of America. It was a hole in the United States of America under Indian treaty. And this was purchased land. When everything got conquered, the treaty of 1820 was overlooked. So the freemen were sitting on sovereign territory, not part of the United States of America, outside the jurisdiction. It was a hole in America. That's why the FBI came from Puerto Rico. 100 agents were deputized, not of the United States citizenship, and surrounded the compound but couldn't go in. They couldn't trespass onto a foreign country because they didn't have a permit to be there. These are some of the secrets that you people don't know about. And as a federal judge, I have classified information about all this because I handle lawsuits for all this stuff. When it was exposed that the cannons were here, it was my job then to get word to the freemen. The senator from Denver, Colorado shows up, and he took nine of my cassette tapes in about grammar and gave it to the freemen. After playing the tapes, they said they realized that their whole entire position and the way they were thinking was a lie. He realized that their treaty, even though they were sovereign within their, this little hole in the world, was also a lie because the treaty was written in adverb verb and didn't, didn't mean anything. And they were also told about the two howitzers, that if you don't walk out before dark, you're not going to walk out anywhere. We're going to put a hole in the ground here. So they surrendered. Now, the senator, when he went there from Colorado, we had a button microphone on him. Looks just like a regular button on a suit, but it was actually a, a nickel-sized transmitter with a 300-foot range on it, tied to another mic to a recorder, spike, you know, like a spy camera. And we have him on tape in his voice stating that, I don't care about these people, I'm just here for the show. He says, I'm here to make sure that they all get blowed up. And yet, he, on TV, he made a statement that he was there to try and help them get out of here. He was there to orchestrate this thing. What is Denver, Colorado? You got Cheyenne Mountain. Cheyenne Mountain is closed. Cheyenne Mountain, in 1995, was active. But it was closed right after this. And everything went up to Mount... Um, 
They moved, they pulled Cheyenne Mountain out, and everything went up to, uh, uh, there's another mountain about 30 miles away. NORAD headquarters were moved over there. I forgot the name of it right now. But anyways, uh, the mine control programs by the Air Force are also up in that same location. In each one of the shootings at all the high schools that took place, also these students came out of, including the last one in Arizona, came, their parents were affiliated with this year, and those kids were all part of the brainwashing program. And uh, the minute the kid goes brainwashing grammar, you type in the word grammar, up pops 20 million websites tied to David Wynn Miller. <laughs> and so they tried to hook me up with this whole thing. As far as the Freeman go, uh, they then, when they saw the tapes on grammar, they realized that the FBI had no correct grammar. There was no correct anything. So they threw up their arms and said, okay, take us. And every single, they've charged them with uh, 200 counts on 45-day intervals. And each count was brought to them in adverb verb. The statement is, we are here to participate with the correct sentence structure, communication, parse, syntax, grammar for the avoidance of the perjury. Show us your laws, rules, regulations, and codes with the correct parse, syntax, grammar so we can avoid perjury. Case dismissed. Wait another 45 days and bring one more charge. They've been in jail since 1995. I think Peterson died already, so did, so did uh, Clark, and I heard uh, Schweitzer just recently died. All in prison whatever out being released because they were always waiting for trial. That's how that happened. But the, the military, as far as these things go, oh, by the way, this uh, the senator from Colorado, I missed my plane. And I got bumped to another plane in the emergency road. I sat right next to the same senator. I had the tape recording in my hand of what he said in secret to the FBI about killing the Freeman. And I, we played it on the radio <laughs> worldwide. When he, got, when he landed in Denver, Colorado, he was kicked out of the Senate. And I played it for him on the tape. And we had the worst turbulence of the 1,400 flights I've been on in the last 17 years. It was the worst turbulence I had ever been exposed to on a plane. And he got up in this turbulence and got out of his, and changed seats to sit someplace else because he knew who I was and what I was doing, and what my position was of getting the Freeman to surrender. And when I played him his own voice back, committing treason against the people to kill American citizens, he couldn't stand to face me and got up and left. But we also played it for the population on, on Denver radio, and he was kicked out of office when he got back to Denver. What are the odds of me being placed in that location at that exact point in time to, to do all those things? Here's another one for you. I'm in Honolulu, Hawaii, and I missed my plane. I wound up on a 747 in row 47, back of a plane, flying from, it was a nonstop flight from Honolulu to Chicago, Illinois. Lady sitting next to me is, uh, is a school teacher. And her daughter is sitting next to her. She's uh, 18 years old. She's complaining, I'm tired of moving. I'm tired of changing schools all the time. Can't we ever stay in one place? I says, all my friends live in Honolulu. I'm going, sounds like you get around a lot. She says, yes, my, my, my husband's in the military, and so we have to move all the time. I says, uh, what's your husband's name? Helm. Uh, Admiral Helm. Helm Pacific Fleet Task Force Aircraft Carrier, mm -hmm. Harvey Helm. Mm -hmm. And this is the wife of the, of the admiral who's just been assigned to the Joint Chiefs of Staff in Washington, D.C. three days earlier. And she was going there to join him and, and enroll her daughter in a Florida school for girls. And, uh, and she's an English teacher. Well, Mrs. Helm also has a son in the, in the uh, Navy assigned to the Palestine-Israeli conflict in Europe. 
and he's over in Europe right now, and this is when Palestine and Israel were shooting at each other. Things were really heated up. Well, Admiral Helm was being transferred from the Pacific Fleet, from the Helm uh, Task Force, to the Joint Chiefs of Staff. What is she doing sitting in row 47 on the back of a 747 with me as a federal judge? Well, the man in front of us is Secret Service, not realizing that Mrs. Helm, we're this far away, speaking quite loud, and he hears this. All of a sudden, like, he collapses and says, oh, I'm having a heart attack. So the stewardess clear off the row directly behind us of five seats and relocate the passengers and other rows. The captain gets on the PA system and says, ladies and gentlemen, we need a... Uh, we needed heart surgeons. Are there any heart surgeons on board? 400 people on board the plane. Well, we had three heart surgeons on board. So they all came back to the row, and they're all standing there looking at this guy, and he's complaining of having a heart attack. The captain comes back, and he goes like, what are you men doing? He's having a heart attack. Service him. He says, we don't have a contract. He says, you don't seem to understand. I'm the captain of an airship in international space. I am the chief cook and bottle washer of this place. You guys will service him or be locked in the brig. So the one doctor goes over and kneels down and takes his blood pressure and pulse, 110 over 70, pulse 72. Sound like anybody with a heart attack? Sound like a pretty healthy man to me. He pulls his guy down. I'm looking through the seats, and he whispers something to him. He perks up, and he goes running all the way back. Ladies and gentlemen, uh, we're going to have to stop in Los Angeles and, and do some medical emergency and drop this man off. So we land at the end of the runway in Los Angeles. The whole entire plane is surrounded by black SUVs. Seven guys in black uniforms with no markings on come on board. Five take the immediate seats behind us as the other two guys carry this guy off the plane, and we proceed to Chicago. Who were they? They were military secret service to guard Harvey Helm's wife, Joint Chiefs of Staff. Somebody screwed up big time. The point is I had eight hours to teach her parse syntax grammar to write the Palestine-Israeli Treaty, which I worked with her on, using the United Nations treaties that I had written for the international trade agreements, to give to her, and who does Mrs. Helm sleep with? Yeah. Joint Chiefs of Staff, Harvey Helm. So therefore, she was able to educate him to go to the Joint Chiefs of Staff and settle the Israeli dispute on parse syntax grammar fraud, because they were arguing an adverb verb, not that they had a position of a treaty in quantum language. 72 hours later, you heard that the Palestine-Israeli treaty was signed, and it's been peace ever since. There's a little Syria rattles or their, their shingles every now and then, but basically it's been pretty peaceful since then. The world leaders worldwide are studying this technology because they know it is a vehicle to have world peace. So, question. What's that? Ah, uh, I don't know. I've been doing this for 17 years. I can't. I, I couldn't tell you which which day the. You can probably pull up Harvey Helm in, on on the internet from the uh, Admiral Helm. Uh, it'll give you a history of his position with the Pacific Fleet when he was transferred to the uh, uh, Joint Chiefs of Staff in Washington at the Pentagon. That'll cross-reference the exact dates of the Palestine-Israeli conflict. And then you can get your, your treaties from that. I can tell you how to cross-reference things. I don't remember the exact dates myself. So... Uh, I, yeah, I've been talking for three hours without giving you guys a minute break here. <laughs> I told you guys, you got to throw something at me after a couple hours, otherwise I don't shut up. So, okay. All right. You're walking into and what you see. The, the flags that you see in all over the world. There's 11 different flags in the United States, military and civilian <coughs> operations, including the new one. Uh, 
Uh, and there's another one. Uh, when President Obama on election day was elected, if you look at the pictures on all the newspapers across the United States, you saw this flag hanging behind Obama. It's a New World Order flag. It has a circle of stars, a blue square field, and it's one to 2.25. They also had another one with 50 stars, one to 1 to, 1 to 2.25. That was the United States Treasury flag. <clears throat> the flag that's three by four with a blue square field is a military boat flag. All vessels in dry dock on planet Earth, uh, like your own personal house, the school building, these are all vessels in dry dock. They fly a, should be flying a <clears throat> three by four boat flag. The flag over here with yellow fringe on it, see if I can. This is a one to 1.9, I recognize. This is old, this is a very old flag, by the way. When you take the flag and you fold it like this, corner to corner, and then you take it, and you put it up here to the corner, it should only have one stripe showing, which does. So this is a 1 to 1.9 flag. By putting a fringe on it, you say that the contract for the United States of America, or the better known as the Constitution, has been captured by the yellow fringe, which is the court flags, maritime law. It says your contract is null and void because they put a, a phoenix on top. So the, the, the wing tips pointed down is a Vatican banking phoenix. Wing tips up is a postal, uh, your postal eagle. I call it the postal chicken. The, <laughs> The, the acorn, as you see, the acorn is for military parades. It's a military symbol, ACC, meaning no, no contract. The spear is for military court marshals. And the ball is for military advertising and military recruiting. Henceforth, you have it in front of the post office with the ball on top. And inside the post office, you have the eagle on top because the post office is... Postal. Henceforth, you're in a postal building, but outside, you where you sign up for the draft. Uh, everyone you turn 18, you've got to sign up for the draft. You've got, I don't know, 90 days after your 19th, uh, 18th birthday to do so. The 3 by 5 flag is a military flag with a blue square field. It's used for parades. The reason that they have this flag, not the 1 to 1.9 flag, is because of the the weight of the flag would hang down, whereas in a marching at three miles an hour, the wind would catch it and it would be loft because of its weight. The 1 to 1.9 flag I now hold copyrights to is the correct sentence structure, communication, parse, syntax, grammar flag recognized worldwide, both in black and white and in color <clears throat> red, white, and blue. The 3 by 5 base flag has a 3 by 4 field. And this is for military bases. The ones they sell at Walmart are three by five with a blue square field. That is a military flag. And when the, <clears throat> the, the sentence runs like this, when they come looking for your jurisdiction, what flag are you flying? And if you've got a military base flag outside your door, don't be surprised if the military can go ahead and set up camp in your because you've given it military jurisdiction to start with. When you have my flag on my business card, and of all things, I forgot my business cards today. I've only got, I think, five of them here with me. Five or six of them. I've got a couple here. I think i got six of them. i got about 50 of them back at the house. So what we're going to do is... Uh, uh, Huh? No, I got a <laughs> my, now these cards, uh, I'm sorry I forgot them. My business cards are like get out of jail free cards. You put these on your driver's licenses and you get pulled over by the cops, they take one look at it. 
On the back of the cards, the procedures to prosecute judges and attorneys and police officers. They take one look at that and they start reading it and going like, oh, he belongs to that group. This group is not allowed in the courthouse. They don't even, won't give you a citation. Uh, Thursday last week, I blew a stop sign on the phone with no seatbelt. The police officer was right there <laughs> sitting. I mean, it blew right past them. He comes pulling up behind me and he goes like, Dave, he goes, he says, you know me? He says, yeah, I've been in your house about four times. He says, I know you live right across the street over here. He says, uh, were you on a cell phone? I says, no, I was singing to the music. He says, I see you got your seatbelt on. He says, but you know you blew a stop sign right in front of me. I says, well, actually I had my hand up and I had a cramp in my neck. I says, and I was massaging it, so I was pushing on it and I had my head tipped a little. And that's why I probably didn't see the stop sign. Uh, uh, as simple as that. He says, well, pay attention. Here's your license back. And he goes and he says, federal judge. He says, yeah. He says, yeah, I know you're a federal judge. I already pulled your file because I've been to your house several times. He says, pay attention. <laughs> <laughs> when you use that and, and you show it to a regular cop, will he know it? Huh? never heard of that. I'll give the cameraman here so he's, so he's got to have references. Huh? Here, pass it back to him. We'll have to get some more. Thirty zone, twelve over. Oh, 25 school phone, school phone, yeah. That's public safety violation. See, now, if you would leave your vessel, you're a captain of your vessel. Right. If you leave your vessel and stand in the street, then you're a vagrant. I was not going to get out and of therefore, you were under arrest. I was not about to get out of my car. Uh, one of my students called me up the other night, and he says, uh, I got a ticket, Dave. Can you make it go away? I'm going, how much was it? 87 and 55. Mm. That's 32 over. That's public safety violation. <laughs> he says, all the cars were driving that fast in L.A., on the, on the expressway. And I says, and he singled me out. It's still public safety. You blow a tire at 87 miles an hour, and you're going to be so much scrap metal bound, rolling down the highway, taking everybody else out with you. I says, no, nah, I ain't going to stand by that. Yeah, when it comes to school zones, you won't get... School zone is, is public safety. You've got to watch out for children, because they're always... They don't pay attention. They run across streets. And you tag a kid, I'll tell you what, they're going to throw away the key on you. Especially if you're going fast like that. So, the, uh, <clears throat> but this one here, one, I'm going to give you guys a history lesson in a minute. This one here, this one, the 2.25 flag. I went to Washington, D.C., and I had one of the 1934 uh, gold certificates from China. This was on original clay paper. Uh, with butterfly ink, and it was an original copy of a $500 million note. My surrender commission is uh, $50, million, $50 million for surrendering a, a document. Secret Service showed up and wanted to arrest me for passing fraudulent documents, and I had six inches of credentials out of New York, New York State Bank uh, to verify it. He says, where's the rest of it? He says, there's $8.7 billion on this package. I says, well, it's in Austin, Texas. He gave him the address. Well, they surrounded the property, and they got the guy with the, other, with the rest of the notes. He wound up with eight years in prison. As a federal judge, though, being at the United States Treasury, I says, I want a receipt for that. I says, I'm turning over United States government property to the United States government to be put back into the Treasury. The eight officers of the United States Treasury all came into the room to meet me and to review the note along with the two Secret Service agents and they wrote me out a receipt for the note. He says, if this is legitimate, we owe you $50 million. So um, 10 days later, I called back and I asked for each one of the individuals. 
They no longer worked there. The note disappeared. I think everybody took a commission, including both Secret Service agents, and they all retired elsewhere. <laughs> but I never got paid. <laughs> then the guy says to me, where's your bodyguards? How can you transport this much money and not be, not, not be captured? I says, you ever hear the word secrecy? It's the best fault in the world. So, <clears throat> I'm going to do a little history lesson for everyone, since how everyone has never... <clears throat> I go to universities, colleges, high schools, and you'll never see this in any of the schools taught... Seventeen seventy five, the United States of America goes to uh, France and borrows one point six million francs to go ahead and fight the Revolutionary War against England. <clears throat> the war rages on for seven years. In seventeen in seventeen eighty two they now owe 2 million francs to the French. So the United States of America, <clears throat> 13 colonies, file bankruptcy domestic against the, because they can't pay it, they just come out of a war and they got no money. 1787, uh, uh, 1789, 17 of September. The United States of America cannot pay back the 3 million francs now. So England, Rothschild, goes ahead and buys the $3 million note, throwing in the United States into a 70-year international bankruptcy. Add 70 years to the, now the, the Declaration, or rather the Constitution of the United States of America was written and the Congress would not sign it, so they put the Bill of Rights on top of it. They signed the Bill of Rights, but it was bonded, so therefore the Constitution of the United States was signed because of the bonding. The Declaration of Independence D means no, Claire means speak, at is location, ION is contract, in means no, D means no, pend means write, ANS means contract. You shall not write contract and you shall not speak contract, Benjamin Franklin. The is an adverb, you got a prepositional phrase of the, but they split it. The is an adverb making declaration a verb, of is an adverb making independence a verb. Both false and misleading statements and fictitious conveyance of grammar. Henceforth, the Declaration of Independence is being sold at auction as a meaningless document written by a French attorney who was hired by the English Crown to capture the United States of America and the founder of the Continental Congress. Welcome to treason at its first course, Benjamin Franklin. Since I brought this out in 1995, there's been eight, eight major books published on Benjamin Franklin's treason as being bigger than Benedict Arnold, for those of you who know Benedict Arnold. How should you write that? Huh? How should you write that? Well, not declaration. S apostrophe.
Need to be creative. Um, what's another word for improvement? Um, quality. Something like that, for the people's knowledge of the Constitution is with the claim of the correct sentence structure, communication, parse, syntax, grammar, with the rights and freedoms of the creative quality of our lives. Fill it in. Huh? That's what I was thinking. <laughs> 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 See, yeah, <clears throat> you throw me a question and I just cuff it off, you know, how to be correct. I've written, I wrote the Constitution for the United Nations. I used the Constitution of the United States, Constitution of England, France, Fiji, Australia, uh, and Hawaii. <clears throat> Took the best of all of it, quantumized it, and the Constitution of the United, the United Nations. And I wrote a new 59-paragraph Constitution for the United Nations and was endorsed by all 200 countries. It was then customized for Ireland, which got them their new independence from England after 660 years of war with England. And it only took 72 hours for me to do that. So if you need a problem, if you've got a question, i got an answer to an impossible question. And Syntax will give you that information. The, uh, oh, yeah, 70 years. 1859, September 17th. Now, if we add a no law becomes legal for 90 days from September 17th plus 45-day trust law, you got the bombing of Fort Sumter in 1860. And the South breaks for away from the North. Oh, yeah, there's also a three-day plus a three-day rescission act. So you, got, you had to follow timelines. These timelines were set up 4700 B.C., giving a rough estimate. So it's been 6,700 6, years running. And these timelines have never changed. The uh, Civil War starts. Add 70 years, 1859, 1929, November 2nd. It was presidential election day, <clears throat> November, November 2nd. The United States of America says we are coming out of our international bankruptcy with you. It's called the year of jubilee, the forgiving of all debts. Now, England says, all right, you're going to end the bankruptcy. Five-day rule applies. We have to give a five-day notice to all banks and credit unions that we are going to close the banks and credit unions on November 2nd. That was posted on October 29th. Anybody remember that date? Stock market crash threw us into the Great Depression. The dollar went from a dollar to ten cents in value globally. Same thing happened when, when Russia came out of bankruptcy with Rothschild. It went from one dollar Russian to ten cents Russian. So they had to dig, cut down half the black forest in Russia for fuel, pull out all their gold, silver, oil, and, and timber. Had to be. It took them ten years to get everything up and running. When they turned off the money, they turned off the power, and everything ran on steam in 1989 when Russia came out of bankruptcy. And therefore, everything froze solid. It was the winter time when they came out and broke all their turbines because it was all water operated, and everything froze and broke. So their whole infrastructure was destroyed, and Russia went into <clears throat> went dark for ten years. Really had no power. Half the population on any given time was cutting trees for fuel in all the cities. And they wound up cutting down half the forests in Russia, which was a huge, huge oxygen producer here on planet Earth. And that's why our oxygen, our, our CO2 levels in 1960 stood at 998 parts per million. And at the top of the volcano at Mauna Lea, monitoring station in Hawaii six weeks ago is up there 
It stood at 4,020. It has gone up from 1960 to 2010, 50 years. uh, From 990 to 4,020. And then you wonder why I have a global warning. Okay. And so the bankruptcy was renewed on September 17th, was retroactive renewed to September 17th, 1929. Because uh, you have to add 45 day trust law to September 17th and you get November 2nd. Ever wonder why we have the first Tuesday in November, November 2nd? Because it's 45 days after the the Constitution of the United States International Bankruptcy was signed on September 17th, 1789. Add another 70 years, and you get 1999, November 2nd. Just happens to fall on that date. The president on November 2nd, 1999. Those of you that are old enough and remember, we counted ballots. As no law becomes legal for 90 days. Because there was no law... In the United States, the bankruptcy, uh, the IRS does not exist for 90 days. The United States government does not exist for 90 days. The United States military, under the Universal Postal Union, was ordered at DEFCON 2 with their finger on the nuke button. We were at one minute to midnight for the end of the world. If anybody were to, if China or Russia launched an attack against the United States when we didn't exist, they were going to go to nuclear World War III. That's how close we were to the end of the world. So for 90 days, they had everyone count ballots. Watch the left hand while the right hand took care of business. And on November 2nd, uh, February 2nd, 2000, Bush with 47% of the vote was the 45th consecutive left-handed president in the United States. No president has ever been right-handed in the United States since 1775. Left hand re- develops the right side of your brain, which is logic. The right-handed people use their left side of their brain, which is emotions. Anytime two of you were to get into an argument, no matter what you are saying to, to each other, and you are heightened emotionally, I can throw a math problem at you. Like 3 times 3 times 3 equals 27. In a time it would take you to analyze the answer of that, you would take all your energy from your left brain, transfer it to your right brain, your blood pressure would drop 60 points, your emotional would become stabilized in three seconds, and you'd be using the logic side of your brain and stop fighting. So anytime you get upset, do a math problem, completely cancel your emotional upset. How's that for a (laughs) fix it? (laughs) Didn't know that about your human brain, did you? Yes. Nineteen ninety nine, November second. President doesn't take office until the even year. They're elected on the odd year. It's twenty twelve, yes. But the president doesn't take office until twenty thirteen. No, 1999, November 2nd, was the end of the third international bankruptcy. There was no election take place that year. I mean, the election took place, but the president wasn't appointed until the 2nd of February, uh, 2nd of February 2000. And Bush was, was reinstated. Uh, rather, uh, this was uh, uh, Bill Clinton. Bill Clinton said on November 2nd he would be the last president of the United States of America. On the 2nd of February 2000, the United States of America Corporation took over. The democracy was dead. The the Constitution expired. So and that, the you're a postal employee. You carry postage stamps in your pocket. So where does the UCC UCC is copyrighted by England, has no, no effect on the United States. If you use copyrighted material from a foreign country on a foreign vessel in dry dock, you're babbling because you don't have a copyright release. Only attorneys and lawyers and judges have a copyright release from England. That's why they joined the bar. 
If you're not a bar member, you can't practice in a foreign vessel in dry dock. So how do you capture a foreign vessel in dry dock? You don't. You create a court within a court. In other words, when you file a lawsuit with a stamp on it, it's a postage vessel. The postage vessel, vessel when it, the, the sentence structure says, this is the document because it came to the dock, received the docket number, and is now a, a document. Document contract. Two or more people make contract. There is two people, your claimant and a vassalee. Document contract, postal vessel, posted stamp on a piece of paper is vessel. It's federal, so it's a federal court venue. The word jurisdiction, people, means opinion. Don't use the word jurisdiction. Why do you think you have a jury? A jury, J-U means no law, and R-Y is contract. It's a no law contract. The word judge uh, sits on a a plane different than yours. Even in tribal law, whether it be the witch doctor is the judge, the king of a, a, of a tribe anywhere on the planet, a, a president, a uh, dictator, they all stand on a plane to break the continuance of evidence as an actor on a stage, talking babble in adverb verb language. Therefore, you go into an auditorium, you see a person on a stage, they are under contract to perform. You buy a ticket, which is a contract of your opinion. Your opinion is on stages. Your stages, here's the plane of the stage, and then you have your, your seating going up. The bro the, this breaks the continuance of evidence with the stage, and you are only witnesses or opinion entities watching actors on a stage. No different in the courtroom. So the only way to engage and have your rights or whatever you're trying to do... Get engage out. means no contract, I-N-G. Okay. To gauge when you go in there. And that's a correct word. You do gauge a situation. Gauging means to analyze, to look at the knowledge of your environment. You're gauging the difference between right and wrong, good and evil... You're gauging the conduct of what the actors are, ACT, no contract people, because they write all everything in the courtroom is in, in an illusion. And I'm going to put a courtroom up here in a minute and show you the tricks and the traps that are going to happen inside that. So when I go to file a document or a doc. No, it's a document. Okay. Do I put my stamp on that document? Yes. And you sign it, making you the postmaster and, and po postmaster, banker, and judge authorized to transport the vessel from the street into the vessel and dry dock. You send your you, before you walk into the courthouse to dock your vessel. You mail it registered mail to yourself. Your vessel has now been registered with the post office, which is controlled of the port authorities, which licensed the courthouse to dock its vessel on planet Earth. In the event that you are the postmaster now signing the, the stamp to carry the document into the courthouse. You are the post, the letter carrier and postmaster authorized to transport the vessel to the clerk's office and you can't be arrested as a letter carrier delivering the mail to the courthouse, even though it's a foreign vessel in dry dock because you're already the post office which controls the port authorities, which docks the vessel. So you have a higher authority. You're like the senior judge of the courthouse. Little secrets. Did they still stamp that document? Yes, and when they stamp it, they made contract. Absolutely, you. I signed every every federal district court stamp. I sign over the top of it, capturing. Absolutely, you sign all yours and say they all have to be conformed. Give me that back. I'm going to sign my name over your stamp, and you sign your name too, clerk. And you usually have to have five copies. So do I send five? Actually, seven. They get two. You keep the rest five back. Seven copies to myself? No, 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 just the one. Just the one. Just to get the serial number. That's all you want. It's a registered serial number. Okay. Then how do I have a copy or... You keep the registered serial number. You're, you're going to mail it to yourself. You keep the envelope. Okay. Okay. Got it. Okay? If you have one copy that's sealed inside there, it's always sealed inside there. If it ever comes to a... 
Yes, yes, I'm going to go through all the procedures on it. Yes. She, she told me that she can't let me have the, the document back once she stamped it. Ah, all of them are stamped, and if you sign the others in front of her, they all have to be conformed. If her copy is not conformed, then she has an illegal copy. She doesn't have an original. If you sign across their stamp, you have the original. Nay, she has to, rep- she has to take possession of that. But she, she said, I cannot give you this document once I've stamped it. No, that's because they don't want you to be legal and become the chief judge of the courthouse in, so that you're in charge. You become the chief judge of the courthouse when you do that. So if they don't give it back, how do you respond? Well, I always get it back. I says, I'm, a, I'm the federal judge in this courthouse. I have my oath on file. You better give me that court back. This is under, under Title 15. Uh, which one is that? That's uh, Title 46, Section 9... 9 uh, I just tell him I'm a judge? 946. <laughs> well, I, I, I have a 17-year running position. Everybody knows me already. Oh, you, if you sign, uh, as she hands you back the documents, you sign all of them. And if she knows what she's doing, she'll give you back their copy so they're all conformed. Right. So because when you say to her... And she doesn't give me hers, then she is... Illegal. Illegal. Right. You're saying, you know what? I have originals here signed. I says, now how are you going to explain to your boss that you don't have a signed original copy and you only have a... Uh, half, half the, the, the position done. You didn't follow your ju- your duties. Wow. And that's what I'm wondering is the enforcement. Now, under Title 15, under Title 18, Section 641, folks, misappropriations. Title 18, 641, misappropriations. That means you took a paycheck and you didn't do your job. That's misappropriation. For not doing your job. That's a 10-year, $10,000 fine. A $9,000 fine and 12 years in prison under another, another title slide of the, of the same. It comes under uh, 9, 946 instead of 941. What was the title number? Title 18, 641 through 665 is the mis- misappropriations rules. You can pull it up on the Internet and, and, and you know, go through the whole thing. Yes? So does that mean? Correct. And then we took ours back, and they, they kept theirs. Correct. So was that correct? Or was, no, no, they have their two copies. You have your five. But in front of them, you sign or autograph. You autograph your name across their stamp. And when you autograph your name across their stamp, they have to give you back those two to autograph also. Otherwise, they're not in conformity. And that makes you in contract with that building, with, their, with that vessel being docked. And when she gives you a receipt for your money filing, you also sign that receipt. You sign your name across the registered mail sticker. You sign your name across the money sticker that's put on your registered mail. You sign your name across the stamp. Anything the post office gives you, you sign your name, across, autograph your name across it. Not sign, but autograph across that stamp. If it ever comes to push and shove where you got to walk into court going, I'm a federal judge, I'm a federal postmaster, I've signed my documents. I have the physical evidence in my possession that goes with this. This was docked at the post office before it was ported with the port authorities. The, the post office has jurisdiction over the port authorities. And so, therefore, you haven't filed protocols. In my lawsuits that I file with you as your mortgages, identify the clerk of the court on the 48th day as the federal judge of that lawsuit because she's required or he's required, the clerk of the court is required to autograph her name or his name on that stamp as the postmaster receiving a vessel in dry dock. That's protocol. If they skip over that procedure, they're guilty of misappropriations. They can go to jail for 12 years. And you can have the, when you download the laws on this, you take it in with them under misappropriations, 
and you present that to them saying, here, read this. See what this says? Now do exactly as I tell you. If you've got a problem, you get your supervisor. You've got a problem with that, you get the chief judge. You've got a problem with that, call John Roberts at the United States Supreme Court. You've got a federal judge here, chief federal judge, can call the United States Supreme Court John Roberts. You can call Hillary Clinton, Secretary of State. Now he's Bill's counsel. So I'm killing flies in windows, glass windows with 20-pound sledgehammers, and I'm not breaking the glass. And so they, get, they come to me and they're going like, we're not going to obey this. We're not going to do this. I'm going like, you want to go to jail for 12 years? Feel lucky today? <laughs> and he says, I'm the last man you want to go ahead and play games with. Why? If you follow the procedures, you can do it too. It's all about conviction. It's all about being cool and collective. Of course, I've had an advantage of you guys because I don't have adrenal glands, so I don't have the jack high, jack low. <laughs> Me, hey, I'm just, I'm just data. I'm, 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 I'm a Spock. <laughs> Since Star Trek came out, everyone's called me Data and Spock. Yes. On your autograph, is it printed or is it can cursive be? No, no, no. I'll always print it. Print it. Print it. Okay. Yes. And when I did that in school, they cracked my knuckles and said, "You will not write that way. We we're going to force you to be in fiction." Uh, cursive writing in school. Say again. They're taking it out because of this program. Yes, I've been suing, and the teachers are going, this is correct, we're wrong. And they're, 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 they're changing, this po program is changing all languages on the planet. You can't move forward. You see, on January 6, 2012, there was a little glitch that took place. The Hummel's telescope took a picture and the picture showed three more of these spacecrafts in Greenland headed this way, which will be here on 12-21-2012. For those of you that watch TV, there's a new TV show with no electricity. You know why? Because when you put up four, when you put up, here's Earth, and you put a quadrahedron with Earth in the middle, you've got line of sight. Four spacecrafts the size of Lake Michigan, they have put a dampening field over the planet and shut down electricity. What do you think is going to happen in a world that runs on computers and electricity without electricity? They go back to 1880 overnight. How do you get the food to the populated areas? You don't. Huh? How do you farm your, 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 your farmlands without tractors? How do you harvest your crops? How do you run your canning facilities? How does eight billion people get food when there's no way to get it, move it from point A to point B outside of whatever you're capable of growing in your own garden or being able to can because you have a stove, a wood fire, a wood burning stove that you can uh, can with because you know you know the principles of canning. I do. I know the survival issues. I know how to make water out of thin air with nothing but a sheet of plastic. They go hole in the ground, put a sheet of plastic, pour dirt around it, and overnight it'll make a gallon of first fresh dew water, which comes out of the ground 24 hours a day, seven days a week, indefinitely. And you fill it, just run a little hose out, and you can pump it out of there all day long, fresh water, and have all the fresh water you need. It's pure as pure can get, evaporating out of the earth from underwater, from the cysteine. How to make fresh water, how to do food, how to do canning, how to live without electricity. I've been there. I know how to do it. I always tell people, if there's, if there's ever any kind of an emergency, the place you want to be is in my back door because I know how to stay alive. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's nice as I got Lake Michigan only walking distance from my house and I can, that's a big lake, lots of, I got, I got my own boat, had my own boat building business for eight years to live the little oil embargo took place in 73. <laughs> Put all of 80% of all boat building companies out of business. Everybody copy that already? So what's going to happen uh, December 23rd? Uh, it'll be the first day of winter. <laughs> <laughs> and remember, if the world doesn't end on December 21st, make sure your 401k is paid up on December 22nd. 
Okay, we're going to go next is the courtroom. I said, if you don't have, if the world doesn't end on December 21st, 2012, make sure your 401k is paid up on December 22nd. All the calendars written in the history of mankind going all the way back to the beginning of writing all in on 12-21-2012. That's the, that's the end of the fake world of verb. That's what it means. And the day the world kicks, kicks in the gear and goes to quantum. With 5 billion people studying out of 8 billion, that's all the computers on the planet. Uh, Obama wants to push this through. The Chinese are pushing it with 150 trade partners. I believe that there's going to be a, some kind of an announcement maybe on that day that's on, that you're going to turn on the TV, get on the Internet, and there's only going to be one thing you're going to see. My program, study, you've got so many days before we're going to switch gears and the world's going to change in the quantum. Simple as that. So that's just my opinion. What's that? Oh, by the way, that the, if they put the dampening field up, batteries don't work, electricity doesn't work, solar doesn't work, wind doesn't work. The electron does not move. Where's, where's the dampening field? Dampening field is an EM field. Just like an EM pulse will take out electri elect electrical circuitry, closed circuit information. Okay. This, uh, the program on what a dampening field does, it stops electricity for electrons from moving. Uh, what would that? Who would be executed at the four, the, the four UFO spaceships in a quatrahedron, which is a four-sided triangle with what Earth in the middle of it, line of sight. Well, they were here 50,000 years ago, so they created the last ice age. Now, the people that leave that, that spacecraft... Like, if you go from Greenland, Washington Monument, Yucatan Peninsula, and Easter Island, it's a straight line. They're on a straight lines of nature. If you go from uh, the Lexer Pyramid through Memphis, Tennessee Pyramid, it intersects as a straight line with the Lexer Hotel in Las Vegas, Nevada. A sphinx, a pyramid, an obelisk. A sphinx, a pyramid, an obelisk. A sphinx, a pyramid, an obelisk. If you have time, you got the Vatican. Uh, no. You got Egypt, the uh, pyramids. This is the North Pole, by the way. You've got. Uh, the Vatican, uh, Greece, at the uh, uh, Acropolis, Acropolis, where there's a uh, obelisk, obelisk at the uh, Acropolis, Vatican Square, uh, Vatican uh, is a clock, a seasonal clock with a obelisk in the middle of it at St. Peter's. You go to Paris, which is the church built in 300 A.D. Paris was the center of the church, Catholic Church, in 300 A.D. From there, you go to the Vatican, I mean to uh, London at the Masonic Temple, uh, where they have the rose line of, and the obelisk and the glass pyramid. You go from there to uh, uh, Washington, D.C., where you have an obelisk and you end up in uh, Las Vegas, Nevada. Straight line, looking down from the North Pole. Then if you take planet Earth, and uh, here's our natural Earth axis. Here's the spacecraft in Greenland, 1221-2012, direct aligned with the North Star. What are the odds of that happening on 12-21-2012? Mm. 
What's their purpose for doing that on December 21st? Well, this is a 50,000-year-old clock, and it goes off on 1221. You put three more objects here, and you got line of sight, dampening field. There are no straight lines in nature. It's the, this is the timeline of Earth from the 4700 B.C. to Las Vegas, Nevada, and the, uh, the building of the Lexer Hotel with a two million candle light, a two million candle power. The Lexer Hotel is a radio transmitter. It's especially designed and it went off with all the pyramids on planet Earth simultaneously. When they turned it on, they all set up a harmonic resonance that sent a radio signal out into space a thousand times more powerful than they, they thought would happen when they turned the one on. It activated all the pyramids that were built to resonate a frequency within the triangle of what it is. The pyramid in Giza is built like this, which is a diamond. The pyramid on the Yucatan Peninsula is built. This line and this line are identical to the square inch. They're 1,200, or they're, uh, well, from the Yucatan to Giza, I think that's about like 12,000 miles away. They're both identical. Architecturally designed the same. Math, you know, liar's figure, but math doesn't lie. Math doesn't lie. Let me tell you a few other little nasty little things that are happening. Uh, here's planet Earth. Here's North Korea. Two years ago, they detonated two, hydro, two atomic bombs, right? Mm -hmm. Those that did their homework. Okay, these things went off. Uh, it was five days apart. 180, 140 miles off of Chile, they had a 9.5, biggest earthquake recorded in the history of keeping earthquakes. What they did is they set up a shock wave with the first one, which traveled through the earth, hit this line here, and then went like this, and through the magma created a 9.5 in Chile. That, that was a bump. The second one popped it. Okay, when it popped the Chile one, that was on the Ring of Fire for the Pacific Ocean. The shock wave then comes back off of this thing as it's ricocheting back over, takes out Christ Church, South, South Island of uh, New Zealand, then causes a, a volcano 18,000 feet under the water, bigger than Krakatau, to explode creating a six-foot tsunami. That was all. Nobody died in that because it was three miles underwater. This is on the Ring of Fire. And then when the shock wave comes all the way back up and focuses, it hits the trench outside of Japan, creating a nine on the Richter scale, creating a tsunami, which then took out three nukes on the coast, which are dumping 11,000 tons of plutonium radioactive water, two million times more potent than it takes to kill a person, into the Pacific Ocean now since the tsunami took place to keep the cores from going China Syndrome. They still haven't got that thing under control. It's still burning out of control. And they pump 11,000 tons of radioactive plutonium water on this thing every day. This isn't made public to the public. There's very little of this is public. Uh, satellite photos in, I think it was April, showed that they're drilling a hole 27,000 feet deep. The first nuke put a crack in the earth. The second nuke was they, they were able to use the second atomic bomb to identify magma, shockwave through magma. They can target through a shape charge any country on the planet with a shape charge through magma. There's a no-fly zone over North Korea, so their air force is useless. But the magma? They can go anywhere on the planet through magma. This was an experiment in a country, the Chile, which is totally... Okay, when Chile got hit, Chile was raised 15 feet as the Pacific plate slid underneath Chile. 
When the magma came back, it raised the Asian plate 15 feet, including the island of Japan was raised 15 feet as the Pacific plate flattened out and moved underneath. And Hawaii, which is dead center in the middle, dropped one foot. Hawaii has a 40,000 cubic mile magma pool underneath it, which created a, and Volcano National Park cracked the hole one mile across and created a thousand foot wide pool of lava that rose up 8,600 feet from the base through the mountain. It then blew out a vent 60 feet in diameter at eight miles per hour, moving magma into the south end of the island, pouring it out into the ocean, creating what's called VOG, V-O-G, volcanic fog, which is silicosis, fibers into the air. It's really, really, really agitating to your lungs when you inhale this stuff. I was there two weeks ago, and I got a lung full of it. I was sick for three days. I was only 20 minutes in the fog. I was driving along, and I, I got some in my lungs and made me sick. Anyways, the, the island dropped one whole foot. And, and this is all recorded on oscilloscopes that measure magma shockwaves. Huh? All the Hawaiian islands dropped? Yeah, the entire mi middle of the plate dropped, but it, it cracked open the volcano. And the bog got really bad after that. Okay, they're drilling the second hole now, and they've got a hydrogen bomb going into it. This is 100 times bigger than the atomic bombs. They found that as a result, they found a, a fissure in the, mag, in, the, in the crust of the earth in North Korea. And they're drilling a hole down in this fissure. They detonate a hydrogen bomb, and we, now we have a new math problem that shows up. Here's the 43rd parallel, North Korea. 43rd parallel, San Francisco. 43rd parallel, London. If they do a shape charge, and then from, this, from, the, from the top, it looks like this. Here's the North Pole. Here's San Francisco, and here's London. And... and uh, L and London, and here's North Korea with a K. 120 degree angles. <clears throat> Liars figure, but figures don't lie. And on the 43rd, as a shape charge, they can bounce the magma at 120 degree angles and hit the San Andreas. Guess what happens when you hit the San Andreas Fault? You got Mount Rainier, which is 40 years past due from its standard 40-year or 38-year eruption. You got Hood, York, and Shasta, all in a straight line, right on the, on the Pacific. You can take Seattle and, and, and Portland and write them off. No place to go. The, 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 the cloud from the four volcanoes would be devastating. San Francisco, that would be, you could write that one off. A tsunami would take out Hawaii from San Francisco in a 9-5 or bigger. It would take out Honolulu, which is at sea level, like one foot above sea level. And the shape charge going through the magma would hit, hit the, the, the gates in London and flood London, taking out the subway systems. And then that would create a tsunami which would hit New York City, which is four feet above sea level, and take out New York City, Manhattan Island. And if they miss and they hit... Yellowstone, then you got a super volcano 40 miles by 60 miles going off, taking out two thirds of the United States. All one big dust cloud. So I did this presentation for two three star generals and one two star general for the Russian military, I mean for the Chinese military, six weeks ago. The one general got sick. They had to take him to the hospital as soon as I got done with this. Somebody knew something. Now there's a side effect, and that's the secondary shock wave. Secondary shock wave takes out Hong Kong with 100 million people. Huh? Start of Vegas. Yeah. It's also contract. What's the mindset? What's the mindset? Well, I'm a guy that does a lot of big thinking. I deal in math, as you know. And when I start doing math, and I start drawing pictures, and I start tracking all the history of mankind, the whole thing turns out to be a big math problem. 
of straight lines all over the planet, planet called ley lines. Turns out that ET going back 100,000 years and all these ley lines where cities are built on this planet, uh, the 8,500 years of masonry, the book that I own, and all the secrets and 8,500 years of masonry that are written down, now syntax, and all the mathematical procedures are brought out through that syntax. All the truths that are hidden inside that book. And I, would, in knowing how to cipher all this stuff and bring out all the timelines and the facts, and the, the facts that I say are coming in the future versus the facts that are even certified through the book in the last 8,500 years, if it's been true for 8,500 years, then why wouldn't it be true for the next six weeks? And <clears throat> a lot of this stuff came to me on emails in just glitches, like somebody working at the NASA Center that runs the Hummel Telescope sends me a, a picture of three spacecrafts coming this way, and then it's deleted a few seconds later. And then I do the, run the math problems on it and all the rest of the information. You know, when Obama, what was, anybody remember when Obama took the, the podium the first day he went to the Joint Chiefs of Staff? He walked up and says, I didn't make this mess. There's only one president at a time, and I'm not it yet. And walked away. And that was it. Everybody's expecting some great speech. Fact is, he got a bloody nose. He got told about all kinds of things that are, that don't, are not included in the presidential election. <laughs> what, they, what they say and what's going to happen behind closed doors about what's happening with this math interface and how it's affecting the planet, what ET is doing and how it's affecting the planet, all the different terrorist threats and how it's affecting the planet all the UFO sightings, as well as the timeline, time travelers keeping order, why we're still all here, why this is allowed to move forward with no interference on a global basis. And when I'm talking a global basis, I mean 150 language translations from my website to be as big as it is, uncontrolled, and with the order that is being conducted from it has been very architecturally designed so it doesn't scare people. And those that need to know, need to know. Those who don't know, have no power to make an influence on it. It's only the world leaders that are in a position of needing to know things that are going to be told what is correct. The people, as long as you've got your six-pack of beer, your 600-channel TV, and your Ruffles <laughs> potato chips, you don't care where the tank parks as long as it doesn't bump the satellite dish. And that's mankind's reality. Question back there. Nah, that's, that's somebody's tale that doesn't exist. What's your... So why did you take the time to share the information with us? Got to start someplace. No matter where you go, there you are. And wherever you are, that's where you're supposed to be. Make no mistake about it. Everyone is exactly where you're supposed to be. There are things that are said here, things you hear here. You're all good people. Why shouldn't you be know what's going on? You're not going to see it on CNN. You're not going to see it on the news. Liars figure, but geometry doesn't lie. And using magma, the Earth's liquid, internally as a target, as a weapon. Okay, let's say they don't do anything. But they make a phone call to the premier of China and make a premier to the London and to Rothschild North Korea is a very poor country, 85% unemployment. And he says, we've got a atomic bomb here that we're going to detonate and take out Mount Rainier or the, or the uh, Shasta York Rainier uh, super volcano called Yellowstone if we're not given a certain amount of money to support our country, if we're not given open trade and use it as a blackmail weapon. Now, they can't stop it. It's in place. It's 25 miles. It's, it's, it's five miles underground. And all you got to do is push a button. And what happens to, if you take out the, you know, if, if, let's say the super volcano goes out and two-thirds of the United States are under a cloud for four years. you got a black winter, no food, population after the end of four years is a few hundred thousand people. 
Northern Hemisphere is completely devastated just because somebody pushed the button. Or the people from the future know who the button is going to be pushed, and those people are removed. There's always a point of control. There is a future. What kind of future is going to be is going to determine. It's relevant that mathematics become relevant because of ET, as well as Earth's own ability to communicate peacefully. So I go around and I teach seminars every few weeks, but these are recorded. Once this goes up on YouTube, there isn't going to be 40 people here watching. There's going to be 40 million people, 400 million people watching the same presentation on YouTube in a couple of weeks. And there's nothing like a math problem which can't be disputed because if there's one thing everyone in this room does agree on is a math problem. And liars may figure, but figures don't lie. And there's no such thing as a straight line in nature. So therefore, somebody has engineered something that it's not supposed to be. And if you engineer something, then you better be pretty responsible for, if you screwed it up when you engineered it, you're going to be pointed fingered at. If you engineer it and you do it correct, you're going to be honored for it. You see? So yeah, I'm being responsible. And yes, this will go up on YouTube, and it will be it will be viewed. And how long did it take for Michael Jackson to know, uh, for the world, for every single person who owns a computer on planet Earth to know that Michael Jackson died? Fifteen minutes. Fifteen minutes. Every single person on the planet that owned a TV, radio, newspaper, uh, magazine, iPod, handheld cell phone was called and said, the king of pop died. So don't think things can't happen in a moment, that the world can't wake up in a moment, that on, on November 5th, 2012, I'm in front of the U.S. Court of Federal Claims in Washington, D.C., about 12 hours before election time. And there's going to be newspapers as quantum grammar was put on trial in a Kansas case. And Monty Miller and, and Russell Gould and myself are all going to be there as three federal judges holding the United States Court of Federal Claims responsible for false and misleading information, failure to have an oath of office, and are going to hold the United States government accountable for the election the next day under false and misleading statements. Huh? What did that mean? November 5th. In five weeks. So the world watching this on CNN on, on, Tuesday, on Monday night could very easily walk into the polls Tuesday and write director, David, director party, David Wynn Miller, that they want correct grammar. I don't care what they say and what they think's going on. It ain't going on because it's in fiction. And the world's going to change from fiction to fact overnight. And by December 21st, the world of fiction will be made announcement on, on the world in all languages that this stops today, that we're going to fix it. No more wars. You can't bring an argument to another human being if you're going to talk in verb. Get your contracts right or go home. What's that? What are they doing with the HARP program? Up in High amplification array radiation pulse. HARP is a alpha beta transmitter. There are 12 units around the planet. They can reach down as far as the equator. They are used to control the frequency of your brain through radio wave influence. It's used to take you from an alpha, which is aggressive, to a beta wave, which is docile. It gets 98 degrees Fahrenheit in a populated city like, San, like Los Angeles. And people tend to get crazy at 98 degrees. So they change your, you change your mind to a beta wave and make you all nice and comfortable at 98 degrees, not irritated. Mob control, that's all it is. Now, if you want to talk about angels don't play this harp, of the satellite 38,000 miles out over the Pacific Ocean, which can't be seen by any earthbound station that controls a microwave, 
to increase the temperature of the surface a half a degree and create weather patterns 3,800 miles across to move El Ninos and weather patterns. That was started in 1988. It ran until 1997 when I had it shut off. But they fooled around with it long enough to almost cause a 9.9 .9 earthquake on the San Estrellas when they heated up the North American plate, 22 degrees, and the Pacific plate, 25 degrees. I did a seminar in Sacramento and told them, you will turn the temperature down of the United States from 80, 85 in Milwaukee to 25 below zero, and from 85 in Houston, Texas to below freezing. You will hold it there for 22 days. You would take the air, which is blowing from the west to the east over the Yucatan Peninsula, and move it at 50 miles an hour for 22 days from the east to the west and push El Nino offshore. 24 hours later, the wind blew at 50 miles an hour from the east to the west, and the entire United States of America was put into a deep freeze. And it lasted for exactly 22 days where it was below freezing, bringing the North American plate down enough that it pulled the pressure off of the San Estrellas. We didn't have an earthquake, and El Nino was pushed offshore. Remember when all the seals and the marine life were dying because the water was up in the high 70s? went back down to 55 degrees where it's supposed to be. Because when you move hot water this way, cold water replaces it from the bottom, three miles down. Sometimes i got to interfere with the world to save the world, <laughs> even though I'm not supposed to. Okay. Courtroom. Courtroom's divided into planes. P-L-A-N-S. E-S. <laughs> Sometimes I get ahead of myself. All right. Plane number one is the, is, the, is the level playing field, such as this room. Plane number two is where the clerk of the court sits on a four-inch high podium above your plane. Plane number three is the witness box, or the, the I mean the jury box. Anything in a box is an enclosed area and cannot be considered. As you well know, since the Constitution of the United States was created, you must have a 12-man jury. What you don't know is that the jury box is built like this with chairs on the X's. So what do you have looking from the top? You have two petite juries of six people each, which is illegal. The continuance of evidence of the peanut gallery are divided. <laughs> so the jury is in a box, and JU means no law, and RY is contract. They are a no law contract of an illusion. Henceforth, they have no value whatsoever. Never ask for a jury trial because a jury doesn't have a clue how to read and write above a second grade reading level. That's why it's a no-law contract. Then the witness gets put into a witness box, which is an enclosed area, cannot see evidence or give testimony, to a jury box, which cannot see evidence or see testimony, to a judge that's on a plane, not even in the courtroom, as an actor in black robes, mourning justice. And justice, J-U, equals no law. S equals speak. T-I equals title. And C-E equals judge. This is Latin. Judge title speaks no law. And what's the first word you guys do in your anger? There is a location. That's a positive word. Is is a positive word. No is a negative word. Law is a dangling participle verb. So what happens? There is is plus and plus now pointing towards no to be positive, making law a negative because no is still a negative so therefore, the word no law or fact shall be tried in court. By your own confessions, people, you go, there is no. There's no such thing as a no. 
because you can't perform a negative condition of performance. But if you say there is no, what do I have in my hand? Nothing. You just made nothing a fact. Now I can prosecute you with nothing. Well, you just walked right into that trap. (laughs) Don't feel bad. No one's ever gotten past it. Everyone steps in the trap. Let's see how close of tension you are. What is your name? No. I'm a judge. I said, what is your name? I just called you a what? Would it be easier? Would it be easier if I did this? Uh, would it be easier if I did that? Now does that make sense? You see, this here is a period, folks. This isn't a question mark. That means what is your name? Do you see a question mark hanging above me? Yeah. So the no, the answer to the question is. This is a pronoun, this is an adverb, this is an adverb, this is a verb. Even if you were to identify the word what to be your name, why am I calling you a verb? You don't exist as a dangling participle verb. The answer is, this is the, the answer to the question, what is your name, you identify syntax. You say, well, what is an ad, a pronoun? This is an adverb, yours is an adverb, and, na- and name is a verb. Can I see the correct sentence structure, communication, parse, syntax, grammar for the avoidance of the perjury? The judge is going to go, okay, case dismissed. Please leave the courtroom. <laughs> <laughs> Bang, just like that. Don't care what you're there for. Because the traffic citation, anything he's got to say to you is a lie. You can always tell I'm lying to you. My lips are moving. <laughs> <laughs> hey, it's a fact, folks. So anytime you go to a stop sign and you get a ticket, you could use that argument in court. Well, actually, I won a case. I said, Mr. Police Officer, would you please come up? He goes, yes. He says, you testified that I went through... The stop sign. <clears throat> I, I, I said, you just, you just said I went through the stop sign. Uh, I says, what does the stop sign look like? So eight sides, painted red and white, made of metal. How do I occupy the same space as a stop sign? How can I go through it? His two objects can't occupy the same space at the same time. This is a fraudulent statement. And if this is a, a pronoun, adverb, verb, adverb, adjective, pronoun. Can I see the correct sentence structure, communication, parse, syntax, grammar for the avoidance of the perjury? Judge goes, you know, you can't go through a stop sign. <laughs> And yes, that is a correct statement. And yes, this is a fraudulent statement. And you committed fraud under Title 15, Section 1692E and Title 18, 1001. Fictitious conveyance of grammar and false and misleading statements. Case dismissed. Mr. Mr. Police Officer, you're going to be reprimanded. I want your supervisor in here as you're going to have to learn how to use correct grammar. You see, these are all tricks and traps, little things that are hidden in plain view right in front of you. And, and all the little, little things that go on uh, right in front of you that, that you don't even understand. Now, I'll show you another little trick that the United States, uh, not the United States, Universal Postal Union burned Switzerland. Do you know that all wars on planet Earth are orchestrated by the post office. Post office controls all money in all 250 countries. World War II was not a, an exercise in a world war 
as per se, it was an exercise in population reduction of 200 million people. And that's all it was. The planet was not ready to support 8 billion people in 2012. If World War II didn't take place, we would have hit 8 billion people in probably 1970, where there wasn't technology uh, or production capabilities of feeding. So people would have been dying globally in mass units. Millions of people would have been dying at a time from starvation rather than having a controlled issue. If the plague of 15, 12, 15 I think it was 1525 or 1535, something like that, which wiped out half the population of the planet didn't take place, we would have hit saturation way back in 1800. And then there would have been a mass, mass destruction. When I was in, oh, let's see, I was in high school. I think it was 11th grade. It's about 17 years old. We did an experiment, took a four ounce potato, put it in a fruit, two, pound, uh, two gallon fruit jar with two fruit flies. In 30 days, we had 50,000 fruit flies and no potato. On the 31st day, we had no fruit flies and no potato. The point is, you can expand out of existence all at the same time. You can go out and go fishing. Which, you know, if anybody's ever done this, and you put like 30 bluegills in a five-gallon pail. In a one minute, all 30 bluegills die of suffocation. At the same time, they're all gone. When the oxygen runs out, they all go perish. The well, same thing is true with the things that are happening on this planet about what orchestrates. So we're going to take you back into history, in, to Hawaii, which is a cause and effect. 1848, King Kamehameha... makes a proclamation that if Hawaiians are dead or off the land for 20 years, the land is free for settlement. And being Hawaii is the center of the, of the Pacific, it's very important. In 1800, <clears throat> the population of Hawaii was 2 million Hawaiians. In 1829, there was 34,000 34, Hawaiians left alive. In 34 years, they all died from whooping cough, tuberculosis, typhoid, smallpox, measles, mumps, chickenpox, all of our childhood diseases. As the Hawaiian Islands were isolated, Cook shows up in, in 1789, comes back in 1800 with Bishop. And in, because the world knows that Hawaii exists and they start sailing there, they bring all the diseases of Europe and the United States. And in 34 years, 99% of all Hawaiians are dead from genocide by germ warfare. And so the Hawaiian population is so small based on its size that there's King Kamehameha in 1848 nationalizes the entire island under the bishop's trust, putting all the remaining choice lands into the Hawaiian kingdom. Now, one-third of the Hawaiian islands was given to the Philippines, one-third to China, one-third to Japan because they were the dominant population at the time in the Hawaiian Islands. And in the Hawaiian Islands themselves, the Hawaiians kept all the choice farmlands. With that said, China declares Hawaii to be part of their country. Japan declares Hawaii to be part of theirs, and so do the Philippines. The United States took over in 18... Uh, well, I'll get to that in a few minutes. The United States Postal Service shows a, a, the Universal Postal Union, better known as the UPU. If you want to go and study this, upu.com is what you type in your computer, Universal Postal Union, and you can get a history lesson off of Wikipedia, which will show you what's going on. Some of this stuff was never made public. I uncovered it and uh, by, quite by accident on the 6th of January and was able to certify how World War II was conducted. In uh, 22nd of October, 1871, the uh, Hawaii files bankruptcy. Now, under the words of damage, no damage becomes legal, and under maritime law of commerce, which falls into the 
uh, maritime salvage claim, Title 46. Chapter 16, Section 781, that's your salvage. That's maritime salvage. All right, the Bern, Switzerland shows up in Hawaii on this date and gets Hawaii, King Kamehameha V, to file bankruptcy. Under damages, no damages complained. So this is the 22nd of October, 1872, plus 45-day trust law and three-day grace period is the 6th of December, 1872. Guess what happens on that date? King Kamehameha V, the last reigning monarch of the Hawaiian Islands, is assassinated by poison and dies. The Hawaiian... Masons, because he is a 34-degree Mason, being that he is the reigning king and monarch, puts activates the 20-year moratorium that if you are dead or off the land, because he's responsible for all the land in Hawaii. Add 45 days to December 6, and you get plus the three-day rescissions act, and you get the 17th of January. 1873 plus 20 years is 1893. January 17th, 1893, the United States military shows up. The commander of the warship is a postmaster, ordering the postmaster of Hawaiian Islands to take over the Iolani Palace and capture the Hawaiian Islands, putting the Hawaiian Islands into United States territory. Queen Iolani then writes a cursive letter, an adverb, verb, to complain. But as the Queen of Hawaii in 1893, she's also a 34-degree uh, Eastern Star. And when you join the Masons or Eastern Star, you surrender your king, queen, presidential, or director's position and are now work for the Masons as a postmaster. And guess what's right across the street from the Iolani Palace? Postmaster, lodge number one for the Masons, the Post Office of Hawaiian Islands, Immigrations, Customs, and the Supreme Court of Hawaii, all in the same room. All the heads of government. <laughs> so, I looked at this and I'm going like, <clears throat> all right. Here we have 45-day trust law. One year damages was vacated. 45 trust law and three-day grace period allows them to assassinate him. Plus 45 days and three-day grace period allows them to take over plus the 20-year moratorium, captured Hawaiian Islands. All done by timetables. Now let's work backwards from this. As we know that bankruptcy is a 70-year international condition plus a 45-day trust law. If you add 45 years and three-day lemon law, you get 7 December 1941, bombing of Pearl Harbor. The Japanese post office declared war on the, on the United States Postal Service in Honolulu, Hawaii. It was a postmaster to postmaster war. Only post office vessels, which are all military planes and military ships, carried the mail between the United States and the Hawaiian Islands. The Hawaiian Islands was under military control from 1893 under the United States Postal Service, folks, not the United States government. The government is the post office. The president of the United States, pre-simulation denture, appoints a postmaster general who controls all branches of government, CIA, FBI, police, fire, every branch of government, Homeland Security, Department of Interior, Department of uh, Forestry, Everything on planet in the United States is controlled by the post office. The post office in all other countries is also controlled by, uh, controls all branches of governments. The directors, the presidents, the kings, the queens are no more than puppets working for the postmaster because the postmaster controls the treasury, who prints the money, controls the military, and that's how the world runs. You want a new world order? It was established 
on the 22nd of October, uh, on, uh, on the 22nd of October, 1871, was a New World Order. It was set in motion by the post office. New World Order has been here for 140 years. So everyone talking about the New World Order to take over, it's been in place for 140 years until I showed up and there's a new sheriff on this planet and he's taking care of it with syntax. And that's how it works. And the whole world has to change. Now, what is my position? My position is a teacher as a plenipotentiary, which means I'm an ambassador judge working for the United Nations to teach planet Earth how to be correct mathematically. Who's in charge of the planet? Well, I'm in charge of grammar. I'm not here to arrest the politicians, the criminals, the bankers, the judges. I'm here to make sure that the infrastructure of this planet is mathematically certified to be correct. We have machines in place. We have buildings in place. We have computers in place. But the people who operate the machine, the people who think about the machine and how it is run is corrupt in their thinking. So we're going to fix the contracts, and then with the new thinking in a correct mathematical procedure, people will not go to war. And if you want to go to war, you have to create a math problem and an argument, a contract is mathematically certified to give you justification to do this. Otherwise, you're just babbling about your opinions, about what angers you, and it doesn't have your opinion, has no foundation in law or in the law, or in the control of people. So the people that created the nightmare know where the bodies are buried. Let's educate them. Let's get them up to speed, declare amnesty, fix the wrongs, and get the world functioning on a correct format. And that's what it's all about. I'm not here to hurt anybody, just to educate everyone so we're on the same page of music. So when you look at a politician who stands up and he talks to you in quantum grammar, you understand what he's saying. He's not lying to you. And you can actually write a, write a treaty, write a trust, write a contract, write a constitution so that you absolutely know what, what it means, that, that 3 plus 3 equals 6. Not that we're going to play games that 2 plus 2 equals 4 with 100 different definitions. And it's only up to the subjective interpretation of an individual's ability to hoodwink you or trick you or make you think one thing and do something else to you. Okay. Yeah. So you had a question. Well, I was just going to say, uh, to finish the, the bomb, the atomic bomb on uh, World War II. Oh. The, the world, the United States, was allowing Nazism to take place and would not get into World War III, uh, World War II. So the post office allowed the president of the United States, Roosevelt, knew this timetable. He knew that the Japanese were going to bomb Pearl Harbor on December 7th, one minute after the international treaty, which was signed, but he was 90 minutes early. The people, the Japanese pilots, who were in the planes because the rising sun is their symbol, thought it would be poetic justice to hit on the rising sun but they couldn't bomb until 8 o'clock and the sun came up at 6.30. So their, their enthusiasm got the better of them and they forgot about the timetables. And they were supposed to wait until 8 o'clock to do this. But because of time zone changes, somebody screwed up by 90 minutes and they bombed the Hawaiian post office 90 minutes before the bankruptcy expired and they bombed a country under bankruptcy, throwing the United States into a rage and allowing World War II to start. Of course, the United States population rose up, was very angry, and everybody ran in and joined the military, and the war became what it became. So there was uh, sometimes things get screwed up because there's other things on the table that are affected years later. Population control. Now, how about uh, World Trade Center? Everybody watched this on TV a hundred times. Heard all the stories and all the rumors, but you never know what really happened. Because I'm a 
having nuclear physicist background along with a heat treat specialist, coefficient of expansions and red allergy, we have a building that's 1,300 feet tall. Now let's throw an anvil that weighs 500 pounds off the top of the building. How long do you think it's going to take to hit the ground, hit the sidewalk? 12.8 seconds. 12.8 seconds. How long did it take for the World Trade Center to fall down? Anybody know that? 4.8 seconds. And that's compressing all that concrete and steel. What does that say? That says somebody changed gravity, didn't they? Even if the thing was burning out of control, floor by floor by floor, it would probably take two weeks to melt down to the, to, the, to the basement. But to accelerate gravity at three times its normal speed? Now, I put this presentation on, on national television in 11 states for an hour with the blessings from physics professors and demolition experts from mining all over the United States, when they saw the presentation privately, they then said, put this on national television because this is the rest of the story that people don't know about. Now, when you coordinate the World Trade Center with C4, now in 1988, I told you I wrote the mathematical procedures to prove that all steel is plastic. Okay, there's a little thing called an iron molecule. And being that I'm a metallurgist, here is a cube. In the center of a cube, below 1,650 degrees, you have one nuclei. It's called an iron molecule. When you heat that above 1,650 degrees, it becomes what's known as a face center cube molecule, and now you have six nuclei. Iron is the only substance in nature that can change its identity. Once it becomes a six-face-centered cube, cube, nuclei, this is now plastic, red steel, cherry red steel, just like plastic. Tie it in knots, beat it with a hammer, make swords out of it, anything you want. Heat glass at 2,200 degrees and it's liquid. Pour it in anything you want, cool it off, you got glass. Take plastic at room temperature, Tie it in knots, you got your plastic bottles, nice and flexible, doesn't break, cool. Concrete, pour that concrete block, it's liquid with lime, heated to 1,780 degrees. As it cures, 22 minutes later, it turns into plastic. And the chemical reaction becomes epoxy resin. And then in a little less than probably 20 minutes, it turns from epoxy into concrete and it goes into a center cube, making hard brick. So concrete, steel, and glass are all plastic. They all have a coefficient of expansion of 6.3. Anybody want to guess what the coefficient of your plastic soda water bottle is there? 6.3. That means that anything that's plastic will be affected by C4, plastic explosives. So you core detonate the building with C4 plastic, or thermite, which is a 6.3 also. When it detonates, it creates a bubble 1,300 feet in diameter. When C4 detonates, it creates a a shock wave of 85,000, roughly 85,000 pounds per square inch pressure. All of you that watched the video, this is a 400 foot wide building. The debris field is 850 feet wide above the building when it's still in a static position. Watch the video. The building is standing there and you've got a debris field 550 feet beyond the 400 foot center line. So it's 850 feet and a half second. That's 1,600 feet per second. That's a good acceleration equal to a bullet or equivalent to a C4 detonation. Every building Within a half a mile, the World Trade Center had its windows exploded out at that exact second. And what's the one thing you saw in the air? Instantly, at the, when the building was still, when this was going on, what was completely surrounding the building? Paper. Paper, paper was airborne all over the, instantly all over the building. How did all that paper get 
a thousand feet away from the building in one second. Where did it come from? Well, at the exact second of the core detonation of the World Trade Center, what you were looking at was not a concrete, steel, and glass building. What you were looking at was smoke. Not atoms, I mean, not molecules of concrete, steel, and glass, but atoms of concrete, steel, and glass. Paper is not affected by a 6.3 detonation. Only concrete, steel, and glass turn into smoke. And so you've got a static pile here of smoke. Now, has anyone ever seen the, the hydrogen bomb explosion on, on uh, Discovery or National Geographic's pictures? And you see little balls. Those balls are called plasma. Plasma is the same thing that causes sunspots on, on the sun. When a C4 detonation takes place, you have plasma balls that are formed throughout the building. These are electromagnetic eddies that are created. Anything within a plasma ball will not be affected by the 6.3 coefficient of expansion of a C4 detonation, which only affects concrete, steel, and glass. So at this exact second, when this building is exposed to this, you have all these heavy chunks of steel in here, but they're also subject to the change in the gravity well. The gravity well collapses in 4.8 seconds, pulling the entire breed field right into a real nice pile in the basement. One thing that they didn't tell you was there was eight buildings, 40 stories tall, that surround the World Trade Center. It all fell down. They were caught inside the electromagnetic bubble. They weren't on fire, but they all collapsed just the same with the World Trade Center because they were inside the electromagnetic pulse of the C4 detonation. So plastic affected plastic and pulled this whole thing down into a nice neat pile. Now, if you look at the video, you'll see that the... Uh, here's Long Island, here's the World Trade Center, and here's a big white cloud of asbestos. The entire World Trade Center is insulated with asbestos. 50,000 people a day work in the World Trade Center. 50,000 people for 30 years exposed to asbestos insulation. Anybody want to guess at what the lawsuits would be worth over a 30-year period? in the trillions of dollars against the United States government. Who owns the World Trade Center? New York City Port Authorities. Who owns the New York City Port Authorities? United States Department of Transportation. Who is owned by the United States Postal Service? Who owns the Treasury? Who owns the Pentagon? Who owns the, who owns the, who owns the military? Jeez, it's all kind of coming back to roast on the, treasure, on the post office, isn't it? So now you've got this big cloud of asbestos, and three million New Yorkers are exposed to raw asbestos that's just been blasted away into real nice fine particles by 85,000 pound per square inch blast wave. Coefficient of expansion of asbestos is not 6.3. It's only blown into a free atmosphere, not into an atom format. So therefore, this here becomes a death trap for everyone exposed. Now, 50,000 people a day work, but only 3,850 people were in the building because everybody was told to stay home. Both planes, when you run the video back and you look at them, did not have windows. They were drones. Where did all the people go that supposedly left Boston? Never heard from again. Out into the Atlantic and ditched. And this was a controlled issue by drones. And we have drone technology. There's over 12,000 drones in Iraq right now. So these things, liars figure. But this little number here, figures don't lie. And being a heat treat specialist with a nuclear background can tell you that this was created by 186 men of special forces who deal with demolition. The basement of the World Trade Center was blasted out. What do you think is below the World Trade Center? Oh. Heavy rails called the subway system. They blew the basement floors out and dumped all the gold onto the subway rails, and they disappeared. Not to be found yet. Somewhere. That was the World Bank of the United States, controlled by the United States Postal Service. But the gold, ah, that was only $3.4 billion dollars. At the exact point of detonation, 
Twelve trillion dollars was transferred through Honolulu, Hawaii subspation into Singapore Bank in Singapore, world's largest bank, which can accept the deposit. How much money does it cost to, stay, to conduct a war in Afghanistan and Iraq? Five hundred billion a year. This is a 22-year supply of money to keep the war going in the Middle East and keep us in Asia. How much oil do we have left in the Middle East? 20 years. Keep the oil running for 20 years and the money to play for it. Cover up the asbestos under active war. Dress a bunch of guys up in rags and call them terrorists. Give us a Patriot Bill. Take away our freedoms. Put us through all the nonsense at the airport. Even take away your clippers out of your luggage so you can't get on a plane, but they give you a steel knife and fork in first class. Now go figure that one. I kid you not, folks. I'm a 1,200, 1,400 flight flyer. So the plasma balls protect the steel and concrete, which are then analyzed to be 100% metallurgically correct, except both buildings are missing 50,000 tons of matter, which floated away in the cloud as atoms of smoke on the wind. You know, everybody caught in the cloud is now dying of lung cancer. But because this is an act of war, they can't sue for medical help from the United States Social Security Service. And what did the United States do? They sued to give up your protect your freedoms to join the United States of America Corporation and go into an, a guise, G-O-I-S-E, of protection and give up all your civil rights. Now, uh, mandamus has been canceled because it's written in adverb verb. Uh, your freedoms, as far as uh, having a warrant to enter search warrants, have been nullified because the laws are written in adverb verb. They're using my technology to disqualify all the protections you had, and PRO means no of Tectus contract all the no contracts you had. And they're only selectively choosing the ones that they want to use that benefit them in their ability to control. And Big Brother is watching. At every traffic intersection, you have a camera, videos. How many people got tickets already from video cameras at stoplights? I got a few of them myself. So who's Big Brother? Who's Big Brother? DOT, Department of Transportation, working for the post office. Is that where the U.S. Department of Agriculture comes in? Under the post office. Under the post office. Yep, and you guys are all farmers, so you're under... In other words, to own a farm today, you have to have a four-year college degree in horticulture. You have to understand pesticides, groundwater, public safety, pollution, uh, gasoline. Uh, if your tractor is leaking, anything you put on the ground goes into the water table. Therefore, it affects public safety underwater. I used to own a 40-acre plot of land, and I bought it because I was going to harvest the topsoil, which was worth $7.5 million on my 40 acres, until I took a course at the DNR in Wisconsin and found out that this was the first line of defense to supply water to over 10,000 homes within 100 square miles of my, house, of my land, as that was the headwaters of the Mud River. And I got an education as to how important my land was and that it could never be touched because it, it filtered water and created pure water in the, in the underground water system. And I respected that because I'm a green person. So now you know what happened here. This was a, a condition. Oklahoma was number one. Waco was number two. Uh, well, Waco was first, then Oklahoma, then this one. Just like World War II was allowed to take place bombing a Pearl Harbor, you need a crime big enough so that people yell rape. This was a crime big enough to suspend your rights and make everybody a victim of terror. Question? Here in, here in Nagasaki, what uh, was that a control thing? What? Population control in World War II? For what? For Hiroshima and Nagasaki when the A bomb was dropped? Okay. Um, in World War II, uh, all the bombs dropped in Pearl Harbor 
had $1 airmail stamps put on them just to make it legal to deliver the postage to the Postmaster General of Honolulu, Hawaii on December 7th, 1941. In 1945, a $1 airmail stamp was placed on Little Boy and Flat Boy, uh, Fat Boy and delivered to Hiroshima and Nagasaki airmail just to make it legal. And I have the video at home that shows the Postmaster General of Honolulu, Hawaii in, in, on signing his name across the $1 postage stamp, just like I signed my name across the $1 postage stamp on my lawsuits, just to make it legal to deliver the mail. All the bombs that were unexploded, and I talked with one of the survivors in Honolulu, Hawaii, who had a 500-pound bomb dropped and split a tree in front of his, his house. And the bomb had a $1 postage stamp on it when I asked him about it. He goes like, yeah, it was a $1 Japanese postage stamp signed right on there. He says, thought it was kind of peculiar. He says the Army Corps of Engineering came out and def defused the bomb, took it away. But it did have the $1 postage stamp on it, he said. And he was an eyewitness. So, yes? What is the significance of the $1 versus, let's say... There are no fractions in federal law. Everything is a whole number. That's your answer. So you That's can't what, use a two cent stamp? No. You must use a $1 stamp or, or above. It must always be a whole number. Now, that's a good question. I'm going to switch gears here a little bit. When you read, now, you've been exposed to fiction grammar, but there's another thing that you don't see. It's called character spaces. All things went to, to uh, computer now. Uh, no, wait, that's... Uh... Yeah. Mm. My spacing is wrong. Okay, you're looking at a computer, and each one of these represent a character space, okay? Now there's a rule in syntax, it's called the double space rule. If you are two spaces between words, you break the continuance of evidence, okay? Now here you're going along, you got space, 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 one-tenth, full space. This is actually two spaces now. So when you say, I saw the cat, this is an adverb verb, adverb verb, but there's two spaces missing here. So therefore, this is just a two-word phrase, and this is a two-word phrase. It's not, a, it's not four words. So therefore, watch your spacing. We have an attorney in Petersburg, Alaska, who uses four words, single-spaced, three words, double-spaced in each sentence for 22 years. Last year, I caught him. We went back and looked at everything he wrote in 22 years, all identical, four and three on every sentence. Never wrote a legal contract in his entire history, entire life. And he was the prosecuting attorney in working for the city in Petersburg, Alaska, and never lost a case. But then again, he never had a correct case, and so him and the judge were in and on together. Therefore, it's a conspiracy. He knew what he was doing. Exactly. There was no mistakes there. When I take your mortgage contracts and I identify all the parts of speech in 15 pages, 
and I show that there's not a single prepositional phrase, that this is a document with 5,000 syntax wrong words and a thousand words that mean no contract, and therefore you have 6,000 mistakes and 5,000 words, this is like building a space shuttle to go to the moon. It's an engineering exercise on 64 million mortgages. When Lloyd's of London got a copy of this, they canceled 64 million title insurance policies in the United States. If I'm blowing smoke, then what's the, what's the world doing canceling the United States contracts across the board, shutting down the mortgage industry? And as Pandora, yes, I'm responsible personally for the entire collapse of the mortgage industry and why all of you are probably in foreclosure right now. Forty billion dollars, that's nothing. No, he's just trying to put a band-aid on something, saying we're going to buy up all your bad paper. Uh, now, for the mortgage people, and this goes with that. <clears throat> Here's how the plan works. We have a document that's a fraud. And this is an autograph. This is a confession. As you know, the bank did not sign any of your mortgages. So therefore, you have a what's called a unilateral contract, meaning one signer, which means it's not a contract. You are a classified as a borrower or a trustor, ending the word in OR, making you responsible for what? A contract that's written in adverb verb and says nothing. You are responsible to pay back money to a contract that doesn't exist. You are, all the money listed on the document is in a parenthesis. So if we have quotation marks, a parenthesis, square brackets, or we write in italics. Kind of bad. <laughs> Or if we write on an angle called italics, it means it's removed from the paper and it's blank, which is the condition of all your cases. All right, so we have this document here, and it, this document says that uh, uh, the, the bank wants this from you, So, but he never signed it. So can I prosecute this individual? Well, I don't have a victim yet. You guys have become victims, but only after the fact. Those that are all current in your mortgage payments, you still are sitting on bad paper, but nobody's taking responsibility for it. You've paid, kept your mouth shut, the bank's kept their mouth shut, and you just keep paying. Well, that's cool. Your credit rating reflects that you have made a promise to give something back to somebody else, and you've kept your promise. It's just like a handshake. There's no written contract. This is not a written contract either until I stand up in front of the court. Now, when the bank stands up in front of the court and says, I wrote this, I'm taking responsibility, I want that house. I now have a signed confession in front of a judge that they took responsibility. Now, it's my responsibility under Title 42, 1986, as a federal judge, to syntax this document and find out what it really says. What it really says is that the false and misleading information, fictitious conveyance of grammar, perjury, and deprivation of rights under coloring of the law was now a condition of criminal activity under Title 42, 1986, while engaged in criminal activity, under Title 42, 1986, he had knowledge because there are 6,000 mistakes without any kind of modification. In other words, it's a perfect fraud. A perfect fraud because we're back into the no law or fact. And so now he's got this no law or fact document that he's confessed to. Well, from the first one that we did in January of 2008, which collapsed the entire mortgage industry and took the stock market from 14,000 down to six and back up again and put everybody into your quandrum, why hasn't the bank foreclosed you after 90 days? Why didn't they just come out with the sheriff and kick you off the land? 
Well, that's because we still hadn't had the banker stand up and say, I did this. So when he did that, he now had a one, what he did was on the 90th day, he filed a Title 46, Chapter 16, Section 781 salvage claim on your land. They killed the Indians. They stole the land. They sold it to an unsuspecting buyer back in 1800, and it hasn't been, or 1834, and it hasn't been corrected to this date. And so the word is ailing, A-I-L-I-N-G. It comes from the word failing with a square bracket around it. Better known as the Federal Rules of Civil Procedure 12B6. Now, every one of you that have ever worked with me, the first thing that the lawyer does is he failed to state a claim. Okay, what that says is pronoun, adverb, future time, verb, adverb, verb, which means you didn't use a verb in your document. You actually sued them with correct facts, using forensic evidence with a signed confession from the bank who stood up and said, I wrote this. Now, I have permission as a federal judge under Title 42, 1986 to prosecute this individual for false and misleading information. So all the people that have filed these lawsuits since January 2008, they're stonewalled. We want more information. We want interrogatories. We want affidavits. We want a smoking gun. We want, we want, we want. The point is, the word interrogatory, I-N-T, means no contract. Affidavit, A-F-F, no, while two consonants, means no contract. We want no contract. We want you to participate in, in nonsense for three and a half years of no contract to keep you into a verb fiction, which means as long as you say nothing about nothing, you can't prosecute nothing with nothing. Which part of no don't you understand, the N or the O? <laughs> okay. Now that this fraud has been perpetrated, we go ahead and say, well, I have the signed confession here, and the bank won't settle, and the court won't settle. They're going like, well, the lawyers all, both sides, want more and more information. Well, and the U.S. Attorney's Office in, in California, they said, well, we've got to find out who wrote this. I says, well, first off, this is owned by a corporation. A corporation is a dead entity, just like this piece of paper is a dead entity, is a vessel in dry dock. Even though you have a president and a vice president, a director of a corporation, who is this individual? He is not a living, thinking entity. He is a corporate trustee. Trustees are created by paper documents. There is no living person to look at. You only have a machine a machine run by a set of rules and regulations, that machine tells the, creates the trustee and tells the trustee what to do. But all the language is written in fiction. So what is the subjective interpretation of nothing? Well, at some point here, we have to come to a settlement. So how do we get these people to, how do we get the machine, the corporation, to sit down and confess to a U.S. Attorney's Office, yeah, we're responsible. Yeah, this was engineered as a lie. Yeah, somebody's got to go. Somebody's got to pay. Well, the fine is twenty-five million dollars times sixty-four million homes. That's four hundred trillion dollars. That's pretty, pretty, pretty big check to write. The United States Treasury is seventeen trillion dollars in debt. The United States Treasury uh, might be seventeen trillion dollars in debt, but the United States banking industry has stolen. $700 trillion from the United States Treasury in the last 84 years. So what do they do with all that money? Where's it sitting? Well, it's sitting offshore. It's sitting in trust. It's accumulating interest. And the bank owes the United States government $400 trillion. That's according to just, to just, just for the mortgages. That's only for 64 million mortgages. That's not counting all the industry, corporations, uh, licensing bureaus, tr Department of Transportation, everything else. So this is a, a really big number, probably $1,000 trillion. 
Point is, we're only going to deal with the mortgages right now. So I said to the bank, I says, well, the U.S. attorney though says we, 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 we can't get past, we've been in court three and a half years now, and we can't move forward. They want more and more and more information. I says, all right, <clears throat> would you like me to settle this? The guy says, no one's been able to settle it. What are we going to do? I says, I'll fix it. So I made a deal with Chase, Bank of America, Wells Fargo, and Citibank. Brought all the boys in. Sat down and said, hey, you know, guys, you wrote this. I sent text it. I have a signed confession in my hand. He says, well, we didn't sign it. There's no signature on there. I says, yeah, but you stood up in court and you held it up and said, I want your house. When you did that, you confessed. And I've got all of your confessions. Because, after all, I have a lawsuit that says here you want their house for not paying the bill. So, therefore, you held this up and confessed to it. Now I have a signature signed in front of a judge. And now you're liable. We can't pay that. You'll bankrupt all the courts. All the, all the, all the, all the, all the banks will go bankrupt. Not true. Okay, in this hand here, you've got a $25 million check. Now, you're going to confess that you wrote this. You're going to pay $25 million to the Justice Department. The Justice Department is going to get $17.5 million of the penalty, and the whistleblower is going to get $7.5 million for every one of these confessions. Then the whistleblower is going to sign a contract. He's going to get $500 million or $500,000 in cash. Well, that'll be negotiated anywhere from five hundred to say two point five million, depending on what you need, how big your family is, what your liabilities are. That's negotiable. But the initial thing was five hundred. Okay. Now we've got seven million dollars left over. And you have to buy a seven million dollar C D at the bank that just screwed you, who paid a $25 million judgment to the government. What happens when you buy the $7 million CD? They get to fraction bank it at 10 to 1, making $70 million and selling it to MasterCard at 18% interest. And in nine months, the $25 million is all paid back in interest to MasterCard. The bank goes... We're going to make a, sh excuse my French, a shithouse of money. <laughs> <laughs> and the bank, 10 days later, walked into Kamala Harris's office and said, we got a check here for $26 billion. We'd like to settle this lawsuit. And all the homeowners get paid. March 6, 2012. Ten days after I met with the banks in Oceanside, California. Now that they had a remedy, the banks, Kamala Harris got nineteen billion, the United States government immediately took seven billion, stuck it into the Treasury in, in the state of California. Kamala Harris then had to hire a staff of individuals, screen out the applications, get all the forms worked, the paperwork done. I have those with me, by the way, for those that need the forms. Um, that are involved with lawsuits with me right now. And the, the bank is waiting for their redeposit of the $70 million for every $25 million they paid out on. And this is in all, I have all 50 federal attorney generals and 1,000 staff members, which are all assistant attorney generals, working with me on this. Now, they are hiring 3,000 more attorneys to work with the U.S. Attorney's Office to process 22 million foreclosures in the United States. When you divide 22 million by 4,000 attorneys, that's going to take a while, especially with all the paperwork involved. It's going to result in an $8 trillion a year windfall for a government that functions on $2 trillion a year and only collects $500 billion a year in, in revenue from the IRS, from taxes. So this is a 16 to 1 payback with my technology. Who am I? I am the cash cow of the United States Treasury. <laughs> I, I, why do they leave me alone? Why do they let me do what I do? 
is because the United States government would not exist after 1997 if it wasn't for me. I paid off the last national debt in 16 months. They were $8 trillion in debt. They not only paid it back, but on November 2nd, 1999, we had four, $6 trillion surplus in the United States Treasury entering the third international bankruptcy. And so now, as of last week, we were $17 trillion in debt. With this technology, it's affecting everything. And every single lawsuit, yesterday, yesterday Bank of America wrote a check for $2.46 billion dollars for false and misleading information on the wording for the contract for the Bank of America Employees Pension Fund. Biggest single settlement in the Bank of America in the United States pension history. But that is trivia compared to the 25 or the 26 billion that was written in California to settle the cases and the 74 billion that has currently been paid out uh, to date on the $400 billion lawsuit, which is at the New York Securities and Exchange Commission for false and misleading information to sell bad mortgages to the Securities and Exchange with a second grade reading level, henceforth this document. But under the Clayton Act, you're going for four times damages of $1.6 trillion against the, the, the banks. For the, this is just the first 1% one percent of the 22 million cases that are out there. There's a three percent bottleneck in the United States court system. It will take 30 years to go through the 22 million foreclosures. That's why they've hired it. They want to bring this down to 10 years instead of 30 years. Question. I'm just curious on the uh, you mentioned seven million going to the CD. You get the interest off it on a yearly basis besides your five, just like you win the lottery. You get the interest from the lottery for 20 years. The state keeps the initial chunk of money that you just won, $300 million, and you get the interest off it. It's more money than you can spend within reason against paying for all your toys that you would fantasize for any individual. And it keeps, <clears throat> there is, really isn't any money around out there. Everything's got to be working. Interest is a working condition of, of money. So, in when they, Every time they have a problem, they come to me and say, here's the, here's the information, sort it out. And it takes me just a couple seconds because I've, I've been doing this since 1997 when I issued new money in the United States. So does that go on indefinitely or is there a time frame that, that that would stop? There will, no, it, it, there will always be a condition of foreclosure. There will always be people in bad luck. There will always be the new contracts, however, have to be written in a new Parse syntax no, grammar. I'm referring to the, the CD. 7 million CD that I get personally. No, and that'll be just a 10 year contract 10 year. Okay. that you'll have a, uh, a one time payout at the end of 10 years. That'll give them a time to, they may bill out MasterCard at, I think it's currently is 14.6%, giving you a 7% commission off of that. Seven times seven is 49, so that's a half a million a year for 10 years on top of that, and then a windfall of seven at the end, which would be reasonable. The bank makes $70 million off the top of that at a 10 to one fraction, where they're only paying you one, one to paying you the face value of seven, but actually collecting on 60, 63 million, all the interest, see? Yeah, I'm sure. I'm sure McDonald's will appreciate you. Yes. Well, basically, with that all being said, the new banks, they're not going to fight. Right. In other words, the banks will say, "Oh, you finally caught me. Okay, yeah, I confess. No prison, and we're going to hold, go ahead and negotiate this plan. You guys win. The federal government gets 17.5 million. They win. The IRS. <coughs> now, everyone." you're entitled to your minimum wage, eight bucks an hour. You work 8,700 hours a year on your property to guard the home and the farm. At minimum wage, that's $87,400 a year for the husband and the wife, anybody on title, times the amount of years you've owned the property. And under the Clayton Act, it's four times that. 
Then your down payment on the property, if you refinanced, the value of the house you put up for the, down, for the, for the refinance is the down payment times four. So it's not a half a million dollar property. It was refinanced at seven. The half a million value that was refinanced now becomes four times at $2 million. So we're talking about a few, few extra bucks here. Okay, this is taxable income. This goes to, uh, <clears throat> you have your caretaker fees. Then you have four times your damages. Now the Rescissions Act stipulates under Title 15, Section 1636A, that you must give a three-day notice that you're going to engage in a false and misleading mortgage contract without, with only one person signing. That didn't happen in all 22 million or 64 million foreclosures. And the Title 15, Section 1639A stipulates that if they didn't stop and correct the mistake within three years of the mortgage refinance, that they are liable to return all the interest to you since the first day and under the rescissions under the Clayton Act, you get four times the interest paid in. Those you can pull off your IRS forms that you filed with the taxes. These numbers are then calculated by you. Let's see here. And this is the form that the United States government created. Well, it's not the real form. This form was originally written in adverb verb. The form was because you are filing quantum lawsuits to get paid because you have forensic evidence of fraudulent grammar and fraud has been perpetrated on you. This was also engineered as a fraud so the United States government could keep all of the money because on the bottom here it says under Title 15, Section 1692E, if you use false and misleading information on this document, you now are vacating your position to collect. Ah, and Title 18, 1001, fictitious conveyance of grammar. So if you file a quantum in this hand but file a false claim on this hand, you vacate this claim and you don't get paid anything and the government gets to keep the whole $25 million for themselves. So I syntax this and wrote a brand new form in quantum grammar using the correct parse syntax grammar and filled in all the spaces with the correct parse syntax grammar. Now, if I ask you a question, uh, what is the address of your property? ADD, no rest, which means I just said, what is your no contract property? And you answer me, therefore you've stepped onto a landmine. If I ask you, what is the location for the, no, if I made the statement for the location of the property is with the claim of the claimant. That's a correct statement. Now I gave you a location and I made you a claimant. Gold miners didn't file mortgages. They didn't file deeds of trust. They filed claims for their property. And gold was an authority. So therefore I quantumized this and now time to match your quantumized lawsuit as a quantumized claim. United States, Attorney's Office got this. We have a collection agency with Tyrone, T-Y-R-O-N-E, Williams out of Arkansas. Now the first four collection agencies that we had hired were threatened with concrete overshoes. They dropped out. Tyrone Williams was also approached with the same argument. So I intervened. I said to the U.S. Attorney's Office, uh, <clears throat> this is quantum, you're gonna get 17, you're gonna get 17.5 million for every lawsuit I wrote. Based on four times damages, the average person is gonna get $3 million. The government's gonna take 1.5 for the IRS. The trustees are gonna be paid. Anybody in bankruptcy right now, the tr bankruptcy trustee is gonna be presented with this formula. The bankruptcy trustee is gonna see that one, you're gonna get a windfall of $7 million or whatever, in, in the case of bankruptcy, you will get a check to discharge all your debts, pay off everything, and whatever's left over will wind up being refinanced this way, plus whatever monies you need to be comfortable. This over here goes to the IRS. I don't know about 
the IRS liability of this. But if you add this to this, the average lawsuit I write is a $20 million windfall for the United States government. Now the judge says to me, we're going to dismiss this. This is goobly gop. This makes no sense whatsoever. I said to the judge, I said, you know, Your Honor, I'm here in Honolulu, Hawaii. There's a judge in front of Judge Kern. They've got 22 people here. I'm a claimant in all the lawsuits. I says, 25 million bucks a pop, plus $3 million for the IRS. That's $28 million a pop. I says, I don't know what your pay grade is. I says, but you start costing the government $28 million for every person sitting here, times 22, that's $1.4 billion. Uh, you're not going to have a job very long. I recuse myself. <laughs> well, before you, I get kind of getting ahead there. After I said that to him, he says, who are you? How dare you talk to me like that? I held up my oath of office. Says, I'm the chief federal judge of the Hawaiian Islands, and I believe I have a warrant for your arrest over here. <laughs> <laughs> and right then and there, he recuses himself, and he walks out of the courtroom. Well, in, in comes a, another judge, Kobayashi. I want appearances. Well, so I gave my name, and I first thing out of my mouth was, I says, I saw you standing in the door, so I heard you, I, I know you heard what the, the other, what Judge Kern just heard. I says, uh, and I looked at my list and I says, I believe I have a warrant for your arrest. And he ran out of the courtroom too. Then Judge Mulloway, she's the chief federal judge of, the, of, of uh, district court in Hawaii, she comes walking in. I know you don't have an arrest warrant for me, she says. She says, because I was appointed by President Obama just last year. This is all fair enough, you know. I'm still the chief federal judge here, and you're a district court judge. I says, oh, by the way, I have your oath of office here. It's written in adverb verbs, so therefore you're not a chief federal judge. You're not any kind of a judge. You're just an actor in black robes. <laughs> I don't care who you are. I don't care what person's name is in this courtroom. If David Miller's name is on her, I want you in this courtroom on August 12th, uh, uh, April 12th, 2012, at 9 o'clock in the morning. So... All 22 of us showed up on April 12th, 9 o'clock, and I walked into the courthouse and got six marshals standing in front of me. Judge Miller, do you have your credentials? I says, yep, here's my oath of office, here's my warrants. Are you here to arrest our judges? I'm going, no, I'm just here to go to court. I've got a, I've got a 9 o'clock appointment upstairs. He says, would you guys like to come with me? He says, well, yeah, he says, we're going to have to. He says, we have orders to accompany you when you enter the building for everyone's protection. <laughs> it says, who are all these other people? It says, oh, they all were all ordered to be here, along with all the attorneys and all the mortgage companies. He says, well, you're the only ones here. What's this all about? I says, I put a 15-month freeze on all the foreclosures in the Hawaiian Islands. And five of the six marshals were in foreclosure. And I all shook my hand going, oh, thank you for not having us kicked out of our home. <laughs> so I, they were all in my, in my, I said, would you guys like to come upstairs with me? So we all tiptoed upstairs in Kern's office. We go walking in. And Judge, as soon as I walked in the door, Judge runs out of the courtroom. Because I got a warrant for his arrest. And <clears throat> I walk up to the clerk and says, well, we're here. Where's Mulloway? He ordered us to be here. And... Uh, he says, oh, I'll go check. It runs in the back room. There's a whole bunch of screaming going on back there. The clerk comes out all red in the face, and he goes like, the judge has ordered the courthouse closed and ordered his courtroom closed, and everyone is ordered to vacate the building. I says, well, where's Judge Mulloway? You've got to go down to the clerk's office and find out. I says, well, the judge has ordered the courthouse closed. So the six marshals and I we go down to the clerk's office, and I have a order opening the court up, ordering with me. I was prepared for all this. I walk to the clerk says, I'm ordering the courthouse open as fe chief federal judge. He stamps it, signs it, and I sign it. I said, by the way, where, are, where is everybody? Uh, well, the phone's over there, go call. So I called the chief judge's secretary, and she picks up. She says, all the judges in the courthouse are on a plane flying to San Francisco. Judge Kern is the only judge in the courthouse, and he ordered the courthouse closed, which is illegal. Can't shut down the federal government. So right then and there, I says, well, I says, all the judges committed treason, vacated their posts, and left the country because they're in international space. So now we got a new complicated lawsuit that I'm putting together. So.
every time I show up in Honolulu, it's World War III, you know? It's... <laughs> so the, these forms were, were critiqued so that they match your quantum lawsuits so that you have... Uh, I've taken all the precautions necessary so that your language is correct. I took all the boxes off the paperwork so there's no boxes. Uh, the only thing... When the judge... The, when, when somebody asks you a question, like, uh, what is the location of your property? Well, you have to have all the words defined, which is in the lawsuit. You have to have your name and address to be legal as far as understanding what an ownership of location is. That's in the lawsuit. You have to have a cause and effect as to why you have ownership and why the bank doesn't. That's in the lawsuit because possession is nine points of the law and no one ever gave you a legitimate contract and you've been the caretaker, trustee, and guardian of the property, which puts you on it, and there is no contract. And I mean the word no is an adverb making contract to be a verb, which is an, ad, which is an adverb verb fiction. So there is no paper in existence on planet Earth that says you do not own the property as being the original settler on the property. As the American Indians, even though we know the military moved them off, didn't have writing. They didn't have treaties. There has never been a correct parse syntax grammar contract written for that object, and because you are the only person on it, under the maritime law of salvage, are the only people that have ever existed as original owners. Do you have a mortgage? The answer is no. Do you have a debt? The answer is no. Do you own the land? The answer is yes, because possession is nine points until somebody can show you a correct parse syntax grammar contract that says otherwise. So if the world of fiction wants to play the world of fiction, that's one thing. But when Iceland got a hold of this, Iceland forgave all the mortgages in Iceland back in March this year, rather than pay $25 million to pop to Wall Street. So everyone's title clear in Iceland now, even though it's a very small country. Yes? Well, if you're a good old boy and you just uh, bought a place and everything's current, how would you go about knowing, knowing this, the document's fraud? How would you go about, would, would we have to get contact with you? You can bring a lawsuit against the bank with the existing contract that you have right now and follow the procedures of suing for false and misleading information Excuse me. Uh, on the contract and showing where the bank had Lodial, L-O-D-I-A-L, title to the property. If you're the only person standing and nobody has claim to it and you're on the property, under one-year moratorium, technically you own the property. If you... Yeah, you'd have to be there one year under one-year damage claim that no one's ever filed a damage claim against you for false and misleading information. Okay? No. <laughs> now, there's a numbering, this, this is a numbering system. There's only five patterns of numbers in the entire world of fiction. And... Once you memorize these numbers, there's a, uh, an old rule maybe most of you are familiar with, Sherlock Holmes. Everyone know the name? Okay. Sherlock Holmes says, when you remove all the things that cannot be possible, what are left, however irrelevant you believe them to be, are the facts. The point is, when we apply the same philosophy to the world of fiction we actually come up with the facts. So, what is an adverb? An adverb is a modifier. It modifies the condition of the speed of thinking. It's primarily designed to modify the verb in, in speech. The verb is the word thinking, or, or the word motion. And motion comes from thinking. So the adverb is a modifier of speed. 
Now, when you modify something, you change it from its origin. Well, if it's not origin, it's perjury. Simple as that. If it is not the fact and you changed it, that's perjury. I don't care what language you speak, I don't care what country you come from, 8 billion people understand the word perjury. And so you've you've told a lie because you've created an opinion. This one here, motion, rather the adjective, we're going to deal this with color. Anybody want to define color? Explain to Helen Keller, who was born blind, what the color blue is, or color red, or yellow. You can't explain color to a blind person. Turn off all the lights. You see, black is the absence of energy. There is no such thing as a, as a, uh, a negative. You can only have different degrees of energy. In the, in, in the universe. There is no such thing as a negative. So the, take this room, for instance. We've, we've got thousands of candle powers of fluorescent light, and it's very bright in here. But let's go to midnight, turn all the lights off in here. It's so dark that you can't see the hand in front of your face. Or go into a cave underground. And I was in a, I was in a cave, um, and I have my little tiny LCD flashlight on my keychain, And they turned off the lights for about a minute. So everybody's eyes were fully dilated. And I turned that little light on. And for 300 feet down the cave, you could see everything clear. With just that one little LCD light. Or you take a, a, a football stadium, it holds 70,000 people at midnight. No moon. Absolutely black, so you can't see the hand in front of your face. And just light one candle. An entire stadium will be illuminated that you can see by one candle because you have black was just the absence of energy, but even the smallest spark of energy creates an illusion, will give you the reflected illusion that is necessary. So you can't prove a negativity. The adjective ADJ means no contract because the IVE is contract. And the adjective is going to, color is an opinion. And an adjective cannot exist unless it is filed by a fact. Because the color has to be able to modify something. The word black pen, black is a fact. Pen is a fact. Black is an adjective. Is this a black pen, a carbon pen, an ebony pen, or a charcoal pen? All colors are black. I have a, a black jacket on, or it appears to be black, but actually when you put it against my black pants, it's actually a black blue. Just one hair off of black with a little bit of blue in it. So, but when I put the, the black against my shirt, it looks like a complete black and, white sh- black and white combination, but when you put it against another shade of black, you're going like, well, there's some blue in this. Just a little bit, but it isn't black. So there's 1,200 shades of of each shade of color. And there's an infinite amount of colors, so how do you argue color? Even an individual, the pigmentation of your eye and its ability to see color and the amount of oxygen you have in your blood or how many red cells or how many white cells will affect the, the color of your blood that goes through your eye and affect the shade where one person will see burgundy and the other person will see bright red. Another person will see green or brown. My friend Lyndall is colorblind. I says, can I have that red pen? She, she says, I'm colorblind. I can see a brown pen. Is that the one you want? So she could only see brown. And I thought to myself, wow, a beautiful bouquet of flowers. Bucabalias, for instance. Beautiful purple flowers. She only sees as gray and white. You know, she can't appreciate all the colors in the world. And I, I said, what a handicap, you know. Uh, so the adjective must always appear in front of a noun but then, or a fact, but then when you put an adjective in front of a fact, it becomes a pronoun because this is modifying the fact. Now it's a no, no, no. P-R-O is no, N-O is no, and U-N is no. So pronoun has been modified into non-existence. The position is an alphabet, A, B, C. 
We're going to spell the pen using the alphabet. We're going to spell it P-E-N. We're going to give it a definition for the writing. Look, in any dictionary, it says a pen is used for writing. It's used as a noun. However, I take, I take a pen and I hold it like this. I now have a stabbing instrument, and I stab somebody with it. It's carrying a concealed weapon. It carries a 10-year prison sentence for carrying a concealed weapon and 10 years for assault with a, with a deadly weapon. Or I make a fist with it for as a stabbing tool. It's your volition. If I hold it like this, it's a tool for writing. So the simple way you conduct yourself while holding a pen or a pencil can get you thrown in jail for 10 years. So be careful what kind of jokes you want to play when you're in the presence of law enforcement and what your attitude is. If the government wants your farm, they can charge you with carrying a concealed weapon and throw you into a quandrum of illusion gets you to sign off and turn over your farm to the government, which is a foreign vessel in dry dock, and all of a sudden you're sitting on the street going, what happened to me? I was writing a check for one minute, and next thing I'm guilty of an assault, assault with a deadly weapon in a bank with a ballpoint pen. What kind of nonsense is this? See how easy it is? My buddy, he's an electrician, gets pulled over. Cop sees a piece of copper, one inch in diameter, with tape wrapped around the end of it. So I see you got a club in the car carrying a concealed weapon. He goes, no. And uh, he says, well, I'm going to charge you with carrying a concealed weapon because you have a club in your car. He says, I'm an electrician. I just got done wiring a 600 amp, 600 volt circuitry system. It runs a one inch wire. And that's the end that we put the tape around and connect our, our rope to it. And we pulled it through the line. When we got it on the end, we just chop it off. And I'm taking it to the junkyard to scrap it out. I'm going to charge you with carrying a concealed weapon, $2,500 fine. And he goes to court, and they sue him for $2,500. And he calls me up, and I intervene, and he gets his refund back, and they drop all charges. Just because I said, can I see the correct sentence structure, communication, parse, syntax, language for carrying a concealed weapon? Oh, doesn't exist. Well, then how can you charge somebody with something that doesn't exist? Give him his money back. By the way, it shut down Adams County for six for three months. That little sentence. Because the man who charged him twenty five hundred dollars, the real judge walks out of the courtroom. His brother in law is a plumber. He's in the hallway. And I followed the judge out. I'm just standing there, got my suit on, look like an attorney. And the the judge goes to us, Hey, put my robe on, go in there and take twenty five hundred bucks off this guy. And put him in jail for thirty days. So the brother-in-law, being a plumber, puts on his robe and walks in there and says, I'm the judge. Give me $2,500. You're 30 days in jail. And the sheriff arrests the guy and puts him in jail. I make a call down to the chief judge at Federal District Court in, in Madison, Wisconsin, and I explain what just what happened. And they shut down the county. Half the people got fired that worked in the county when they found out nobody had an oath of office. None of the judges, none of the clerics, none of the police officers. I mean, it was a complete rout. Don't think because they're, they're, they're public of officials that they're legal. There, there's, a, there's, a, uh, there's, a, there's a movie that just came out a couple of years ago at Demsall, Washington, where he's a, a drug dealer. When, <clears throat> when he blew the whistle back in the 60s, half, 60% of all the police officers in New York City and Manhattan Island were arrested as co-conspirators for drug dealing. Half, 60%. Huh? No, Serpico is a different one. A lot of people went down on that one also. But this is where a drug dealer turned state's evidence under the uh, False Claims Act. And uh, Compton, Compton is the second largest county in the United States next to Los Angeles County, was taken over by the Crips in the Bloods. When the FBI went in there and broke that up, uh, 60% uh, of all the people that worked in government, from judges, attorneys, police officers, clerks, uh, all went to prison. And Compton was under the, the jurisdiction of Los Angeles County for eight years before they were able to reform a government. Don't think it can happen. Yes? So what can we do when we have a county sheriff that has a, you know, the, the oath that they've been using for years, the one that is on file currently is completely void of any 
Send it to me in an email. I'll send tax it and send it back to you. In Hawaii, we have 92 judges. We send tax all 92 oaths. When, when the Hawaiian kapunas walk into court, they hold up the oath and say, you have false misleading information. You're not a judge. We have the clerk's false misleading information. And then what they do next is they prick their finger and put blood on whatever document was brought them into court, saying we have, it's called cocoa. Hawaiian word for blood is cocoa. Well, co- the, the paper is fraud. The language is fraud. The blood is human. Therefore, it's real. How does fraud, in fact, come together? Can't. Vacates the contract. Therefore, they don't have authorization. They don't have an oath. And the cases are vacated and the Hawaiians go home. That easy. You can try it. You're not in a sovereign position like the Hawaiian people are because you are a postal employee, but you did walk into a foreign vessel and dry dock under false pretenses. So it's, it's easier to take your, the paperwork that's generated by the state in fraud. If it exceeds $21, now it becomes a federal crime under false and misleading information. Uh, a lot of times, like uh, in March, I was in, in Honolulu and I sat in on Kearns Court. There were 13 felony cases brought in facing five to $10,000 fines and two to 10 years in prison. The judge says, so your lucky day, ladies and gentlemen as each one of the people were brought in. They all got $20 court costs in case were vacated in front of me. Nobody knew what happened, but the judge and I did. <laughs> Number 13 came in, fifth drunk, 44-year-old man, five times drunk driver. Doing, he blew a 3.4. Legally, he should be dead. Caused a car accident for two people in a hospital. That's public safety violation. That, I, won't, I won't deal with public safety. First off, judge says, well, it's your lucky day, sir. Uh, we're only going to charge you how much? $2,000 today instead of 10 because it's your fifth offense. And instead of 10 years in jail, we're going to give you three years in jail. Is that okay with you, sir? And he goes, oh, thank you, judge. Uh, why are you being so generous? He says, well, it's just your lucky day today. DA goes, I object. Judge said objection noted. Write it up. He writes it up. DA takes it up, paperwork up to him. Here, sign it. Judge says, I ain't signing that. <laughs> so I held up my hand and I, I did this. And the judge says, okay, I'll sign it. And he took him away. But I wasn't in the court. <laughs> I says, but I wasn't in the court. Yes. I'll even put it up here on the board. It'll be a good lesson for everyone here. Meantime, you can ask me a few questions. How's that sound? I got a question. What Paul was referring to on the um, oath of office for that sheriff? Yeah. The oath of office like that is filed, but every blank, every line is completely blank, nothing written in it. And that's a certified copy. We're just going to use this as the person's name. Okay, if it's more than double spaces, what you have is a <clears throat> uh, a, a, a group of pronouns that are on the paper. There's no legal sentence called grammar. Now, this is a, we're going to use these dashes to represent character spaces.
Well, you going to buy your groceries today with what kind of money? <clears throat> well, if you want to go ahead, you can go ahead and barter. Postmaster General of the United States. Wouldn't it be better for you to run for Postmaster General than President? I appoint the Postmaster General, who would be my business partner, Russell, who is also a Postmaster General already. Yeah. So how do we vote for you in Congress? I'm a write-in vote under the uh, under the uh, director party. You have listed. You got to write it in. Yeah, write in director also. Yep. Everybody's been given instructions on my website. Is it possible to do that on an electronic voting machine? Yep. Do you have to be registered in order to go in and vote? Yep. The Constitution of the United States no longer exists, so therefore it's irrelevant. State of Illinois is a verb. I'll just take that. All right. This is a I, comma, so this is a pronoun for. Having is a pronoun <clears throat> modified by the bin. Now we have three character spaces, which results in a zero here as a dead continuance. And then you have a pronoun appointed. AP means no point, and ED is in past time. So you have three violations on a word that should be used as a condition of state, now meaning nothing. Two is a adverb in future time. The is an adverb. Office means no contract as uh, a verb. I mean, this is an adjective. Now, the reason this becomes an adjective is because there's a two-character space break between police officer and the word of. So there's a one, three, four. And again, you, you have a break here, an officer, office, OF meaning no, is a volunteer consonant. Then in is an adverb. Rather, there's, there's a double space here again. So in becomes a pronoun, thus an adverb making city to be a verb. Of is an adverb making wheat and to be an adjective of in, which is a pronoun, thus an adverb making county to be a verb. Of is an adverb making DuPage, an adjective of aforesaid. Now, aforesaid, af means no, and F O R E also means no. So we have a double no no here of the word said, which says nothing. Do is a pronoun modified by the adverb salome which then modifies the verb swear, or in the word affirm, which means no contract, as a pronoun, comma, that I will, that is an adverb, I mean, uh, yeah, that is a pronoun, I is an adverb, will is an adverb, support is a verb, the is an adverb, and then it was the, uh, Constitution of the U.S. So that would be a verb, an a, uh, the adjective, pronoun, adverb, adjective, pronoun, and united means no citizen. Where's my prepositional phrase, five, six, and seven? That's a $25 million fine and 30 years in prison. He's carrying a gun and a badge without authorization of an oath of office. Yeah, and that's exactly what you've got. And when I do this, just like when the marshals surrounded me in Honolulu, I said, 
You know, guys, I got a signed confession of all you guys. You all are facing 25 years in prison as organized crime running the government. They have to maintain a condition of zero. The word comes from the word alien, remember? Alien means corruption from the beginning. We killed the Indian, stole the land, sold it to an unsuspecting buyer. Simple as that. All right, because they were corrupt in the way they conducted themselves, took over this country, bastardized grammar for 8,500 years, they have to have one condition of contract. That contract must be in fiction at all times. You can never prosecute an individual for nothing. You can never prove nothing. You can do nothing wrong with nothing. So which part of no don't you understand, the N or the O? <laughs> and, you know, when you look at this, for you to go ahead and say, all right, Anybody feel like a pronoun today? I. Where's your condition of contract? For the I? Why isn't there a name here? Well, it should say is for the, the person's first name and second name with the punctuated words. With the knowledge of a contract. Not appointed. He has to sign a contract. I mean, why would he do the oath? He believes the oath is a contract. But here he's taking a position that he was appointed. Today, it's mandatory that anybody that's a county sheriff has a four-year college degree in criminology. 30, 40 years ago, it was anybody could say, okay, you're the sheriff, put on a uniform, put a badge on, carry a gun, hold up your hand, and that was it. Everybody heard of Judge Roy Breen, the hanging judge of New Mexico? He was played by, uh, they made a movie of him, and... Uh, uh, he was a drunken outlaw with seven uh, guys in his gang. And one day he uh, went to a bar and he found a law book in New Mexico. And he read it and he says, you know what? I'm going to get hung here pretty soon if I don't become a judge. And he made all of his outlaw buddies deputy sheriffs. And they went out and cleaned up New, uh, New Mexico and hung all the rest of the, all the, rest of the crooks. And he says, well, as a judge, you know, I can steal their loot. I don't have to rob a bank. I can just find their loot under the laws of booty, B-O-O-T-Y, and I can keep it all. So I can let them steal it, catch them, keep the money, and hang them. He hung 88 men, never had an oath of office, was never went to law school, and never a judge. He was only a presumption of a judge. Because nobody could read and write, there was nobody to challenge. But because he had his deputies and he had the law book there, and he knew a few tricks as a result of that. He became what he became. What constitutes the fact of a judge or anybody that's an officer of the court? It's only your presumption. Don't forget, you've left Indiana. You've entered a foreign vessel in dry dock, and you speak babble. Everyone has a second-grade reading, an attorney or a lawyer. And just put a one on top of every the on the paper, and the letter A and the letter N. Now, if there's only one word that follows that word, the, and there's a comma, that word is going to be a verb, two. If there are two words that follow that word, it's going to be a three and a four. Like here. One, three, four, and there'll probably be a fourth word, which would then become a pronoun. If there's only two words, it'll be a four, one, two. If there's four words, it'll be a four, one, three, four. And then they have another comma. Throughout the entire mortgage of your own property, if you look at it, you will see there are three, four, and five word combinations set off by commas to break the continuance of evidence. And then with, with the commas, you'll have spacing or numbers, parentheses, quotation marks, italicizing, or double spaces. And those are going to break the continuance of evidence, so they keep isolating these four little phrases to stay within this procedural argument. Now, the Internal Revenue Service says, um, under penalty of perjury, adverb, verb, adverb, verb. So you got a one, two, one, two, one, two scenario. The instructions from the notary, a notary.
No contract. <clears throat> We're going to give you a notice today. which is not ice. We're going to give you a indictment written just like that. What does that say? Does that say indictment? Actually, what it says is, Adverb, adjective, pronoun. Adverb, adjective, adjective, pronoun. Adverb, adjective, pronoun. Because it's an underlined space, underlined space, underlined space. That's what it really says in syntax. It's called parse. Your vowels are used as adverbs. The consonants, if you look at all the letters in the alphabet, all 26 are nouns because they are the, they are the letter that identifies that section of the alphabet. Therefore, they are a fact. But when the fact is used, followed by put in front of another fact, it's an adjective, pronoun. But if it's a letter and it's a single vowel, A, E, I, O, N, U, it becomes a adverb. The adverb modifies the adjective, which modifies the pronoun, one, three, four, one, three, three, four. Henceforth, you go back up here, uh, four, one, three, four, or one, three, four, one, three, four. The patterns are always used. They have never changed from the Constitution of 1775 to present day. The Magna Carta, when I syntax it, 1215, written in adverb verb, the foundation of the, of the English Empire. In World War II, Nazi Germany sent 250 stormtroopers into London, into the historical archive center to destroy the Magna Carta, thinking if we do that, London would lose all credibility on the planet. They were met with 350 British cracked stormtroopers. 250 people died in the battle. The Nazis were captured. The Magna Carta was protected. And when I syntaxed it, it destroyed it and was sold at Christie's of London for $6.7 million. And London lost all their hold including their constitution, on all countries worldwide, and therefore became a little island with no resources, except the North, North Sea's oil drilling right now, and that's about it. So in London, for the last... Well, they were claiming all these assets, just like the uh, Kennecott Copper Mine in Salt Lake City, Utah. Queen Elizabeth was reported to own that until I sent tax a mortgage contract and showed it was fraudulently conveyed. How does a adverb verb statement say you own anything from a foreign land? That got kicked out. Deutsche Bank, Germany, been buying up all the stuff all over the United States. Sent tax or mortgage contract. Now they're facing every contract they have in the United States with false and misleading information at a $25 million a pop fine. Collapsing the Germany's banking hold on the United States claims and all our assets are being seized by the U.S. Department of Justice under the program I put down. Yes? Going back to oaths, there's three specific um, state, Indiana State Police Troopers that I've been trying to get oaths from, which I haven't gotten anything on paper yet. Um, I asked them in person when they showed up at my house, they totally ignored Later, I sent by certified mail the uh, oath request form with the code, you know, the Indiana code that specifically pertains to that, and got nothing. I called Indianapolis, talked to the uh, whatever director or somebody at the state police headquarters who told me on the phone that they never get anything on paper. They do an oral oath at the academy, and that's all that exists. Send a complaint to the attorney general, who directed me to, I can't remember the name of the office, uh, which... Forward. Corporation counsel were responsible to the, to the uh, police officers to protect them against any lawsuits civilian. Which 
generated a response from the state police again. And this time, that response, this is on paper this time, says when the officers graduate, they get their copy sent with the individual officer and they do not retain. So now I got two different stories and still not Secretary of State's responsible for holding all oaths of office, whether it be an attorney's office, uh, judge's oath goes to the Secretary of State. If the population exceeds 500,000 people, they keep it in the house, like Indianapolis. Otherwise, every, <clears throat> uh, I think South Bend is also, uh, Gary's over 500,000 people, and so is South Bend in Indi Indiana here. They would, they would keep the judge's oaths in-house. Otherwise, all the smaller counties would be forwarded to Indianapolis Capitol with Secretary of State. Yes, yeah. Anything that's smaller than a half a million goes there. And your federal courts are set up in half million, <clears throat> half million population sectors within a state. Was it was the state of Indiana? About eight, nine million people. Six. Six million. Yeah. So you'd have twelve federal jurisdictions here in the state of Indiana as a result of that. Thank you. Like you look at Los Angeles, forty million people. You got eighty federal courts in Los Angeles County alone. I mean, every couple of blocks, you got a federal courthouse. And, uh, but Judge Pragerson, Dean Pragerson, is the chief federal judge for Los Angeles, and I had him fired for two years along with D Douglas, his, his clerk. And his father, Dean Pragerson Sr., I, don't, I haven't checked in the last few years, but I think he's still alive. He should be about 92 now. Uh, he is the senior master mason for the, for the, for the state of California and the senior federal district court judge for all the judges in California, and I'm the chief federal judge over all the district court judges in California. Because I'm the only judge in California that has a quantumized oath of office. Everybody else has got stuff that looks like this, an adverb verb. And yet the judge says to me, you know, Dave, he says, we know you're a judge, and we know you have the only, we have your senior position. He says, but we got guns and clubs, what do you got? You got a ballpoint pen. <laughs> Everybody knows a pen's mightier than a sword. I says, yeah, you know what? I says, you can lie all you want. I says, but three plus three still equals six. Now, how many of you have seen the movie Matrix? One, two, and three, okay. You know what happened in that movie? The movie Matrix is this program. It was written completely about this program. This program's been around since 1988. And Matrix is a story of Neo, who wakes up from the illusion, can see fiction, and goes after the machine. The machine wants to kill the humans because the human condition of thinking is flawed. But what kills both humans and machines? Viruses do. The machine can't fight the virus because the virus can multiply itself exponentially and, and get inside the workings of the, of the machine. And so, and as well as the virus can infect the, uh, or multiply itself and then go and kill humans in their dream state because the illusion of a negativity virus exists as a danger. So Neil, as the fact, three plus three equals six, says to the machine, the enemy of my enemy is my friend, Susan Art of War. And the machine says, I have no remedy for, ne uh, for, for Smith. So Neil says, well, I have a solution. If you promise not to hurt the humans in Zion, I will go ahead and take care of Smith. The machine says, all right, we got a contract. If you destroy Smith, then I'll leave you live. I'll call off all my drones and anybody that wants to go free can go free. Henceforth, the architect. Now that little scene of the architect and Neil's ability to communicate with the architect saying, we've been here six times before. And Neil says, choice. It's all about choice. Remember about the, what, who God is and what the devil is, what good and evil is, what choices? Making decisions in life. Understanding the fact in the fiction. 
So Neil says, well, I understand the fact. When I can see the fact, <clears throat> and I know that in the dream I can do anything, I can be Superman in the dream. He says, okay, I can go out there and play the Superman routine. I can fight Smith. I can fight the machines. And I can win all the time. So finally, he comes down to the confrontation where he makes a contract with the machine. And then the next thing, bang, he's right back in the matrix with Smith. But Smith says, we've been here before. And Neil says, yeah, that's right. He says, if you know him, he says, I brought a few friends with me, which is the infinity of fiction. Three plus three equals six. How many ways can you do it wrong? Three plus three equals seven. Three plus three equals eight. Equals nine, ten. Infinity. So the power of negativity in infinity can be wrong indefinitely, which is what our world's been for 8,500 years, and I'm Neil. And I says, no, oh, king's got new clothes. Three plus three equals six. And the world says, you must be mad. To, you must be crazy if you're going to use correctness, a mathematical certification, to identify our illusion and disqualify the entire 8 billion population of this planet and wake them up. You must be crazy to do that. You realize the damage this is going to cause? I'm going, three plus three still equals six. You can't live a lie forever. And this planet is, rel humans are relatively young in this planet in their ability to reason things out. So, Neil says <clears throat> to Smith, hey, we got work to do here. Let's get to it. So they have the big battle scene. And Smith, which is the fiction, representing all the things that aren't supposed to be, against Neil, who just represents 3 plus 3 equals 6, which is correct. And bang, 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 bang. And he fights and fights and fights. And finally, Neil says, all right, you win. I, uh, you defeated me. And Smith says, well, even if you did defeat me, you'd have to fight number two just as hard as number one. And we have an infinity amount of fights for you to do to prove that three plus three equals six. So Smith goes, wait a minute. I've seen this before. This is wrong. But I fought so hard to be, to get this. And now we go back to we go back to Smith, the mortgage contract. Sometimes you have to learn through stories, okay? We have a mortgage contract here, which is Smith, and I represent Neil. And the mortgage of fiction says, I'm going to conquer you. So what, is the more, what, is, what does Smith do? He absorbs, he, he touches Neil, and he turns him into Smith. He says, there, I've, con I've conquered you. Three plus three equals seven. But seven minus three equals four, and four doesn't equal three, so therefore, wrong. Boom. Smith number one blows up. Smith number two jumps in. Ah, I got a better answer. Three plus three equals eight, but eight minus three equals five, and five and three don't add up, boom, number two. And at the speed of thought, the billions of Smiths that existed, infinity of wrong is destroyed. And like Sherlock Holmes says, when you remove all the things that can't be, what is left are the facts. And three equals three. So therefore, Smith is destroyed in a microsecond of thought, and what is left are the facts. And when I syntax this, when you remove all the things that can't be, what is left are the facts. A blank sheet of paper. <laughs> And who stands with Lodial title at nine, nine points of the law of possession with no contract written in the correct parse syntax grammar to say you don't own your property? You get clear title. 900 homes in Chicago were, were then on March of last year in 2011, June, it was June 2011, 
900 homeowners were awarded $7.5 million each at an $8.5 million check written by Bank of America, given back their homes, and all expenses for moving in and out for three months were paid for by the Bank of America. It cost them $8.5 billion, and that's for only 900 houses. That was all over CNN. Yes? I have quantum mortgages, yes. And when I wrote the, I used to, I had my own real estate company for 26 years. All the homes that I bought and sold, I bought them in fiction, but I sold them in quantum. The people that bought them in quantum, they looked at the contracts and they had, this gives me a headache to read it. I got to hire a lawyer. So they went to a lawyer. The lawyer took one look at it and said, if you don't want to buy this home, I'll buy it. This is a real contract. This actually gives me lodial title to this property. And he says, I know the court can't take this away from me. I know that a, a bank won't touch this. I can pay for this property and have lodial title to this land, and it can never move it off of me. So what does that mean in terms of uh, being taxed on the property? Taxes still pay for the policemen, the firemen. It's called bailment, B-A-I-L-M-E-N-T. It's a bailment manager. You will be the trustee of your property. No one owns property in the United States. You are only trustees. In other words, the guardian of the land. The people, right now, you're on the last person standing on the property. So the new information that you're going to get will, get, will identify you to be a factual trustee, but show me a second trustee who has a better contract that is timely than yours, to be who you are at this point in time and now time. Uh, I write quantum trusts. I write the only quantum trusts in the United States. They have never been broken. They've been taken in the federal court and challenged. The federal court throws them out, saying you can't, you can't bring those documents here. We're a fiction. These are factual documents. You don't have copyright infringement capabilities of entering into these trusts. The trusts are... Factual holding trust, they do not. You can't do banking with a quantum trust. You can have a second trust if you want or do something with a checking, an ordinary checking account, but a trust is no more than a holding position of a quantum mortgage, or I mean a quantum contract on your land to describe it. A quantum trust is a trust that identifies you to be a trustee and you are instructed to do specific duties to within the, the confinements of that trust as far as management goes. But you can never enter a world of fiction with a quantum trust because fact and fiction can never meet. People who want to buy a trust from me, I will not sell them a trust if they don't know quantum language for one thing. And if they think they're going to use it for something that's not legal, I'm not also going to give you a trust for that. I, you don't have any amount of money you can give me. I'm financially independent. I make all the money I need. I'm financially set for life. Uh, I can't be bought, sold, traded, or anything else. I've had lawyers walk up to me with a suitcase with $2 million and say, here, go on vacation. Stop bothering us. I'm going like, I day trade that. <laughs> I says, I, I, I've, had, I've lost that in a day. That don't mean anything to me. I don't have adrenaline, so I don't get emotional. <laughs> yeah. No. Can I hold other objects other than my real estate? Let's say you, yeah, if you have any object that you wish that is paid for in cash that has no adhesive contract in fiction due to somebody else, you can create an identity of that contract and put it into, into the trust, like personal belongings in a household, for instance. Uh, you can put an automobile in there. A, a tractor, you know, farm equipment. Your, uh, by the way, all of your automobiles titles are owned by the United States government. You are only trustees to operate the vehicles under public safety law. Public safety laws supersede all laws on planet Earth. You get the smallpox, you will be put into a plastic bubble, and there ain't no contract, and nobody's going to come to your rescue that's going to take you out of the bubble until you're healed. Or, or correct. You have a contagious disease of anything. 
that threatens public safety, you'll be put into a plastic bubble or incinerated accordingly. If you think a 747 come here with 400 people on board has got a contagious disease, they're not going to hesitate to vaporize that plane in midair. It's never going to land in the country to expose it because once it lands, it would get out of control, so they would vaporize it. Public safety has number one billing. A million and a half people die every day of starvation. The world knows it. Can't do a thing about it at this point in time. Now, if they implement a Nikola Tesla coils, a uh, six-foot coil produces 200,000 watts of electricity, can be placed on top of every tele wood telephone pole in America, giving us about 100 times more electricity than this, cap this country is capable of using. Six-foot coil can be transported by semi, set up on top of 40-foot telephone poles, uh, and hooked up with very little <clears throat> cost, has no moving parts, runs on a superconductor, which is 200 times more efficient than a copper wire, generates no heat, produces all the electricity we need. The surplus would be one cent per kilowatt. All surplus would be used for purification of water as well as purification of air. 24-hour a day sunlight. Globally, the guys could grow crops 24 hours a day, seven days a week, year-round, with 24-hour a day of plant light above your, your, your fields. Uh, the electricity can be used to create nitrogen, which would be your natural fertilizer through electrical circuitry, and stimulate your crop, crop growth. Instead of waiting nine months to harvest a corn crop, you could do it in four weeks. <laughs> well, the... We, we have the technology, it's just that the oil companies, the, the hydrocarbons don't want this released at this point in time. However, if I'm president, this will be mainstream. I'll get up and I'll announce it to the world. I've already completely mapped out a complete program on reconstruction of, rather the construction of the uh, contracts, communication skills, uh, Nick, making Nikola Tesla coils mandatory globally, Ships at sea could be powered by coils run on, on electricity. Oil would never have to be transported again. Oil is relevant because we can have tar for roads, but then concrete is safer because you don't have all the off poisons leaking out of the asphalt. Uh, cars could be run on lithium thoride batteries, which have a 400-mile cruise range for every battery size, car battery size technology. They, they, now with the new discovery in Columbia of the new uh, lithium pool, there's more than enough for the next 300 years for all the, all the cars on the planet. And there will be more advanced uh, technologies coming out. Uh, you can go with uh, mercury, silver mercury with thoride, which is even 10 times more powerful than that. It's highly pollutionary because of the mercury, though. But there's, there's other molecules that we can, you know, utilize. Yeah? Would you need an ambassador to the Cayman Islands? For what? Well, I'm just volunteering. What, you like the sunny weather? <laughs> <laughs> hey, Indiana is great. I lived here <laughs> for 20 years. <laughs> yes? Uh, you were talking about the technology. I was listening to Russell Gould the other day. He was talking about if somebody has technology like that to come to you guys, if you guys can help bring that out. Yeah, we have we have people that have developed like uh, Bill Martz up in Canada. Uh, Miller is his name, Bill Miller <clears throat> in Canada, Edmonton, Canada, developed a a uh, perpetual motion motor. And this goes back about ten years ago. And <clears throat> I walked into his shop along with twenty of my other students from the seminar. He invited us over to his house and he showed us this motor. The thing was three feet in diameter, had a 180-pound armature, zero to 1,860 RPMs in two seconds. That's some serious torque. Wow. And then after it come up to speed, he disconnected it. It's hanging, it's hanging by nylon ropes in air with a dozen 100-watt light bulbs that he turns on and then accelerates the speed of it. And this thing's putting out 60% more horse, more electricity than it's generating. Because what he had done was, 
The, the series of magnets, along with the coils, were set up in a harmonic frequency to f follow the, the sine wave. You guys okay with this? Yeah. Okay. See, when you can syntax, syntax is the most powerful tool in the world, just for you know. Okay, use your standard sine wave. And if you're going to do harmonics, uh, then you're going to go... See, this here would be your 44,000 cycles per second. This is the electromagnetic pulse from the sun, based on the nuclear explosions from the sun. And we're showered at 44,000 cycles per second. And this one here would be <clears throat> 22,000. Uh, yeah, this hump here would then be 22,000, and this here would be 100, 110,000. The point is that you take your sine wave and you step it down from your coils into 60 hertz. And then you, as you step down your cycles, you increase your amperage and bring it down into a usable, usable voltage. So you have a primary, secondary, and a, and a harness power, which you cut off in substations. The, the, initial, uh, the initial voltage would be running out at probably 25,000 on your big lines, which are your big high 100, 100 foot tall power lines, and it also be subbed off into 660 volts, 440, 220, three phase, down to single phase, 110s for your houses, stuff like that. Just it's all basic electronics. I was in basic, I've been in electronics my whole life. I was building TVs when I was 18, my first laser at 12, and for my even my own perpetual motion at motor at 16. So when Marx showed me his, I said, what you've done is you've hit 1,860 RPMs. You have a harmonic resonance within your electromagnetic fields. As your motor turns, you got your series of magnets, primary, offset by your secondary fields, which are then looping in, in that manner all the way through going all the way back to the beginning. And then what you're doing is taking this electromagnetic pulse from the sun and you're matching it up to your power source here. These are permanent magnets and coils. And these were only ceramic magnets. If you go to rare earth magnets, which are five times more powerful, I've got one at home that's uh, about the size of this little middle of the pen here and it picks up three pounds. Just give you an idea how powerful some of these little tiny magnets are in rare earth. And so he's using rare earth magnets set off by these high, uh, these are superconductor coils. This isn't copper, it isn't silver, it isn't gold. These superconductor coils are what's called a eutectic metal that is 60 times more efficient than a gold winding. winding. If, if silver is 60, I mean, if, if, if copper is a 60 on a 100, psych, on 100 factor, and silver is a 90 and gold is a 100, then a superconductor would be 3,000. <laughs> Generates no heat, and it's really efficient. Using this technology as the loop, matching this up and harnessing the 44,000 cycles per second. This is in a motor scenario. The other one in coil is just taking the coil, capturing it, so you take uh, electricity flows at uh, 95,000 miles per second. Speed of light is 180,000 miles per second, exactly twice that. Here's the Milky Way galaxy. We're out here. Here's the center. This is a black hole. So the further you get away from, this number changes. Right now we're at a constant where we're located in the Milky Way galaxy. This is all understanding astrophysics. But you take... You take 95,000 miles per second divided by 44,000. So 44 goes in two. So each, 
Each winding of the coil has to be uh, 2,000. Um, that's in, this is in miles. And this is in frequency. So you got 22,000 miles has to be divided into whatever hertz you're going to be running. So this would be, if you're going to run a, a 60 hertz, which is above frequency, but you probably want to be in the 660 range hertz, divided in there, uh, so you'd have about a 30 foot, 30 foot length of wire for each coil. And then you'd, you'd just link those together to create the main coil to produce the frequency. A 12-inch diameter coil, about 8 feet tall, would put out about an 18-foot spark at 25,000 volts per inch. And you could stand in the middle of it like you see Nikola Tesla. And I got Joseph, he's my buddy, he's built three of these, and he, he's standing there with 18 feet of sparks coming out of his body. <laughs> Pretty cool. But they're all high-frequency sparks. But still, this is the science that goes behind it and how you work out the math on it to build a coil. Once the coils are installed with no moving parts, you guys could heat, cool, run your cars for one cent per watt, per kilowatt, which would be free electricity. No more hydrocarbons, no more pollution. 24-hour day lighting. The population is at 8 billion. For every one born, one has to die of starvation based on our current ability to create food. With this technology, you will have 24-hour day of plant light to grow unlimited amount of plants, up to 100 million people on the planet to feed them using airborne uh, horticulture towers, which run on mineral sprays into the roots. All the roots are exposed, just exposed to mineral spray atmospheres with 24-hour day ultraviolet lighting, which would produce, in, in a room like this here, you could make as much food as you would in 40 acres of land using this technology with 24-hour day of sunlight energy with this technology. Be basically free food. Uh, they do it at Disney World, at Epcot. They've got a whole center that's dedicated to these sciences. If you've been down to see it, that's really, really cool. The Chinese are doing it all over the place in China because of their food population density. So technology exists. They just got to apply it. Question? Yeah, Monsanto's got all that stuff going on in their chemtrails out there, which is made out of aluminum oxide, which creates a special condition in the soil, which only their seeds will grow. And that's to control the food, because you control the food, you control the people. And every time you look up and you see all those chemtrails, all, the, all your commercial airlines have uh, five to seven little tubes that stick out at the end of the wing. Two of them are sprayers that keep the chemicals in the toilet area of the plane because nobody wants to go digging around in the toilet. And that's where they do the chains out. When a plane lands, they take out the old pollution, they put in the Monsanto chemicals, and then they spray it out from the wings when you see a plane going over. When a plane goes over and leaves a little trail behind it about a 1,000 feet long, that's just vapor because of the temperature change at 65 below zero with jet fuel. And that's gone in a second. If it's a chemtrail, it's there permanently because it's a hard chemical of aluminum oxide. Now there's there's now now there is a there's a second side to this. It's true we have the chemtrails. But if ET is here that is unfriendly and the chemtrails are a specific type of spray that creates an environment that is harmful to an invasive species from another planet that cannot exist within this chemtrail field, then they're doing it as a global defense mechanism, not alerting the people. It might come out sometime in the future, but right now the cover story is it's aluminum oxide used for controlling the food and the planting scenarios of, of the world. Uh, the other second story would be the, the ET issue, creating an environment that is un, doesn't taste right so that ET can invade the planet. I mean, we've been sending out radio signals for 75 years now, so somebody's out there looking. So there's, there might be some good side or bad side to it. 
Question? Talking about ETs, where did we come from before we were here or before we are here? Your mother and father, of course. <laughs> <laughs> oh, it's, uh, I can't answer that because I wasn't there. And that's the correct answer, by the way. Next question. Uh, I wasn't there. Who said it existed 110,000 years? Well, I thought earlier you said about 110,000 years ago or something No, I said 50,000 years ago we had an ice age, and that's where the carbon dating comes from the spacecraft up there. That's all I said. The, uh, as far as uh, we had dinosaurs, you know, and we know 385 was was it, it was 385 million years ago when the asteroid hit the Yucatan, took out the dinosaurs, created a fireball that went around the world because it ignited the hydrogen oxygen atmosphere. There was a lot of methane back then too. <laughs> dinosaurs make a lot of methane. <laughs> well, are those dating methods accurate, and how do they know that? Oh, it's in layers. It's in layers of the Earth. Uh, I have a one of the largest. Uh, uh, megalodron shark's teeth in the world in my collection. The biggest one I know is at the Smithsonian Institute, which is six and a quarter inch shark's tooth. I have a five and three quarter inch shark's tooth from a, from a, from a 330 foot long megalodon shark with a bite radius of 18 feet. The ceiling is only 12 feet. So we're talking about a mouth they could take, it would be from this wall, from this divider to that wall, big around, and the teeth are all just shy of six inches apiece, and they're all razor sharp, and this is a 99% pristine teeth, tooth. It's got a little chip, little tiny chip about the size of a head of a pin on one side of it. And uh, the tooth was found at 11,600 feet in Denver, Colorado, or actually Central City, Colorado, at a gold mine. And I, it came to me through the Denver International Airport through a collector. And because I knew what it was, I knew where it came from, and I knew the history and all that kind of stuff, I bought it. I paid 500 bucks for it. It's worth probably around $1,200 right now to any collector. Good investment if you ever find some big ones like that. They were digging. Here's another one about this specific topic. Tarpon Springs, Florida, 20, 20 miles north of Clearwater, Florida, north of Tampa. If you want a geo, they, they put a canal in 2,000 feet from the ocean in to build a subdivision with water. When they got, 20, when they got back about 600 feet into the canal, they hit a cache of over 900 teeth that were four and a half to five inches. And these teeth were all worth about $500 a piece. And the, the workers got paid more money for the shark's teeth in that cash that they found from one, to, from one shark than they did in all the money to build a whole entire subdivision. <laughs> so, and you go down to, if you want shark's teeth, you go to Naples. Uh, and... and uh, Fort Myers is where people dive for shark's teeth, and they get two, three inches shark teeth. They're in the sand, you can sift for them. Uh, as divers, about 20 feet of water. Sharks have been going there for millions of years and dying and leaving their, their teeth behind. Yeah? Back to the chemtrails, what will be done to clean it up? Coils. Of course, we've got to find out what the cross is, and I guess only the president and a few other men in black know about things like that. <laughs> oh, I will. Okay. I'll get up on CNN. I guarantee I'll have a world audience. <laughs> <laughs> of course, of course, you put you put this you put this video up on on uh, on YouTube or MySpace or Facebook or whatever. The world's going to see it anyways. So, and every time we do a seminar, they videotape it and they throw it up on the internet. So there's plenty of stuff up there to study from. Yeah. What's going on at the Denver Airport? Denver International Airport, for those who have ever been in Denver International Airport, that little puppy's made out of Kevlar. That's the roof. 
looks pretty, don't it? Except it's all jointed, so it can all collapse and be flat on the ground. Now, underneath the Denver International Airport is a one cubic mile holding facility for 860,000 troops. It uh, goes down in the mountain, uh, and that's why there's a complete zone of about six miles completely surrounding the airport. And that's controlled by cameras and all kinds of other little surprises to protect that facility. And that's why it's way out in the middle of nowhere as nothing. They want to use that. They want to move the White House to the center of the United States, which is Denver. And uh, Cheyenne Mountain, uh, right now is a museum, but uh, Falcon, that's it. Fort Falcon, Falcon Mountain is where the new uh, Cheyenne Mountain enter, uh, enter of SAC is existing. And uh, they want to move our government into that location because of the safety. Right now, you can bring a submarine in under stealth right into the Potomac, and it's like one minute, you know. Everybody remembers the 4.5 or 4.7 earthquake in South Carolina? That was a 20 megaton nuke that went off underground about, uh, I want to say 1,500 feet underground. That was an ex And when they detonated those two nukes up in North Korea, same seismograph. Look at all the seismographic history of every nuke that was ever detonated underground. It's all the same number. They were moving one underground, and it went off. And it was just an earthquake, and it shook, shook Washington. <laughs> Yeah. Back to you about running for president. You said the last 47 were left-handed. Yep. I've seen you writing right-handed. Oh, boy. It's <laughs> <laughs> a good thing there's two pens up here. trouble with those bees yet. <laughs> Come on, Dave. Get your head together. Think. I did that wrong. It says, we the unknown, led by the unknowing, are doing the impossible for the ungrateful. We've been doing so much for so long with so little, we're not qualified to do anything with nothing. So, I can... Okay. Oops, wrong way. Yeah. Okay. I can do it frontwards, backwards, both hands, both directions. <laughs> I just run out of words there, that's all. I gotta do it in cursive though. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I can't do it upside down yet. I'm working on that. 
So that was, that was uh, I had a guy in Salt Lake City who came to me and he says, that's good, Dave. He says, but I can do it upside down, too. And he did it frontwards, backwards, both hands, both directions. And he did it. Then he started doing it all upside down. I'm going like, i got to stand on my head to do it upside down. <laughs> can't do it that way. Okay, why did all this happen? Okay, why am I ambidextrous like this? Well, it's because, like I told you, I died when I was 25 years old. They took out my adrenal glands. What happened next was, they said, you can't be alive because you don't have adrenaline. I'm going, okay, I'll buy that. Why are we having this conversation then? He says, your blood chemistry came back with 60 times more endorphins than you should have in your system, which makes me jacked happy and calm 24-7, right? Well, the endorphin of amino acid is the same one that used for the brain as food. So my neurons started multiplying because they had 60 times more food than normal, and my IQ ex ex exponentialized itself from 140 up to two, over 200 now, and it keeps going up all the time because of this super amount of food for the brain. And I'm always calm. Then you go ahead and uh, they said, why can, why can you do that? Well, what happened is when the neurons started multiplying, they grew together. The movie Phenomena with John Travolta where he has brain cancer of a fibristic cell, fibristic cancer. Well, my brain started growing neurons to a point where my two hemispheres grew together, so I have one brain. I see left and right simultaneously. I read 400 words a second, math codes from right to left, and I read words from left to right, and I syntax at the same time. I can't see, talk, or do anything without completely syntaxing it and writing it in the correct format in my brain as fast as I do it in fiction both ways. It just just happens. And I've been doing it for so long, for 12 years now, efficiently. And so anybody gets in my face about anything, I will give you a complete history lesson going back to the beginning of time and showing you things that are supposed to be. The book, Legenda. Legenda, in, in 1890, a, a Masonic temple was built in Austin, Texas. It had a footing poured eight feet by eight feet by eight feet to support a 44-foot chimney. Well, back in 18... That was in 1890. It was 18, 1860. 1860, they built that Masonic temple. And it was a, a, a three-story building. And what the man did is he took legenda, dogma, and the Masonic codes from 1851 and 1859, all written on original cotton paper, and he wrapped them in, in paper and dipped them in beeswax, sealing them in beeswax. Then he put a two-inch plaster Paris case around it in a wood box. Then he dipped that in beeswax and did it, repeated the process three times. Henceforth, producing a time capsule that was sealed. That sealed time capsule was then put into an eight by eight by eight foot concrete footing at the, at the base of this lo uh, Masonic lodge to support the chimney. The chief of the Apache Nation in Arizona was working under contract in Texas, West Texas, and, or rather in, in Austin, but he, he was from West Texas, but he was working in Austin. I was doing a seminar in Dallas at that weekend on Sunday. And his job was to take a four-foot wrecking ball and, and they had dug, dug out this footing and break this hunk of concrete up because it was too big to move. And when he hit it with the ball, out pops this chest, and he figures, ah, a treasure, but it was a time capsule. Well, when he, he opened it up, chopped it open, he found all these books inside. And the books were in, in pristine condition after 140 years. And he opened them up, and it says, property of David Wynn Miller, punctuated. So he throws them in a paper bag, drives 260 miles to where I was, and he walks into my seminar at 2 o'clock on a Sunday afternoon in a in a, with a grocery bag, and he walks up to me, and I, I knew the man. He, I was a chief in his own Indian nation because I broke the treaties with the United States Department of Interior and got the Apache Nation to put in casinos back between, 1890, uh, between 1995 and 1999. 
1995, there were 92% of all American Indians were on welfare. In 1999, all American Indians were off of welfare. And there's 190 casinos in the United States now in Indian territories. And all treaties have been broken with the Department of Interior because of my syntaxing. So they made me a chief in 14 of the major Indian tribes in the United States. With that said, he calls me a white lighter, for those who understand what that means, and uh, uh, brought me this bag, and he comes in there and he says, Dave, uh, I, I, I have these books. Do you know where they came from? I says, yeah, and I told him. And he says, they have your name in them. And he says, yeah, I know, they're mine. And he gives them to me and he leaves. Simple as that. And no, I'm not going to answer any more questions on that topic. <laughs> okay. So, uh, you know, curiosity goes forever. <laughs> yeah, well, you know, ask me your questions. <laughs> the, uh, we'll go back over here again. When we, when, we disc- when, we, when we disqualified the preposition as being no position, the article being a, a word of no contract, which gave you a no-no, we now realize that they had mistaught all of us what prepositional phrases were. And so we had, in, in 2000, 2nd of January 2000, we again came out with the position lodial fact phrase. We also brought in past time and future time, a 1922 book, maybe a reader, it was a 1922 reader from the Depression. I was in Las Vegas, Nevada, and, and a lady by the name of Joy brought me this book and says, read page nine. I read page nine. It says, to future time, from past time. I'm going like, oh, my God. All my technology from 1995 published to 2000 was written with the word to and from. As you know, a sentence can only exist with one idea. I'm going to the store from the house. Two different time zones. The sentence is is wrong because there's two different times. The future doesn't exist and the past has no damage. So therefore, we dropped all future and past, and it took me three months to rewrite my program, removing all the prepositional facts, bringing everything into now time. Present time, P-R-E means no, sent, which is contract. So you had three choices, the past, the present, and the future, all meaning no contract. So we had to go to now time. So we created the now time, and then we the conjunction, and and or, and is a command, and or is a is an option. Do you know that, that that lesson cost me $1,600 to learn what and and or meant? I had a real estate company, I told you, for 26 years, and I evicted one of my tenants. Uh, it was a December before Christmas. It said, quit and pay rent. And the judge was ready to sign it, and the clerk goes, you can't sign that. He says, why not? He says, because he gave you a command. He commanded the people to quit and get out. He says, you only have jurisdiction if there's an option, judge. This is the clerk telling the judge. It must say quit or pay rent. Now, if the or doesn't act within a given amount of time, which is 10-day notice, then the judge can sign an order for the sheriff's department to go out and evict the individual. He says, that's right. This is wrong because you used and instead of or. Start over. 45 days later, get a court date. 45 days after that for eviction. That's 90 days. Got to stay in my house for three more months, not paying rent. Cost me 1600 bucks because they used and an R. Anybody seen the movie Slumdog Millionaire? You haven't seen the movie Slumdog? I, I, I strongly recommend won the Academy Award that year. Rent it at the video store and watch it. It's a story about a boy from the age of 6 to 18 in India, it was made in India, filmed in India, and he got on a game show. It's a true story. And in this game show, he answered every question correct to win one million rubles, or one million US, which was 20 million in rubles. And what's unique about it is every question 
that was asked now flashes back to his position in life, that he lived the experience. He knew the correct answer because he was there and lived it. And that's what's unique. And he won the money, and he became a hero throughout India. Won Academy Award. And he's done like like maybe 10 more movies since then where they've all been really, really great movies. I mean, this is five-star quality. When I heard it, people told me to go see it. What well, I want to see a movie from India. Well, I've seen it four times now. It's probably one of the best foreign movies I've ever witnessed and for acting, quality, and, and, uh, and it's a true story. Myself, I'm the same way. I have been in court. I have written the lawsuits. I have made the mistakes. I've been through all these stupid things, all the landmines that you can step on, I stepped on and survived to stand up here and say, don't go there, don't do it. When I write a lawsuit for you in quantum grammar under the document, contract, federal, postal, vessel, because paper is a vessel, federal court venue, don't go into the United States District Court and talk to these people. They are a fiction. They are a foreign vessel. You are not in Indiana. You are in the Indiana Territory. Stay in your territory. In 48 days, we will file a fault judgment because if they don't sign the contract, I have a contract to dock my correct vessel as the correct court, as the correct judge, and the clerk of the court now becomes the correct judge. In the event that clerk will not sign the correct document and be part of that, it goes to the U.S. Attorney's Office, goes, excuse me, goes to the Attorney General's Office, who then will prosecute the case under the False Claims Act for forensic evidence. You'll get your money. Then it goes to your labor, goes to Tyrone Williams in Arkansas, who is working with the Attorney General and the IRS as our collection agency because they want their million and a half dollars for every lawsuit I write. And we're getting payout next week on these. So uh, this is a real thing that's really happening, and we have cooperation from over 1,000 attorney generals across the United States, both attorneys and assistants. Yes? Is that you next week? Yeah, they were, I was told last week, Monday, that we got 10 days till payout, which is next week. So. Is that yours? If yours went in before March 6th, you'd be in that, that group. Okay. The ones that we filed were dated for the last three and a half years, which were settled on March 6, uh, 2012, in California. And those are the groups that are being paid out right now. And there's, they have a continuous rotation now that each one of the quantum cases that comes in is a signed confession. The banks already confessed that these are legitimate, so they will be paid as fast as they come in or, or negotiated. Yes? send that to our cell registered mail to get the, get the corporation number to get it. Your corporation number was sent on your fault judgment. It's already been filed for you. I did it. Everybody that has cases in here with me, your cases have already been filed registered mail. I have your serial numbers. They're in my book. If you don't have a copy of it, I mean, if you physically do not have a copy of it, I have it stuck in my book. Right, but you would fill those in after the fact. But I have copies of those already, and they're registered. Okay. So, yes? So back to the mortgages, it doesn't matter what state you're in? Or... All 50 states are the same. All 64 million mortgages in the United States were set up by the banking industry to be a fraud, established in 1934 to be harvested. When, they ended, when the year of Jubilee ended, the anywhere from six to nine page documents that were used prior to that were all null and void. And in the 2nd of January, no, 2nd of February 2000, a new contract was issued by the United States Department of Housing and bankers uh, under the, from the post office and was standardized throughout the United States. There are variables between private investors and the industry and the National Banking Association, there's a slight variables. They had to file, follow the same criterias, but I have 38 different copies of banks that I've done. So what's, what's happening is I've syntaxed all of the 38 different 
mortgages. They take about 40 hours apiece to, to send tax. And then I just I match them up to make sure that everything is, and it's already been recertified by college professors and university professors and U.S. attorney's offices all over the United States as this guy knows what he's doing. This is a math procedure. This thing cannot be defeated. It's been tested in, in 150 languages in every country of the world. It's been proven to be an original program from A to Z. The website, my books, all original, no plagiarizing. I know of three people that tried to plagiarize and charge people $1,500 come to a seminar to, to mimic my website, talk about the videos on my website, and then sell postal badges to people for $2,200, thinking they wouldn't have to pay taxes. Uh, within, I would say, 8 to 12 hours upon doing a seminar, for this, the FBI was notified because my students are always watching. Uh, and my students are everywhere. And when I say everywhere, I mean that literally. And it's, it's almost impossible to get through a gauntlet without bumping into one of my students someplace who's going to immediately pick up the phone and say, Hey, Dave, we got a guy here that's identified himself to be you or plagiarizing you. And because you call me on this cell phone, my cell phone, you're talking to the FBI. Anybody calls me on the cell phone, you want to talk to a judge, just call me on the cell phone. The FBI will record it, immediately transmit it within a few minutes to, a to the federal judge responsible in that case. And he will be brought up to speed that I've been notified that now he is on my list of uh, people to pay attention to. And uh, you might go to court the next morning and find out your case has been vacated, that you're not going to jail for whatever reason you went to court for, and it's hands off. Get away from this thing as fast as possible. We have too many people that don't know what's going on to harvest. It'll be nice and easy, but if you touch this guy, you touch his students, he's going to drop a nickel on you, and you're going to have a problem. Yeah. Yeah, you can file that. That course, that, clay, that case is clean. It's a federal case. Okay, here's my question. Do I literally just copy everything, or do I have to apply a new stamp and reset? Oh, no, that you have to do. You have to put a new stamp on any new thing. Do not photocopy postage stamps. Postage stamps are legal money. You get, copy, you get, you get caught photocopying postage stamps. That's counterfeiting. That's serious. So don't don't do that, please. Just for your own public, for your for your safety, because then you're going to be the the government makes photocopies and they keep it electronically held in the computer. But that's Title 18, Section 1341, 43, mail fraud, wire fraud, to copy a lawsuit and put it into a computer. They have to maintain my lawsuits bonded together as a hard copy paper in the judge's chief judge's vault. It's not even allowed to be filed in the record room. You can go file and come back tomorrow and say, we don't know who you are. You, didn't, you weren't here. That's because the chief judge has it, and they assign a new case number. They take and they put a, another United States District Court paper over our heading, and they photocopy it into the computer so if anybody comes looking, which would be an attorney or a judge or a lawyer, that they're only going to see the United States District Court bringing you into their fiction under a brand new case number. Don't touch it. It's not your name. It's not your case number. It's not your venue. It's not your grammar. You've got 48 days. They don't do it right. We sue them for fault. Done deal. Attorney General takes it because they're getting $20 million, $20 million a pop off of these pocket money. So they're not playing games. They're going after the people, after the fact. And all of a sudden, like that judge, all of a sudden, he don't work here anymore. Where'd he go? They don't want to advertise that judges can be prosecuted or are going to disappear into the woodwork because of false and misleading statements because they don't want the criminals, the real criminals, the drug dealers, the bank robbers, the murderers to know how to get out of trouble. 
Okay, we don't we don't do those. Yes, go ahead. Yeah. Right. Sign it. Right. Well, use your autograph. Yes. What happens if we didn't do that? Yeah. Well, I did it. If you, I'm the I'm the federal judge on your case, so I have the authority on there. But as far as your personally, you should autograph that stamp, making you a postmaster, banker, and judge of your own claim to bring it to the attention. So whatever documents you still are in possession of at home, sign, autograph those. Fingerprint is a notary. Do not go to a notary, that's a fiction. Use your index finger or your thumb. And that is your notary on your autograph, like what you've got there. Oh, across their stamp? Yeah. Oh, whether you do or don't, uh, that isn't gonna change your authority. Yeah, no, as long as you signed your postage stamp there, that's the legal one. Okay. Because that's not, a, that's not a, uh, an imitation. I thought you were applying it to their stamp. I, I, sign, I sign that stamp because I'm a federal judge. Okay. And I, I'll walk in there and say, hey, I signed your stamp. I'm a federal judge here, same as I am on my vessel. So I can trump their ability to move paper from one jurisdiction to another. Question. When we sign across the file here, do we have to take our ink in and I do. I just, well, you see when you're in front of the clerk, she doesn't have a stamp or don't have a stamp pad. We carry stamp pads when so I go to court. Take that in and use our if nothing else, lick your finger and do it. You got DNA, fingerprint, and autograph. That's a triple certification. Okay, that's another thing. One is an opinion, folks. So if one of you stands up and says something, it's an opinion. Two is a certification. Now you gotta be certified, that's legal. Three is an authorization, that gets to move things. Four more is a class action. You need 16 or more to bring attention to the Attorney General, which we have, I think we've got over 16 cases now in Indiana. So the Indiana State Attorney General can get involved. Right now, Kamala Harris in California is the Attorney General that is working with the, because uh, she's got over a hundred of these now, and so they were able to use a class action and go to the go to the different banks and say, "Here's all the lawsuits, the syntaxing on every one of them is identical. They may be 38 different banks, but and the sentences may be A B C D E F G." And they may have moved the sentences around, but all the same sentences appear someplace with that exact phraseology. And when you do an overlay of the whole thing, we account for 99% of everyone to be identical, but the modification of the grammar with the math codes, you can flip these things and read 300 words a second, and in 15 seconds go through a 15-page document and say, this has got 5,000 mistakes on it, and that isn't a mistake. That's not a misspelled word, that's engineered. And in two places of the document, it says false and misleading statements is a criminal penalty, and a misspelled word doesn't change the, change the document. There are no misspelled words. The syntax is wrong in all 5,000 words. <laughs> it's engineered. It's not a mistake. Now, there's a thing called the McNaughton rule. That's M apostrophe N. McNaughton. N A G, I think that's how it's spelled. It's the very first word under the letter M in Black's Law Dictionary, fourth, fifth, and sixth, seventh, and eighth editions. It doesn't appear before that because the McNaughton Rule came out in 1966, and Black's fourth edition was published in 1968. That's why it's in the fourth. If you've got anything earlier, it won't show up. Okay, what is the McNaughton rule? It's called the right-wrong rule. The right-wrong rule means if you have knowledge of a lie, perjury, false and misleading statements, or fictitious conveyance of grammar, and you do it, that means you're guilty. If you don't know you've done it, then you can't be held liable for it. Like a police officer standing up and saying, I saw you go through a stop sign. But the way he said it, the grammar was wrong. So he doesn't understand syntax because he was never trained in it. 
But the fact that you went through a stop sign, if you can make an argument of physics, two objects can't occupy the same space, it'll get thrown out. But if you said he, you failed to stop for a sign, and then you, you just you rolled past the sign, or you rode through the intersection without stopping using the correct grammar, then you'd be found guilty, okay? And it, because it, he's a professional witness. And after all, you would be in a fiction court, and 99.99% .99 of the people wouldn't even know they're being hoodwinked by syntax in the first place if you didn't know how to speak in the correct format. So the McNaughton rule, the judge stands up and says, and Banks stood up and said, for three and a half years, I don't know anything about this. I, the lawyers wrote this for us. The lawyers work for the corporate. The corporate is a machine. The machine says, we're looking for a person. A person? A person is a corporation. We're looking for a human being. We're looking for a thinking person. The thinking person doesn't exist. So what do we do have? We have a corporation with a signed confession because this corporation stood up and said, I'm responsible for this. Give me the house. And then I have a signed confession for, for false misleading statements, and I can do my job, and you can get paid. Pretty simple. And when they, under the, under the McNaughton rule, they did this a few times, and they got away with it. And then I said to them, you know, doing something 6,000 times to perfection is not a misspelled word. That's a perfection of engineering and you can't stand up and say you did something 6,000 times and didn't understand what you were doing. That ain't going to wash with any jury. <laughs> and I got my conviction. They confessed, and we've already picked up $140 billion in damages since March 6, just to show you how effective I am. The judgments on my technology are the biggest in recorded history anywhere on the planet. And I'm the cash cow for the bank, for the government, for the post office, and for the people. Everybody likes me. Even the criminals love me because they're going like, if I get into trouble, I'm going to call Dave. <laughs> <laughs> so nobody bothers me. I'll tell you a cute story once. I got out, this goes back about 10 years ago. I got out of a uh, local watering hole about six blocks from my house, and I walked in there. And I sat down and have a beer afterwards. <clears throat> about 2 o'clock in the afternoon, and there was a large rumbling outside, and in comes uh, it was 38 Milwaukee outlaws. Motorcycle gang, with all their chains and their leather and their knives and all their attitude. And I'm sitting there, and a guy walks up to me. And he goes, <clears throat> you're sitting in my chair. This is 200 chairs in here. Go pick a different one. He says, you're outnumbered 38 to 1. I says, no, I'm not. I says, this is my chair. You go find a different one. So he pulls out a 12-inch boy knife, and he grabs my tie, and he puts it underneath there, and he says, you an attorney? I says, no, I'm a federal judge, and I prosecute judges for a living. I says, and you still go find yourself another chair. He says, you ain't afraid. He says, what do I got to be afraid for? You ain't going to do anything. He says, all your frazzle, I says, doesn't mean anything. I says, you think you can pull that knife? I says, go ahead and try it. I says, I'm going to finish my beer and you're not going to be here. <laughs> and he goes, what does that mean? <laughs> I says, do I look worried? I says, you're not going to be here. So uh, there was an Indian in court with me that morning as he watched me prosecute a judge. And he says, hey, wait, wait, no. He says, that's Judge Miller. He says, I watched him prosecute a judge this morning. He, he is who he says he is. So the guy... The, president of the club steps in and says, okay, put it away. He says, well, I says, this is still my chair. He says, I ain't moving. He says, well, let me buy you a beer. He says, there's an apology for that. He says, well, as long as you're buying me a beer and I'm going to be here for a few minutes drinking my beer, how would you like to know how to get out of your traffic tickets? So I said, you just go to court and you sue for the correct parse syntax grammar for the avoidance of perjury. Boy, that like rang a bell in everyone's ears, and this guy picks me up, puts me up on the thing, and says, do a seminar. <laughs> <laughs> so for 35 minutes, I had three beers, and uh, I did a presentation on grammar. And he, the guy goes, here's my business card. Anybody bothers you, you just call me up. We'll break their legs. <laughs> 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 so, and that was the last time I had a run-in with those boys. And I,
it's been pretty quiet. Nobody's ever bothered me. So I got when it comes to court stories, I've got dozens of them. Yeah, go ahead. When we file for the second one after you say after the forty eight days, it's gotta be forty eight at least. Yes. Forty eight to what is there what if you don't get on forty eight days, like fifty something? Oh, you got a year to file after after you know, so don't worry about that's as fast as you can file your fault. You're gonna take your your quo were on to a complaint and your fault document contract claim, and you're going to send it to the attorney general to the attention of the Indiana False Claims Act Task Force. Sent in by a third party. No, by you. You only got to do the first servicing with an independent party for the quo rental. After that, you can take care of all your own filings. You'll be given that form along with instructions of who to contact. Okay? So... I, I, I've got all this covered. These forms just came out the 28th of August. Today is the 24th of September. So they've only been on the market for four weeks. So as I, I've been traveling, I've been in Hawaii and California and in San Francisco, L.A., San Diego, Honolulu, Maui, Big Island. I've uh, been here in Milwaukee, uh, you know, in Milwaukee. But every few days uh, I'm in a different part of the world I move around really fast. And the U.S. Attorney's Office, along with the Marshal Service, track me 24-7, and every time I walk into a courthouse, I don't care where it is in the United States, they already have my pictures hanging up that if this guy shows up, you will call the Marshal Service, and the U.S. Justice Department wants to sit down and talk to this guy. <laughs> El Pronto. So it's always a lot of fun, yeah. You will not have a trial date for the document, contract, federal, postal, vessel at all. Okay, I'm talking about the... Bankruptcy? No, the... Uh, oh, the other criminal side. Bankruptcy. Okay. The criminal, when that takes place, I'm a claimant on your case. I'm a claimant on all your cases that I've written. That means you can put me on the phone and I can testify by phone. My question to the prosecuting attorney is, can you produce the law, rule, regulation, or co code written with the correct parse syntax grammar for the avoidance of perjury? I've syntaxed the lawsuit. I've syntaxed the DA, the, the indictment. It's physical evidence that have been supplied to you. Your lawsuit should be turned over to the attorney general in Indianapolis or in South Bend, Indiana, uh, which is where you have your federal courts as this individual at the state level is creating an illusion by which he is trying to say there's a law that doesn't exist to prosecute me under the McNaughton rule. And you invoke the McNaughton rule under the right wrong, showing why this and this person under Title 42, 1986, for knowledge of the correct parse syntax grammar, stop and correct his own paperwork to do it correct. If you have a complaint against me, then use correct grammar. Show me where the Congress, the Senate, the legislature, and the Supreme Court of the state of Indiana has created a law, rule, regulation, or code that is in the correct grammar by which I've violated. Doesn't exist, I'll tell you that right now. So don't pretend like you understand what they say. The, 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 the answer to any question is, can I see that in the correct parse syntax grammar for the avoidance of the perjury? And I don't care how many times you got to say it. Do it for an hour. You got 50 questions, repeat it 50 times. Repeat that again. Can I see? Okay. The word order is spelled how? O R D, a bound two consonants? <laughs> no contract? Don't forget the judge is not on your plane.
There. You can repeat that sentence to anything that fiction has to say to you. And in most cases, we'll vacate the case within that one sentence. Even when they ask me for my name? We did that already. <laughs> what is your name? Now, he's going to say, well, uh, arrest the nom de guerre, uppercase spelling, which is a dead person, name assigned to your driver's license because it identifies you as a nom de guerre dead person. And you're, as a citizen, you have your state ID as a nom de guerre identity, henceforth putting you in the jurisdiction, but you've already entered the courthouse, so therefore you're you left Indiana. You now are in the state of Indiana, which is the name of the courthouse, as a foreign vessel in dry dock controlled by the port authorities. While on that vessel, you have now trespassed, and no matter what you're there for, you're in a trespassing position, unless you have a United States passport and you have your paperwork filed ahead of time with the clerk of the court in possession of the stamp, put my business card on with a, a flag on it, a stamp, and you would then become a postmaster under the correct parse syntax grammar, advertised with your contract to say, I have a contract here with the correct parse syntax grammar. This individual sitting next to me who would be the DA doesn't. So therefore, you enter, you're in a superior position because you signed a stamp. You now become the federal court judge in that plane because that's a federal flag on a federal plane. You have a federal stamp and a federal flag on your paperwork, and you're wearing a federal flag. So how does a state court in fiction, where the judge isn't on your plane, now capture you? Your position then is to turn to the bailiff and say, I deputize you as my tip staff, stand to attention. I have a federal oath, and you can, you can uh, if you had one of my oaths and had the knowledge, you could back that up. I can back it up. But I'm also a sovereign. I'm also granted a sovereign's country, the, the director of my own country through the United Nations. As the condition of state in a world of fiction is so unique that the United Nations had to make me the 200th member of the United Nations. I don't pay a $1.6 million a year fee to the United Nations because how does a fact contract with a fiction? But the fiction still has to recognize that the condition of state does exist in quantum. Henceforth, I exist as a sovereign condition of state amongst the world of fiction, and I'm recognized by the fiction not to touch. But to be a teacher, as a plenipotentiary judge, to go out in the world and do so, as an ambassador contracted with 82 countries, have diplomatic immunity to that end. So I'm, once I got that, they locked the door behind me. I'm the only guy that does it. They gave me that position, and I've been completely honorable and trustworthy to that position and responsible, and it's published all over the world, and it's respected by the other countries. And that's why the Justice Department and the State Department and the, the uh, judges around the world are hands off. This guy is who he says he is. So what is the paperwork that I have to have filed in the court before I get there? As a person who has signed a stamp, you have a constitution in on your document. That constitution is like an oath of office. But to have a oath as a judge responsible only to your piece of paper that you have signed that stamp on and file an additional oath with that, with the clerk of the courts. It says you will only be responsible to be a federal judge on your own personal document for the correct parse syntax grammar. And as a judge, you're immune from prosecution. But you have to be correct at all times. If you don't know what to say, don't talk an adverb verb. <laughs> say nothing. You've got your paperwork speaks for you. Two plus two doesn't equal four. If you write it on paper, I can see what it equals up to. But if you're going to get me into an oral argument with 150 variables, you ain't going to win. It's, it's nonsense. So don't even go there. Or four plus four equals eight. F-O-R plus F-O-U-R equals A-T-E. Or A-T-E and E-A-G-H-T equals A-T-E. I mean, you know, we can do this all day long. 
Did you hear what I said, what I meant, what I said, what I said, what I meant, what I said? Yes. So, so he would ask, so do the U.S. send the mail? Well, it's like if the judge would ask you, so what, what, what's your mailing address? Or is this your mailing address? Say, this is conversation. This is conversation. So you say, for the claimant's knowledge of the facts, is with, would you say that? Yes, exactly. That you're asking him, ask me a sentence that's in written quantum language. You, you see, all the information is in the paperwork. And you can say, for the witness's knowledge of the fact is with the, the uh, document, with the, with the docked document in front of you. Because that is the court. You've given him written information. He's trying to get you into an oral argument. This is, this is a case with a man by the name of George. This is in Los Angeles, California. George was having his home repossessed. And the district attorney had him in tort 12 times in a year. Well, they brought me in on the 12th, on the 12th hearing. 47 people piled into the courtroom because I was there. And my contract with George was to vacate the case and give him clear title to his house. So George comes in, he gets before the judge, he says, I have... Uh, I have counsel. And the judge says, okay, counsel, come up. I says, the prosecuting attorney over here has 110 pages. I've sent text all 110 pages. It says absolutely nothing. He's used false and misleading information, fictitious conveyance of grammar, and has committed mail fraud because he's taken a paycheck for committing this fraud in the first place under misappropriations. The judge says, you're correct. That document does say nothing. I hereby vacate the case. George, you have your house, clear title. The court will not take it from you. And then the judge stood up, took off his robe, laid it on the bench, got off the robe thing, came down, walked over to the side door, a room about this size, opened the door up, turned around and says, hey, George, uh, congratulations on your win. Uh, George is just still standing there. He says, let's do something different. He says, why don't we say that the paperwork that the district attorney did here after a whole year now is actually a fact, and he did everything correct. Will you agree to that? Is that okay with you? And George says, okay. He says, take his house, and I walked out the door. <laughs> And he stood there after he said the word okay in front of 44 people. And he goes, and you, meaning me, he goes, are you Judge David Wynn Miller from Honolulu, Hawaii? The one that prosecutes judges? I says, yes. He says, you got 10 seconds to hit the door and get out of here. He says, because I'm going to have you arrested for trespassing on my vessel in dry dock. <laughs> And I was out the door because I was in the peanut gallery and I had three marshals chasing me. <laughs> I got out the door in time. But George lost his house. He stood there and he just glowed like a light bulb. My contract was to get his house back. I won the house. I got kicked out of court and he lost the house. So, Should have kept his mouth shut and walked out of the door. Yes. So then everybody, we went all outside in the parking lot. And I said to the people... Did I win the case? They said yes. Did I fulfill my contract? They all said yes. Did George give back his house to the district attorney? Everybody said yes. Am I liable? Everybody said no. Enough said about that. Let's go back to the seminar. So we all had, had a seminar this afternoon. <clears throat> Another case, George. This is a different George in San Francisco. We, uh, we go into court. This is a state court. George is, uh, he's there for uh, illegal detainer, trespassing for the third time on the property he was evicted from. He paid a $10,000 fine and was sentenced to two years in prison. This was the morning he was to report at 9 o'clock to surrender to the marshals. So 
He says, Dave, will you come to court with me? He says, I'm going to go to jail for two years. Is there anything you can do for me? I says, well, let's, let's go to court and see what, what happens. <clears throat> so he presented me with a six-page doc, six document for his illegal detainer and trespassing. I syntaxed it from the prosecuting attorney and wrote a Title 42 lawsuit similar to the same ones that you that have mortgages are similar to, or like your own for criminal. Uh, that was the, the basis for this lawsuit. The, uh, the judge, uh, George, goes into court and, and says, uh, Your Honor, I have counsel. When he, when he was asked anything, do you have to say? So I walked up. And I says, I have uh, bailiff. I says, uh, give these papers to the judge. And bailiff <clears throat> came over, took them, handed them to the judge. Judge immediately stands up, looks at him and goes, this is a federal case. This is a state court. He says, you can't file these here. Take them back. I says, that's a federal flag. That's a federal stamp. I hold a federal judge's oath on this plane in correct grammar. You don't have a correct grammar. I syntax your oath, and I syntax the district attorney. And if you look at that, I'm prosecuting your district attorney for false and misleading information. And that individual is facing a $25 million fine and 30 years in prison for trying to cheat this individual and put him in jail for two years at $75,000 an hour. Under Sanders versus English 950 Fed Second, I have grounds under Title 42, 1986, for knowledge of the fraud that's been perpetrated, and I am here as a federal judge to stop and correct it. Well, this is a federal court. I says, you're not even in court. You're on a different plane than the rest of us. Bailiff, I hereby deputize me as my tip staff. Arrest that individual for impersonation of a judge and arrest this individual over here as I have a warrant for a federal crime that he has committed, and here's his warrant. The judge goes, wait, wait, stop. We're going to do something different. I'm here by vacating all charges against George. Bailiff, I want you to go downstairs and erase him from the system. Give him back his $10,000 plus interest for two years, which is $3,000. Cut him a check for $13,000. George, all charges have been dropped against you. You are free to go out. Now, Mr. Miller, uh, I have vacated the all charges against George. I've given back all of his money. Therefore, there is no contract between the state of California and George. So therefore, you have no complaint because everything's been vacated. Prosecuting attorney is a Chinese man. Stands up and says, I object, Your Honor. He says, I just saved you $25 million. Just shut up and sit down. So he shuts up. And then she goes, wait a minute. What's your name again? This is David, full colon, David hyphen, win, full colon, Miller. Are you that, that, that judge from Hawaii? He goes, the very same. She goes, oh. oh, okay. I says, bailiff, arrest the judge. She took off and ran out of the courtroom. Meantime, the bailiff took George and went down. And then after she vacated the room, the district attorney just sat there like a bum. The bailiff took George and went downstairs and checked him out. So we're outside. About 20 minutes later, he comes out with his check for $13,000. Free man, didn't have to go to prison for two years. And he goes, I didn't get my house. I says, my contract was so that you didn't want to go to jail. My contract was to vacate all charges. My contract was to get your money back. Didn't I fulfill all my contracts with you? And I got 22 people there from my seminar that came with me, and they wanted to watch me in court do this. There it was. He said, well, you fulfilled all your terms of the contract. You made the case go away. George is free. He bought me a cup of coffee. <laughs> Third case scenario, IRS, Miami, Florida. Lady comes to my seminar. She goes, <clears throat> can you do IRS? And she says, yeah, real simple. I've won over $10 million in IRS cases, about 12 of them to date. She says, well, I've got to be in court tomorrow morning, 9 o'clock, in IRS court down at the federal building. Will you come with me? And I said, sure, it would be fun. So... Being in Miami, I was on vacation, and uh, I, I put on my surfer shorts, my surfer shirt, and my flip-flops, because I was on vacation, I go with her. And she, uh, we, we walk into the IRS office, and <coughs> the, uh, 
the IRS agent comes in. He's 33 years old, by the way. And <clears throat> she says, uh, she asked me, she says, what do I do? I says, well, give them all of your paperwork. Cooperate 100%. And the IRS agent says, are you an attorney? I'm going, no, I'm not an attorney. He says, do I look like an attorney? I says, I'm on vacation. So she says, oh, well, I want David to come in here with me. I just need some moral support. I'm kind of nervous about all this stuff. And she says, and he goes, well, okay, Dave, you can come in and sit next to her. So I sat there quiet for about an hour. Every time she, he asks for something, she says to me, should I give him the paperwork? I says, yes, fully cooperate. Well, the IRS was real pleased, the fact that I was giving her moral support, helping the IRS get all the paperwork filed. He wrote out three, all the forms from 19, uh, 2004, 5, and 6, three years. After the paperwork was all filled out, eight pages, she owed $38,000 in back taxes. So she then signs the forms, slides them across the table, and I says to the IRS agent, I says, uh, mind if I ask a question? Are you an attorney? I says, I thought we discussed that already. I says, that's a question. If she committed false and misleading information to you, can you prosecute her? Oh, Yes. So can I ask you another question? If she committed perjury in this interview, as you have a recorder here and you recorded it for the IRS, can you prosecute her for perjury? He says, yes, we can. He says, uh, you know, you want her to sign right here, is that correct? Under penalty of perjury? You know that under is an adverb, means no contract. P of penalty, which is a verb. Of is an adverb, making perjury a verb. You want to show me the verb perjury and penalty in the dictionary? Isn't that false and misleading information? Isn't that perjury by your own confession? And then I send text in the next 35 minutes, all eight pages. As I identify, I says, oh, by the way, I'm, United, I'm the federal judge of the United States, chief federal judge, and you just committed 47 felonies in front of me. Uh grabs up all the paperwork, I'll be back, takes off. About a minute goes by, and all of a sudden there's screaming in the back room. <laughs> yell, 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 yell. This goes on for like five minutes. Then the supervisor in Miami, IRS, sticks his head out. Oh, Judge Miller, you're here. Well, yeah, I've got a three-by-five picture of me hanging on the wall in there. So he pops his head back in, and more screaming goes back in. It's quiet for about two minutes, and about 12 minutes goes past, and he comes walking out. Madam, here's your form. All your taxes have been canceled. You have zero balance. You're free to go. Have a nice day. She bought me an espresso. <laughs> Tastes like mud. <laughs> so, I, uh, you say, I, I do a lot of stuff for fun. Uh, and and anybody, it's, I don't care. I've, I've, I haven't seen anybody that had a, a problem from any, any form of anything in the books of law that, that qualify that I can't handle. I do not do murder. I do not do bank robbery. I do not do drug dealers. I do not do rape cases. I do not do public safety violations. You drive 40 miles over the speed limit, have fun in court because I'm not going to defend you. I'm not going to say anything to assist you. That's, that's it. reckless and endangerment of public safety. I don't touch any of those cases. I have an agreement with the government not to publish lawsuits on the internet because criminals would use them for the wrong purpose. And then for that fact, it would go anywhere. If you do have a case with me, I respect that you will treat it with respect. If I am on your case, I will sign and fingerprint, or autograph and fingerprint your cases. I will be there in the event you have a judge that will sign that document and be a federal judge, or one comes out of Washington of the 300 judges that are assigned to work with me out of Washington in your jurisdiction and orders me to court by subpoena, I will show up and I will testify and do a presentation in front of the grand jury. 
I was ordered to Michigan after seven attempts to go in front of a grand jury. I finally made it in front of a grand jury. And uh, when I testified, we were probably two hours on the witness stand in front of the grand jury. And the uh, attorney general, who was cross-examining me, every single question he asked, I syntaxed and made an ass out of him. I mean, the guy was really beaten up by me on the witness stand. And then finally... I was on a witness stand, and uh, he made a comment to the judge. I'm going, you're out of order. The judge says to me, uh, Judge Miller, uh, there's only one judge in the courtroom, and it's my courtroom, and I'm the judge. I'm going, oh, yes, okay. And then the judge perks up and says, you're out of order. <laughs> <laughs> and then the judge says to me, do you have a passport? I said, sure, I got a passport, driver's license, insurance cards, MasterCard, Visa, bank cards, a checking account. I says, I got a mortgage, carry insurance. I says, he goes, I thought you were sovereign. Well, I am sovereign. I'm allowed two identities. He goes, yeah, that's true. You are allowed two identities. I just tell you what, Judge, why don't we cut, cut to the chase here? In front of every in front of the grand jury, he says, here's my passport. You're a federal judge. Why don't you go in the back room and contact the U.S. Department of, in, of, of Immigrations and Customs and run my passport? I said, it's going to take you about a half an hour to go through it. It's about 38 pages long. He goes, there's only a couple pages here. I says, run my passport. I says, then you're going to find out who's sitting in your courtroom. So he's gone for 35 minutes. He comes back and he says, <clears throat> Judge Miller, he says, I, I apologize. He says, I Here's your, here's your documents back. Very impressive. He goes, never seen anything like that before. 38 pages long it was, just like you said. And he goes, he says, Davis? He says, he's just made an ass out of you. We have no more questions for him. Judge Miller, you're free to go. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So what do I need to do to get you here for my court date? When's your court date? October 30th. October 30th? I'm going to be, I don't know, maybe I could make it. Uh, i got to be in Court of Claims in Washington, D.C. It's on the way, on the 5th. That's Monday. You got the fr I think you got Friday. Thursday or Friday? Washington's always fun around election Monday, time. Tuesday. Tuesday, that's a whole week. Well, I'm on your case. I can sit in court with you and... You know, argue the syntax. That's not a problem. Probably be a lot of fun. I'm free those days. I think we'll have an audience. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, I think we'll have an audience. There usually is standing room only when I show up. In Wisconsin, when I go to court, people come from 500 miles around to just watch a traffic case. You can't even get in the courtroom. <laughs> judge walks out in the court in the hallway and he says, Miller, come on outside here with the DA. We're going to do it outside in front of here where there's no witnesses. <laughs> and the DA's, DA's running down the hall. He won't talk to me. He won't talk to me. Except in quantum grammar. He won't. So. So is there a process for that? Or are you just going to show up and... Well, let me know what your dates are and times. Okay. It's only about a three-hour drive from walking. Is this okay for my dad? Yeah. Except that's the wrong flag. The wrong flag. Yeah. That's a that's a uh, one by two flag for one thing. Your your got the your blue field is forty sixty, and from here I can see it's a fifty fifty. Yeah. You can download one off my internet site. That's it's one. no, you didn't. Your computer shrunk it or did something, but that's not a that's not a print. That's, yeah, it changed the size of it. It's 1 to 1 1.9. The one on my business card is correct. I need one of the business cards. Oh, okay, well. No, no, they're in my, I had them in my, I had them in my bag at the, at the room, so. Just a couple of miscellaneous questions. If somebody, how about like put the credit bureaus or liens on your property or anything like that? Well, when you guys deal with MasterCard, Every time you sign your MasterCard, you're making a promise to pay. I mean, you took the money. Now, here's a little trick that you don't know about. 
When you guys use MasterCard, it's earned income. If you discharge it in bankruptcy, the government will wait three years and come back and sue you for failure to pay your state, federal, and Social Security taxes on the earned income you discharge in bankruptcy and sue you for 125% from the IRS, which you can't discharge. And you think you were in trouble before you couldn't pay your bills? Now you're in trouble with the IRS. will sell your home, cars, and anything else you own, and they'll come after you from that location. And... Uh, they, you can't file bankruptcy against the IRS claims, especially with that position. Okay, so the send tax wouldn't work in those areas? The, the send tax works except when you file bankruptcy, you are saying, what's in my hand? Nothing. You filed bankruptcy against nothing. Why do you file bankruptcy? You file bankruptcy because you want to discharge a fact. Bankruptcy takes the nothing and makes it into a fact. Therefore, the fact is taxable. How do you think England captured New Zealand, Australia, India? Is because England figured out way back in the 13th century that if you file bankruptcy against an invasive people, take the origines. They don't speak or read English. They only have picture writing. So... And their pictures articulate their land, their treaties, their boundaries. And there's 3,450 Origini tribes in Australia. But they got 10,000 gold mines. The country is a virtual mine of gold, silver, lithium, titanium, cobalt. I mean, it's just mineral rich, radi radi radiation, uh, uh, radium for plutonium. You know, all of our nuclear submarines are re refueled in the northern part of uh, Australia as they go around the world because of our treaties with them. Australia is traded on the New York Stock Exchange as a corporate entity, just so you want to know about that. The, uh, the people uh, just lost my thought. <laughs> The, the uh, England <clears throat> went into Australia, genocided up until 1957. They had a bounty on Origini people that if you kill them, you got to pay the bounty. Imagine that. England was actually hunting human beings like they do deer and putting a bounty on them. Just like the movie uh, with Tom Selleck. Uh, Quigley Down Under. Good movie. Uh, the Origines were genocided. Then they went ahead and they stole their land and they sold it to the unsuspecting settlers from around the world as they came in as new people. Then as soon as the people bought the land, the government came in and filed bankruptcy on the individual, bankrupting them off the land then filed a Title 46, Chapter 781 salvage claim under the 2000 Corporation Act under false and misleading statements, filed bankruptcy against the people, and through the bankruptcy court legalized the taking of the land because now they're saying the nothing contract of seizure was filed in bankruptcy, giving nothing value, retitling it back into the crown and then selling it to the next unsuspecting buyer now as only a trustee and a caretaker leaving the jurisdiction of the government in charge of the land and moving the originating people off who couldn't read and write and defend themselves. When I showed up, I wrote them a new constitution. I gave them international trade agreements. I gave them the ability in quantum grammar to protect themselves against a world of fiction. So they called me the spirit walker because I came in and prosecuted 129 judges and nobody touched me. Anybody else that ever tried something was killed immediately by the, way, by the government. But the government wouldn't approach me. The government wouldn't touch me. So the Origines, my name got shot all the way across Australia in a matter of days as we got somebody here that's special. And, and uh, that's the reason why when I came to Hawaii, same thing. Somebody special showed up and they made me king because I came with a bird. 1948, 1848, 
a, a, a prophecy was made that a white man from America would come to Hawaii and set the Hawaiians free. I wrote the apology bill that Bill Clinton signed and apologized to sealing the Hawaiian Islands. Then proved the Hawaiian entire history of the Hawaiian Islands from the international bankruptcy through World War II, and it was the post office that captured the Hawaiian Islands, not the United States court system. Henceforth, giving the Hawaiians now direction by which to prosecute trespassing. And who paid the docking fees for all the buildings in Hawaii for the past 200 years on a sovereign country? Nobody. It's about $64 trillion in back taxes that the Hawaiian people are owed, which they kind of perked up to. <laughs> yeah, wow. So then you take all of that, and then you go down to Australia, you syntax their constitution, null and void, write a new constitution in quantum grammar, giving the origines original constitution before the English got it, putting them in now control. And then going in and prosecuting the judges where they're running out of the courtroom. They're standing up bowing to me as the chief federal judge of, the, of, of Australia and New Zealand. And the origines are in there watching this. And then having two federal attorneys, two federal barristers, two federal solicitors, and two federal, uh, rather, state attorneys, all stand up, all eight of them, one right after another. We are in peril danger to move forward against the Origini people, as Judge Miller has explained to us as a chief federal judge here in, Hawaii, uh, in Australia, in Sydney, Australia, New South Wales, as to how much criminal activity we have done in closed chambers in the back here in the last eight hours. He can walk the walk, talk to talk, and he explained to us in detail the operations by which we are to be prosecuted as, that we don't exist as a government, as a court, or as a people, that we are trespassers. We hereby vacate our position against this originally who we want to sue. And that's been four years now, and that's a free, he's still a free man and there's been no activity. And that word went all over Australia. And I've gone to court 129 times. Every time I walk in the courthouse, it's like, bzz, Miller's in the building. Everybody's running and locking doors. Don't let him in your courtroom. He walks in here, and he's going to be, it's going to be hell to pay. Yeah. So will you also write that for the Indians? American Indians got the same thing through their treaties and now have 190 casinos on their properties. And guess what? The white man is losing money and they're buying back their own Indian lands with the white man's money. <laughs> That's poetic justice. Yes. Uh, you were saying something about the bankruptcy. Don't do bankruptcy. Don't do bankruptcy. It is, I have a don't think of how not to pay your bills. Yeah. Think of how to make money and be more efficient. Learn how.
paper. I says, we agreed on 8%. He says, well, I'm giving you 10%. I says, I didn't ask anybody for any money. I did my work. That was my contract. That's all I'm contracted for is work. If you guys pick up a million and a half dollars down the road or $7 million from the federal government and you want to do a gift to me after the fact because you have surplus or you feel you want to give me a gift, that's your business, but I'm not asking you for anything. I did my, we had a contract, I fulfilled my contract to you, and that's it. Uh, I, you know, when you got a gift, what is a gift? Okay. Uh, most of you are too young to understand this, but some of you are old enough. Remember the movie I Dream of Jeannie? Huh? You're laughing. You must have watched it. All right. What is a genie? Everybody knows it deals with magic, right? Okay, you have a genie and you have a gen. A gen is the grandmaster of genies. He's got all the power. So genie was a, a program uh, where as a, a astronaut opened up a bottle and let the genie out. And the genie fell in love. She's laughing. She's seen it. The genie fell in love with, with Tony and did all these crazy things trying to help him. And every time she used her magic to help him, wound up getting in trouble. And the whole TV show was a comedy. Well, along the way, genie goes ahead and she's going to use magic to go ahead and make Tony fall in love with her. So one thing about the word love it has to be free will. And if a genie violates the word, if the re, violates the free will of love, loses her powers. So genie went ahead and played her trump card, and Tony fell in love. Well, genie's dad shows up, the gen, and says, "You broke the rules. You got no power." So now she's back to an ordinary woman doing an ordinary, living a mortal life, and having to learn how to cook and clean and iron and do everything domestically. Well, at the end of the show, the, the Jen goes ahead and gives Jeannie back her power because she learned, learned her lesson. So then I got, I got to thinking about that. What would any of you do if somebody gave you power to snap your fingers and create things out of thin air? Give you absolute power over all things. What does that mean to you? Will you be responsible for power? Will you be a teacher? Will you acquire wisdom from this here? Or will you go out there and practice mischief? Well, I looked at myself in the mirror one day, and I said to myself, could you, or will you make a contract with yourself, David, that if you were given the power, absolute power, will you be responsible for that? And I said, yeah, I can do that. Ah, but would you do that at the point of death? In other words, if you violate the rules of absolute power, which is the word meek, M-E-E-K, that you will be struck down and you will die without cause. I says, yes, I'll make that contract with you. And what I'm doing is I'm talking to the mirror. So the mirror is a reflection of the opposite. But when the opposite goes through your eye, your, your eye it's putting your brain as the correctness. A correct image appears in front of your brain. So I made a contract with myself and with God that I will be correct if given the power to be correct, to fix it. And what is syntax? Syntax controls all the contracts on planet Earth. Parse syntax grammar. And so seven years later goes by, and I die on the operating table, and I'm reborn. And my whole personality is different. My six-year-old daughter walks up to me and says, you don't smell like my daddy you got green eyes now. You don't look like my daddy. My daddy had, had hazel eyes. you got bright green eyes. You don't look like my daddy. You don't smell like my daddy. My daughter was estranged from me until she turned 16 and then never talked to me again until she was 28. True story. My other, my other children are very close to me. But the point is, I did acquire the math interface on grammar giving me power on grammar. Grammar controls all contract, and contract controls all topics on planet Earth, all money, everything. So in what happened was I acquired the power over all things in all languages on planet Earth through the math interface of communications. So I made a contract, and I've always been honorable to that contract, and I was reborn again. 
So what did I get with the power? I get to have clothes, food, shelter, and travel, and have immunity, which I acquired through my diplomatic position of the United Nations as a, as a sovereign, as a federal judge. But I'm always correct. And every judge, anybody walks up to me or goes on the internet and say, "You're not a federal judge. You're not part of the United States District Court." Well, a district court judge is not a federal judge. He's a district demon god of the underworld for trickery in a closed area. That's what it means. I don't do demon stuff, anything. I am 100% mathematically correct in everything I do and everything I say on paper. And I am a federal judge on every document I sign. And that document is the court. And when we go into a, a scenario, we are correct in that court. And that judge is going to come off the bench and he's going to sign that document or he's not the judge in the case. And I will be that federal judge in that court in front of that individual and I will tell him so. And if he thinks he's going to touch me, he's going to have a whole world of hurt come down and from all over the world. And he already knows that. That's why they run out of the courtroom. Or they lock the doors. Or I show up in Honolulu, Hawaii uh, last year. And everybody talks about this. I was ordered to go to court and testify. I went to court. And it was announced that all the courts in Hawaii and all the schools were closed because of the high wind alert. That they were afraid the school buses were going to be blown over. That, that court, court appointed lawyers, attorneys, judges were going to be blown off the road because of the high wind alert. On that day, you couldn't knock a candle out with the wind. But I, was, I went to court with a whole parade of kapunas behind me. We got to the court and the sheriff was standing going like, Court's closed. It's Friday. It's been declared a court holiday. There's nothing on the books for that. All the schools are closed, too. The whole state of Hawaii is declared a holiday today because of the high wind alert. It's all over the news, broadcasted all over the world. When you, when you mentioned what is a gift, a number of years ago, there was uh, some deal going around called gift. You know, you pay so much it's called pay it forward. They made a movie. And I have decided because they use scripture to kind of smooth it over, you know. Some people almost went to jail for it. I'm not sure it's kind of quite a dull one. So I looked up the word gift in the dictionary. Mm-hmm. And it, it had a number of different definitions. But the one I remember is it said, your request is not my gift. Uh, no contract is... A gift is what it means. In other words, you don't have a contract to give anybody anything. But you look at the value of the situation. It's your own personal judgment to either participate or not participate. In order for evil to flourish, good people must do nothing. If you see a wrong and you intervene and you correct the situation, maybe it requires a financial gift to stop and correct a wrong, to give a person food, money, or hope to educate an individual with certain points of information. That then becomes a gift. Knowledge is the most important thing on planet Earth. If I take a little slip of paper a half inch long, a half inch wide and two inches long, what's it worth to you? It's a little piece of paper. You just throw it in the garbage. And then I write the six winning numbers to the lottery tonight at 8 o'clock, which is worth $300 million. Now what's that little slip of paper worth? called Points of Information. Aflac. Paycheck. He knew that if he went back and changed time, the company wouldn't exist to pay him his paycheck. So what did he do? He knew what the six winning lottery ticket numbers were going to be when he came back. So he wrote them down and put them away six days earlier. So when he got there, he'd have a paycheck of $15 million. Kind of a cute ending to a great story. <laughs> Point is, information is the most powerful thing in the world. If you study and you become proficient and you acquire the gift of syntax, you will know how to answer the questions and save people's lives and make a difference. I do it all the time. I do it as a parlor trick. Maybe one out of every 20 people actually pay me to do my job. The rest of them, you ask me a question, I just pop it off to you, have a tape recorder, and I'll give you all the answers you want as fast as you can. that recorder can record. 
because if you try to write stuff down, I'm not going to repeat myself. If you want to get in a conversation with me, you better have a tape recorder running because you're not going to believe what you hear in the next five minutes because it'll take you a month of research to just to pull it out of the dictionary. <laughs> those that know me, those that have done business with me, know that I once you get into bed with me, I take care of you. I answer your questions. I'm on the phone, available from 3 a.m. in the morning all the way from, or rather, from 7 a.m. in the morning till 3 a.m. in the morning. 20 hours a day, I'm there available, seven days a week, 365 days a year. How many judges do you know you can call at 2 a.m. in the morning just going to answer the phone and give you an answer to a problem? I'm there. I do it all the time. But only the people that are supposed to be there and talk to me get through on the phone. Look at all the millions of people, billions of people I have on my website, and yet only the people that are supposed to call me with important questions that are under contract with me are the ones that get through. Everybody else doesn't know how to do it. Yes, question. Oh. <laughs> oh, yeah, I have my, I'll be on Skype and two phones at the same time while I'm day trading and writing, syntaxing a lawsuit. It's called multitasking. <laughs> I can, I, can, I can use my, my right brain mathematics doing numbers and syntax and papers at, at one, er, uh, doing 300 words, uh, about 30 minutes, so about, two, about 600 words an hour. I'll do syntaxing while watching a movie. Didn't you say you fast forward the movie? So long? Well, yeah, other movies, if I've seen a movie once, like Gone with the Wind, I'll just put it on high speed and... <laughs> Now watch a three-and-a-half-hour movie in six minutes. <laughs> or for, 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 for entertainment, I'll walk through a video store and use one second on each title and go, like, I know all the plots, I know all the actors, I know the whole thing, and bang, 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 watch 20,000 movies an hour just by re reviewing my mind as to what I've seen in my life at 63 years. So I grew up, I was 18 years old before I had my first TV set. So I grew up with uh, a crystal radio that I built myself. Uh, I had to learn how to read books. I used a library and library card catalogs. I lived in a library 40 hours a week, seven days a week. Uh, and I did that from the age of eight to 18. So I was an information junkie. Studied to be a doctor at the age of 12, and at 18, I put it all the way and became a welder. Metallurgy, engineering, heat treating, all the things that build the world, because I was a builder. Built my own homes, built my own car, built my own boats. Built three cars, as a matter of fact, three Corvettes. I drive the only Lexan plastic bulletproof Corvette in the United States. Does 0 to 60 in 4.2 seconds, weighs 2,400 pounds, and is 380 horsepower. It'll blow anything off the line outside of a Cobra, which goes 0 to 60 in 4 seconds. But if I want to put a turbocharger on it, I'd probably get it down to 3 seconds without too much trouble. I built, I built one with lock positive traction. Took a universal part and welded it together with super missile weld so that both <laughs> tires sped at the same time. And that was a quick little machine. That only weighed 2,200 pounds at 380 horsepower. That was kind of dangerous, so I got rid of it. So, <laughs> so I'm to a guy that does stock car racing. Yeah. Uh, you said uh, you're like you're, uh, William, you have his phone number, dad has they're on the they're on the forms. I give you. So, yes. There was a gentleman here earlier that wanted me to ask you um, why, or if your if your patent would supersede the U.S. patent, and why. Why doesn't have any patents with the United States government? Is that what you're asking? Well, he just he just wanted to know. He wanted it to be on the video, so we need to come back and watch. The it. the United States government never had the correct parse syntax grammar to invade the Hawaiian Islands. Pearl Harbor was gifted in 1848 to the United States Postal Service by King Kamehameha the first. That was it. Everything else in 1893 was an issue of coal, C-O-A-L. The Germans, the French, and the Portuguese all planned to take over the Hawaiian Islands six months after the takeover of 
the United States taking over Hawaii, they just beat them to the punch because the population stood stood by 1893 at probably 60,000 Hawaiians versus 3 million invaders back then. So, questions? If you become president, will you, will you get the peace treaty signed between Israel and the Palestinians? Yes, Ron, I told you a story about Helm. That already was signed way back about six years ago, seven years ago. That's why there hasn't been any commotion there. They both are familiar. That was yeah, that was already done in quantum six, seven years ago. Even though the people are still making noise, those are, those are satellite groups, but the people who originally signed that have not been fighting with each other because of, uh, of the words. <clears throat> but then there's been uh, the people who were involved with the original treaties are senior citizens, bad health, some have died. So the new people coming in are not familiar with the new terminologies, and so therefore they're going drifts, drifting back into fiction, whereas they had quantum before. And if you don't take time to study, you're not going to be proficient. So every generation, just like ambassadors at the UN, are traded off every two, two years. They run a six-year ambassadorship, and every two years, one-third of all the ambassadors in the UN are changed out. So I, from the time I got my ambassadorship in, two, in 1999, uh, under sovereignty, I still hold that position as because there's only two of us, Russell and I. All the rest of the pe people in fiction are changed out, but I have a lifetime appointment as a director of a sovereign country called Quantum Grammar. So that's where that stands. Yes? Well, if you don't have a social security number, it's pretty tough to get a driver's license or a passport. And because the world of fiction, you can travel anywhere you want, except the corporation of airlines, trains, buses, and automobiles are all controlled by social security. In other words, you have to have that number to move between point A and point B. As long as you stand still, nobody's going to bother you. It's when you want to go across state lines or federal international lines, they want to have that, those points of information. Otherwise, I would recommend you send your identity, do a claim of the life, mail it to yourself, registered mail. That way you've got a quantum registered mail with the post office. Use that as your identity to go and mail yourself anywhere you want to go, registered mail. And then send yourself, put a post, like I did Russell. <laughs> My business partner, Russell Gould, is the only person in the history of the post office to be mailed from the United States out of Pennsylvania through Montreal, Canada, into, into Paris, France, and back to the United States, to Philadelphia, registered mail uh, by me as the postmaster, transporting him as registered mail to there and back in quantum language. They had no remedy for quantum language. Once we completed that task, all the post offices worldwide passed a law that said you must have three forms of identity. A ticket, two forms of state ID, which is a passport and driver's license, and a birth certificate certifying your location. Changed all the laws on the planet. He tried to do it a second time. It was not successful. The U.S. Department of Immigrations and Customs said, yes, you can go. We have no way to stop you. But the insurance company that controlled the United Airlines flight says, no, we will not insure you to get on our plane. You're not a dead person. Only dead people can fly on our airplane in case it crashes. There's no liability. Mm. <laughs> you must be a nom de guerre dead person on our plane. That's why all plane crashes never have survivors. Because they don't want people surviving. <laughs> Otherwise, they'd sue you out of existence for public. We're secrets. And a lot of stuff was lost languages. Well, because of our syntaxing capacity, we were able to break the codes on these and put all the correct language in, syntaxing these. We had cardinals and bishops for three days follow us around as we told them all the secrets. After that exercise was done, we then wrote an international bank treaty for Cardinal Sadana, and we were awarded key masters as the first persons to ever write a quantum treaty with the, with the Vatican. 
When we came back, we drove 2,000 miles through Europe. We then went from there to Bern, Switzerland, and met with the Universal Postal Union. From there, we went to Zurich and met with the German bank, Bank of Germany. And from there, we went back to Paris. I have a passport, so I was allowed to, to fly out. But Russell was mailed there, registered mail. So the Postmaster General of the Universal Postal Union in Bern, Switzerland, and the Postmaster General for the United States in Europe both had to vouch for Russell. But that still wasn't enough to get him through security. They wanted a passport. When the head of the Charles de Gaulle Airport heard that we were there as key masters, he came down to interview us. This, the man who was in charge of the Charles de Gaulle Airport is the great-great-great-grandson of the Joan of Arc, who was a key master with the Vatican. Going all the way back, he's a direct sendant. And when he heard that there was two key masters from the Vatican at his airport, he shut down the airport, held 300 people in a DC-10 for three and a half hours as he interviewed us for three hours and did syntaxing exercises with us for three hours about Vatican secrets using a Bible after which time he gave us red carpet VIP treatment through security onto the plane. We flew back and were accepted. We had to be debriefed by the post office when we landed in Philadelphia, but everything went smooth. Got him there, got him back. All, post all postmasters in the world were notified that Russell was mailed to Europe and back registered mail successfully. <laughs> As the, we're only, we're the only person to ever do that. And to this day, the post office still tells tales of the stunts that we have pulled and the treaties we have. I am also a, a, a muster master for the Pentagon with the Secretary of, and so is Russell, with the Secretary of Defense. Yes? Why are the secrets of the Vatican so secret? Well, first off, you don't have Manly Hall's secret of all ages. There are only five copies on the planet. Number two, you don't have a deluxe copy, which have been syntaxed by me. There's only one in existence, and I own it. So therefore, the secrets that exist are so complex, if you started reading right now on a six-page book that's 6,000 pages long, this wide and this tall and this thick, it would take you several years to get through that. And you would also have a syntax background to understand what it says. Russell and I both do. And we concur on different things. I'm 25 years older than Russell, by the way. Go ahead. Enoch. Enoch. Uh, I know what Enoch means, yes. But no, there's not a book of Enoch. It's a tale about a UFO. That's what Enoch means. It's a UFO tale. They made a movie called Enoch, if you want to get, watch it. Yes? Do you have with you uh, kind of the life, uh, like a kind of the life, life, birth, whatever? Yeah, it's on page two. Right there, page page three in the book. There's also one, the same ones on the internet. Just fill it out, put your picture on it, have your people autograph and fingerprint it, and you're done. It's called the claim of the life. Claim of the live life. What it means is that you have knowledge of what a prepositional phrase is, how to certify what a fact is, You've identified yourself, your mother, your father, and two other people with claims of a life have identified you to be a fact. That's all it means. You don't file a claim of a life written with the correct parse syntax grammar with the recorder's office or with the fiction government. <laughs> Why would you file a fact with a fiction? It's an oxymoron. It's only for you to use. If you want to attach it to a federal lawsuit, and if you want to go to The Hague and file a claim of a life, I mean, take a lawsuit into The, into the Hague showing that I'm a live person who's been violated under a genocide or apartheid situation, then they would accept your paperwork. They will not accept any paperwork from an individual who does not have a claim of a life. People, you cannot file lawsuits at The Hague. The Hague is a branch of the United Nations. You must be a United Nations member who has paid your dues of $1.6 million a year, and you must be a country. Private citizens are not allowed to bring cases. 
The Blood Diamond case took 14 years to get to court. 235,000 people died under the Blood Diamond Civil War. And that's why the Blood Diamond movie was made. For those that haven't seen it, yeah. A break? Yeah. 7.30. We're just, for an hour? <laughs> Oh. oh, we're almost done. That's all. We're just answering some questions, and you guys can get out of here. Because I'm the guy standing up here for ten, eight hours. <laughs> yes? There's a Republic. They claim they filed the case. Tim Turner. Tim Turner is under arrest. He was arrested a couple of days ago, by the way. Right. He's in jail right now. Really? Yes, Really. Tim Turner, re means no public. A no public document written in adverb verb is nonsense. So he's trying to promote a negative condition of state in a world of quantum. Therefore, the U.S. Attorney's Office or the federal attorneys are now using my quantum technology to arrest any organization in fiction anywhere in the United States that would take money or mislead American citizens. They're going to shut down the whole thing. In, in May 1993, I went on the radio to do my first quantum radio show. In six weeks, 2,800 organizations in the United States were put out of business. There was only 10, 10 organizations left standing. Today, there's only, I don't know, maybe less than a dozen that actually are still in existence. Otherwise, my technology has completely rolled across the planet and anybody attempting to start anything up, do anything with IRS, or anything, redemption, straw man, UCC, uh, acceptance for value, all nonsense, all being arrested under false and misleading statements. So this is the only program that's replacing the entire planet. Question? Fred and Nina Gutierrez. What? Fred and Nina Gutierrez. What does that mean to you? Fred and Anita. Nina. Uh, Nina. Fred and Nina? Set off debt. Set off debt. Uh, they'll probably be arrested shortly for false and misleading statements. I'm serious. I don't know anything about them, but if you show me, if you if you got a website, uh, something I can look at, a piece of paper that they've written, if it ain't in quantum, or if it isn't in quantum, I should say, it'll be nixed like that. Is copyrighted by England. It's private private property. So how how does the UCC affect us over here in the United States? It doesn't, or is it? Still Lawyers and attorneys are a work in a foreign vessel in dry dock. The foreign vessel <coughs> foreign vessel in dry dock of the courthouse is the same in all 250 countries using the same UCC, only in the courthouse, only by judges and attorneys and lawyers. It does not apply to the civilian population anywhere on the planet. So I could, so using UCC 1-308? No, it's nonsense. It's all written in adverb, verb means nothing. Yeah. Right. Anytime you look up all the words that have a prefix or a suffix, they, they, avoid, they are in void, a violation of now time. If you're not in now time and you're not correct mathematically, you're not correct, period. Yes? I was just going to ask, as we go along and this technology gets revealed, um, we'll probably be told these secrets that have been held back for thousands and thousands of years. Is that well, that I have 50 stars on my flag dealing with the 50 tricks and traps and procedures of, of correct grammar. They don't represent conditions of st uh, the states. They re represent the conditions of operations. And so it's the operations that I've been bringing out and teaching to the people. And every time the government goes out and they cook up a brand new plan to think they're going to trump me, I just go ahead and pull another trump card out of my thing and I trump them. <laughs> they haven't, I've shut the United States federal government down 23 times, the entire government, courthouses, uh, legislation, the Senate, everybody. So I've, I'm, a, I'm a world icon the whole world knows my name. We're probably bigger than when I went to Australia. The immigration and customs says you're bigger than the president of of uh, Australia. You got like four times more people on your website than he does. 
He says, who are you and what are you doing in our country? And so I pulled out all my gambling cards and I says, I'm here to play the gamble. I'm in your Texas Hold'em tournaments. And I pulled out my cash and I says, I have the cash to buy into the tournament. And I like to gamble. <laughs> Just part of my entertainment. I know adrenaline, you know, I mean, it's got to have something to give me a little kind of buzz. Doing it to, tur doing it to judges isn't buzzing me. Yeah. <laughs> Yes, yes, that was at Devil's Lake, Wisconsin. In other words, I'm a rock climber. I've climbed Devil's Tower already in Wyoming. Uh, that's a 1,200-foot face. It's as smooth as this wall here with little tiny cracks going all the way up to the top. And you get up before sun up, and you start climbing up that thing, and you get up to the top, of, sign your name, and you come back down on the backside, which is kind of easy, or you repel down the face. But I was climbing on Devil's Lake. It was 95 degrees out. I was on a cliff 100 and about 102 feet tall at, at Red Rock, and it's a smooth face. It's an inverted climb, which means you hang a rope off the top, it hangs six feet off the bottom, so you're actually negative climbing all the way up. You slip, you fall, you got your rope. Well, I was 10 feet from the top, and where my carabiner was tied off was 10 feet below from the guy who put it up on top. He had climbed down, but I was out of location. I went up the wrong crack. So here I am in a long, wrong, wrong location, and I had to dis disconnect. So now I'm on a 90-foot cliff after an hour climb, 10 feet from the top, and it's all smooth. All I got is a 3-inch crack in front of me. So I had to put my fist inside the crack and tighten it so hard that I could do a one-arm pull-up and do that hand over hand for 10 feet to get over the top, otherwise fall to my death. There was no way up, no way down, except to go over the top. The rock doesn't care if you die. So you're, you're there, and you have one responsibility. You either put away your pain, you put away your stupidity, and you tough it out. You get over the top. You pull yourself out of the situation. And when you get done with that, and you survive, everything else is nonsense. I don't believe that. And, and that's, that's what it means to, to do something. Now, I've taught all my children, all six of my rock climbers. My son and my daughter used to be teachers of rock climbing at Devil's Lake, Wisconsin. My son, Mark, he was climbing one day, <clears throat> and he had been instructing for three years. And we were up at Red Rock, and he had tied all the ropes off. I mean, he had done everything. And he was so busy doing what he was doing he didn't pay attention. Had his put his carabiner on all nice, his harness, tied his knots off, and then he flew his foot up backwards to to rappel down. Except the pile of rope was still ten feet in front of him, around the base of the tree, sitting there in one neat pile. And I was about twelve feet away, and I was tying my shoe. And I looked at him, and I looked at the rope as he swung his foot out, and he was always already past the point of return, which means he was going to fall 90 feet to his death. And from a squat position, I sprung like a frog and caught the end of the rope as he hit a 45-degree taut. He pulled himself back on and sat there and shook and cried for 20 minutes, realizing that he had just died and got his life back. And me, I caught that rope with both hands, and you can see the marks in my hands from squeezing. There are relevance in time, just like me dropping the bullet and avoiding things. There are some things that aren't supposed to happen. There are some things that have to happen. And after that, he was the safest climber, does a triple everything. Nobody touches a rope that he touches. He doesn't trust anybody or anything, but he is triple secure at everything he does now. At 18, he's now 38 years old, 20 years later. Eight years ago, he caught, his, he caught the edge of his foot on a roofing nail and fell 12 feet onto concrete off a roof, crushed his left foot, 
which is now titanium, and crushed his left wrist, which has pins in it. And so he still roughs, but he wears a harness when he's up on a roof. And he's super, super careful. That was the second time he was careless. So he pays very close attention now, but he's in a lot of pain. The bones change. Titanium doesn't. So, any other questions? Yes. Um, oaths of office. If they're upholding an oath to the Constitution, which is not the Constitution, but you're saying just to the state, is that what you said? All right, I'll explain what that means. <clears throat> the judge says, I swear to support the Constitution of the United States. Correct? Correct? What does the word United States mean? United means no citizen, condition of state. He supports the Constitution of the piece of paper that is in front of him between two or more people. As there are two people that are nom de guerre names on a piece of paper. That, con that piece of paper, which is the lawsuit, yours is traffic, his is divorce, yours is speeding, doesn't matter what you're there for, misconduct, everybody's in court for something. They want to collect rents. The point is every piece of paper in court is a different constitution of two or more people between him and the person in front of them asking for something. That's what it means. The word constitution means contract. So has nothing to do with Washington. So how can, for example, the oath that I showed you of the police officer, how can I use that to my advantage to avoid something that's going on? Oh, real simple. <clears throat> Mr. Police Officer, will you please take the witness stand? And he takes the witness stand. And you take the oath of office and you hold it up. Is this your oath of office? Uh, yes, it is. Did you write that? And he's going to say, uh, no, that was presented to me. Do you know what the word syntax means? He's going to go, well, no, I don't. I says, you signed a document, but you don't know what grammar means. You know what the word grammar means. Do you know what the word parse means? Do you know what the word syntax means? If he answers yes to all three of those, then you're saying, then you understand how to syntax this document, correct? He's going to say, no, I don't. So you don't know what you're signing, which means you don't have an oath of office with knowledge. It says you're saying one thing here, but you're just testified because you don't know what you're doing. Your Honor, this man has just identified the fact that he doesn't have an oath of office. Now let's say, I says, did you go to college? And yes, I did. I went four years of criminology, took college in criminology. Did you study English in college? Yes, I did. Did you study English in high school? Yes, I did. All right, did you want to know what the word syntax means? Yes, I do. You understand what the word grammar means? Yes, I do. You understand what parse means? It's a French word. If you don't, I'll explain it means parts of a word. Okay, that's fair. You can give him a hint. So now you understand parse syntax grammar. Is that correct? He goes, yes, it is. Did you write this? You're going to say, well, it's an oath that I signed. Again, do you understand what it means? He's going to say, well, yes, I do. Then if you understand what this means, did you modify your facts with adverbs and adjectives? Did you change the meaning of the syntax on this document by putting adverbs and adjectives in front of the facts? What's he going to say? Is that your autograph? Yes. He's going to have to say yes. He's going to have to say yes. He understands that he modified under false and misleading statements and fictitious conveyance of language and deprivation of rights under coloring of law, you just confessed to three felonies, and you signed it. Now, while engaged in criminal activity under Title 42, 1988, states responsible for all fees in this case. Your Honor, this man asked me for $525 fine here. The district attorney is a co-conspiracy with this here, as the two of them work together to ask me for a $525 fine. I'm invoking the Clayton Act, for a four times damages. I want to check for $2,200 right now. This man just commenced a treason in front of me. And the state pays all fees. Now you cut me a check because I have a criminal confession by a police officer. Can you take that a step further? 
If the DA wants to prosecute, yes, but then the DA was party to it, so therefore it's a co-conspiracy. So he's guilty of 22 and he's guilty of 22. And the state's going to go, I'm going to vacate this case right now because I ain't paying no bills. So we can do the same thing with the attorney's bill. Exactly, which says nothing. And judges. You, and judges. Well, not the judges, on the other hand, are not in the courtroom. They're on a different plane. You know, when I went through a divorce, the lawyer asked me for $1,700 worth of uh, attorney fees for, fi for fighting for my children. He says, hey, Mr. Attorney, take the witness stand. Oh, I don't have to take the witness stand. Client attorney privileges. So I didn't care about your client. I didn't ask you a question for that. I said, take the witness stand. You asked me for money. That's maritime law of commerce. You have to testify under maritime law of commerce. Judge Wazalusi goes, He's right. It's maritime law of commerce. You ask him for money, you've got to take the witness stand and testify. Well, his eight business partners that belong to his law firm all were sitting in the courtroom, all in a nice row next to each other, to watch him take down David Miller and make him pay a fine, make him pay attorney fees. I asked him the same questions. Did you go to law school? How long have you been a lawyer? And his answer to each one of them, do I have to answer that judge? And the judge says, of course you do. If you're not a member of the bar, you're going to get kicked out of here. If you didn't go to law school, you're an imposter. Do you understand syntax? He goes, yes. Do you understand grammar? Yes. Did you, is this your autograph? Yes. Did you write this document? Yes. Did you ask me for money? Yes. Did you modify your facts? Not your nouns, because they're no-nos. Did you modify your facts with adverbs and adjectives? Well, yes, I did. And what did they do? They modified. Therefore, you changed. And because you intentionally changed, is there any closure on this document? for false misleading information, for modification of the facts into verbs? Well, no. Well, by your own confession, you modified grammar under false misleading statements, fictitious conveyance of grammar, and doc deprivation of rights under color of law. And you tried to extort money from me under mail fraud, Title 18, Section 1341. That's a million-dollar fine and 30 years in prison. You feel lucky today? <laughs> Judge goes, can he do that to me? Wazalewski is laughing. He had, to, he had to stop himself from laughing. He was laughing so hard when he downloaded on him. He says, he's already done it to you. You just confessed the four felonies. You will write him a check right now for $6,400 or I'm going to put you in prison. And he did pull out his checkbook and his boss stands up. He goes across the courtroom. You're fired. I'm not paying that bill. <laughs> <laughs> and ever since that day, there has never been an attorney take the witness stand in my presence. They won't even let me in the courtroom. No. Aren't you a vessel in the, in the sea of space called Earth? Hmm, that's maritime. Earth is a vessel in the sea of space, outer space. All things are maritime. And that's, isn't that contract? Well, contract law, right. The contract better be correct or you're going to get nailed for false misleading information. But UCC is contract also. UCC is copyrighted. It's not allowed to be used unless you're under contract in a foreign venue. Foreign venue would be a spaceship landed on planet Earth from another planet, declared the fact that they are a foreign planet, I mean a foreign spaceship in dry dock, under law of the flag, wah, which is fiction, in advertising fiction. Therefore, when you walk in there with no paperwork, you've trespassed on a foreign vessel and nothing you say matters because you're not going to talk to them in correct parse syntax grammar. And they don't have to listen to you because all 8 billion people are foreign to each other, speak babble, and that's the truth of it all, folks. The only thing that matters is what you write on paper with a stamp, a flag, and the correct mathematical grammar, and you take responsibility for every word, your laws, rules, regulations, and codes on that paper that your punctuation is in the correct place. Even if you put something, uh, claimant's knowledge, I just took away the hyphen. Now I just wrote 413341234, no, one, two, one, Two one three four one two comma two two and four re no 
one one three 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 uh, period. So that would be a four. No, that would be a one two. But because of the period, because it's abbreviated, then all these would become fours. And then that would become a four also. One, three, four, one, three, four, one, two. Just have all the answers. Judge says, no, all the facts. Judge says, I have all the, he has all the facts. Judge says, oh, you do. He says, well, how is that you have all the facts? He says, you can ask me anything you want. He says, I'm prepared for traffic court today. Judge says, well, actually, I don't have time for this today. He says, well, we're going to continue this for 30 days. He says, in 30 days, you will come back into this courtroom with all the facts, and you will present your argument, as I'll give you a half a day before this court. So the man walks out, and he realizes that, and then the judge, before he walks out of courtroom, says, I want all the facts from all over the world about what you know about your traffic citation. He goes, well, that's a really big, big order, Your Honor. He says, you said the word all. So you said you have all the facts. I want all the facts or I'm going to arrest you for perjury and you're going to spend 30 days in my jail. So he calls me and he says, Dave, he says, I'm, I really stuck my foot in my mouth. What do I do? He says, practice the handstanding. He says, what do you mean practice handstanding? I says, the judge told me to bring all the facts in the court. I says, yeah, practice your handstanding capacity. So he got to be really good, Go run around the house all day long on his hands, doing handstands. Got his balance all tricked up. So he calls him back the day before court and he says, uh, all right, David. He says, I practice my handstanding. I can do a handstand for 20 minutes, walk all over the place. He says, I'm really good at it. Now you're going to tell me the rest of the story as to why I had to do handstands for 30 days? I says, of course. So then he goes into court, walks up in front of the judge. The judge says, I'm here with all the facts, Your Honor. And the judge goes, well, I don't see any paperwork. And he says, you better show me all the facts right now. So he pops a handstand. <laughs> he says, my feet are dangling in a sea of space and I brought earth to the courtroom today. I brought all the facts on planet earth. <laughs> As my feet are now in a sea of space. After the courtroom got done laughing, the judge says, that was a trick question. And yes, that's a correct answer. <laughs> Free to go. <laughs> You see, sometimes it isn't about syntax or about, it's about knowing where to look. So everyone in this room has a really unique gift right now. I'll tell you another little story that is relevant to the gift before I answer the question. Man walks up, uh, uh, Ford, Ford, president of Ford Motors, Mr. Ford himself, 1952, holds his annual shareholders meeting. And people come from all over the United States for all the Ford dealers. And Mr. Ford is amongst all of his executives, and he's having a conversation. And finally, his young executive walks up, 31 years old, graduate, cocky little guy, you know, and walks up to Mr. Ford and says, Mr. Ford, I understand you can answer all questions. He says, yes, I can. He says, okay, I got a question for you. So he asked the question in front of all the, all the people there. Give me a phone. I want the answer to this question. You got 15 seconds. Calls his think tank. 15 seconds later, comes back and he says, "Here's the answer to your question." And answers it. He says, "Is that the correct answer?" He says, "Yes, it is." He says, "You can't answer all the questions." He says, "You got to call somebody else." He says, "Is that the right answer?" And the man says, "Yeah, that's the right answer." He says, "I know where to look." And that's why I know I can answer your question. By the way, you're fired. <laughs> Being a wise guy. Okay, what did, I, what did I say that for? I said that because all of you here have a 
now have access to me. So therefore, if somebody presents you with a scenario, an argument, a document, anything, trick question, craziness, no matter what you think it is, say, hey, I got Dave's number. Call Dave. Ask me the question. Make sure you got a tape recorder. I will give you the answer. And you won't have to wait, no, week or so for me to research it. I will give you the answer while you're on the phone immediately. I haven't been defeated in 100,000 questions at 2,500 seminars, so you guys just cook up your best things. I hope I've answered everyone's questions here today uh, and showed you the necessary points of information that are necessary. Yes? I got another question. With all these people that know about you and have your phone number from being on the website, all your students all over the world, how can you have time to answer? I think you'd be getting 2,000 calls a minute. I get 200 emails a day. I hope everybody sends me by email because you can write things out and you get to think about things when you write them out. And so it gives me an opportunity then to answer them when I'm not on the phone, but between the phones and the emails and the lawsuit writing and my day trading and research. Uh, I do have a full, full mental capacity. Uh, I don't watch television because that's just... If I'm going to send text documents or actually get sit there and write, I'll watch TV because I, it gets boring when you're doing numbers at 300 words uh, every half hour. So I watch TV as a because it's all my left, my right brain does the work while my left brain is entertained watching. Or if I'm talking to you on a phone, I'll be syntaxing at the same time. But I'm always syntaxing. It's just automatic after 12 years, and I don't even think about it. My question is, how do you have time to answer all these questions? I do. I take care of everybody, and I get it all out in, in record time. Right. People that are doing nonsense don't get through to me. People that are actually legitimate, have a legitimate question for a legitimate reason, and have an emergency do get through to me, and I answer your questions. People are always, new people are always going like, you answered your phone. He says, I see how many people you got on your website. The numbers are posted. He goes... How can you possibly get, get through to me? Well, everybody gets through to me. Since I've been standing here, I've had uh, only eight phone calls. I'm kind of disappointed. <laughs> no emergencies. I know everybody's phone number and what they want to call you about. Where's my form? How do I fill it out? Did I do it right? <laughs> Same thing, yes. Oh, this was a compound noun. All my writings have underlined on compound nouns. But when you drop this, this becomes, anytime you have two facts, a claimant is a fact, knowledge is a fact. When you put a fact in front of a fact, this becomes an adjective, making this into a pronoun. Except the is an adverb. The only word that the adverb can attach to would be another adverb, but knowledge of, of becomes a pronoun because it's been modified by two adjectives. The first word in a sentence, always the authority always runs backwards. And the word and here is a conjunction. If I put a full colon after this, I would break it and this would become a real fact now. But without it, this becomes a pronoun. The pronoun has to be connected by an adverb. The adverb has to connect and all it does are adverbs now making this into a verb, but because there's punctuation here, this automatically becomes an independent pronoun. And these are all pronouns, pronoun, and this then becomes an adverb, making court to be an adjective of the word with, which now becomes a pronoun again. It's not a fact, so it's a nothing, because it's been modified. Here's another one for you. <clears throat> We're at the University of Atlanta, Georgia. Three PhDs in grammar are in the audience. And I'm about three hours into the seminar. And I write this little sentence up there.
the da is for the da. They're going like, lady stands up and goes, well, that makes a lot of sense. He says, yeah, but what does it say? Does it mean anything to anybody in this room? Why don't we syntax it? Here's a prepositional phrase. Can you put a verb in front of a ver uh, pronoun? Or, I mean, a preposition. Yes, you can put a verb in front of a preposition. Can you put an adverb in front of a verb? Well, the answer is yes. Can you put a, uh, an article in front of an adverb? The answer is no. So the only solution here is the adverb modifies the verb, which modif is connected to the adverb, which modifies the verb, which connected to the adverb, which modifies the verb. So I use the as an adverb and a verb. Or it's a four, one, three, four, one, two. That's also correct. Because there's no prepositional phrase in front of four, but for the, and as the word for becomes a pronoun, the is now an adverb, connects and then modifies the adjective is, which modifies the pronoun for, which is connected to the adverb the, which modifies the verb the. Depends on what the volition of the writing is. I'm going to read this out loud. Now, everyone in this room thinks in music. You have music in your brains. You've been brainwashed to understand music. Lawyers write in music. Uh, three, four, uh, three, four, four, one, three, three, four, four, zero, three, four, four. Uh, four, four, three, three, four, 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 one, two, 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 one, two, one, two, one, two, one, two, one, two, one, three, three, four, one, three, three, four, one, three, three, four, one, two, one, three, three, four, one, three, three, four, one, two, one, three, three, four, one, three, three, four, one, two. You see a pattern here? You're either doing a two step a quick step, a waltz, country two-step, rock and roll. And this is the pattern that the brain goes through. So you write with patterns. You read with patterns. And when you start getting into numbers, you see the patterns. Here the guy is using, there's a quick step, one, two, one, two, one, two. A judge would say, this is the way I want it. An attorney who doesn't know what a judge knows is going to go four one three four four one two. What is my exercise? I use the as a verb. I use the as an adverb. I use the as a pronoun. Three identity, three different syntax identities. You don't believe me? Pull the dictionary out and look up the word the. It's used as an adjective, an adverb, a pronoun, a preposition, an article, and a noun. And if I want to do it a different way, I could do a, a one, three, four, one, three, four. That's also legal. So now I used it as a pronoun, an adjective, an adverb, and a verb. Four different identities. And all four of those are all three of those are correct. Now, how would I make a determination as to why this is correct? I will look at all the rest of the thinking of the person, the other paragraph around it, and see which one of these patterns have been duplicated before. And that would tell me what his volition was when he wrote this part. If one attorney writes continuously in a one, two, one, two, one, two, and hits this pattern, I'm going to say this is his volition. If the next attorney writes this pattern and it's unbroken throughout the document, I'm going to say this belongs to his pattern. This might be Harvard, this might be Yale, this might be Princeton. Each law school teaches different patterns. So you gotta know where the music came from. And when you see the music, you know what your thinking capacity is, and you're gonna say, oh, Benjamin Franklin wrote this in the Declaration of Independence. But then he went ahead and he helped 
Thomas Jefferson write the, Declar the, the Constitution of the United States of America. But then there was a few other little individuals that got their fingers in the pie. So he wasn't the only guilty party up there. Yes? Well, we're only talking about English here right now. If you want to study electronics, mechanics, car repair, motor engines, technical schools, yes, there's nothing wrong. Remember, what is the law of the mafia? You keep your friends close. You keep your enemies closer. Don't forget, who is the enemy? The fiction is the enemy. Smith is going to come after you as Zion. The machine, which is government, is going to try and control you through videotapes, mechanics, automobiles, houses, contracts. So you've got two enemies in the world. One is a machine, the other one is a virus. So you have to exist and know who the enemy is. You have to be proficient to understand how the enemy thinks, how the enemy works. But you also have to know what the facts are and how to be proficient in the fact. And by doing so, you can protect yourself and your family and teach it on to other people. You know what the world of syntax pays an hour? It's a $1,000 an hour paycheck. When the world switches gears, they're going to need every document, every topic in the yellow pages rewritten in quantum language. It's a $1,000 an hour paycheck if you can write contracts for what is a refrigeration contract, what is a law contract, what is a real estate contract, what is a bank contract? What is a mortgage contract? How much do you think Bank America would pay you to write a mortgage contract in quantum grammar compared to the 15-page one of nonsense you now possess? I can take that document and probably, hmm, that's 6,000 words. Oh, let's see, 18 and 8, 20, 30, probably about 44 to 46 hours I could have an entire 5,000-word document written in quantum grammar to cover all the topics there, all the scenarios of weather, pesticides, pollution, contracts, and do it in quantum, at which time the banks would then pay a very nice paycheck because how much money is carried in mortgages in the United States? Anybody know that number? Hmm? Yes, it's trillions. It's, uh, it's a $60 trillion that's carried the mortgage in the United States. So, therefore, what would be your paycheck to just know how to write a 15-page quantum document for Bank America, Wells Fargo, Citibank, Chase, Wachovia, J.C. Morgan? Do the math. You've got 38 major banks. They're all going to want mortgages. Learn how to do syntax. One contract, you're financially independent. There is no substitute for knowledge. The only security you have in life is your own daily capacity to earn. Earn doesn't mean money. Earn means respect, love, ability to communicate with other people about anything. And as you go through life, you have to continually beat your own record every day. That means you will learn and improve yourself every day and be more than you were the day before. Don't cry about the fact that you are in debt. Don't cry about the fact that you can't pay your bills. I worked two full-time jobs since I was 12 years old. I was financially in the, uh, yeah, I was emancipated at the age of 12 with a paper out of 147 customers in 19, 1961. I had that for two years. I made $47 a week as a 12-year-old. My father made $60 a week to support six children. I had to turn over my entire paycheck to support my family, my brothers and sisters. At the age of 14, I worked for Sears and Roebuck at 6% commission. I took home $400 a week as a 14-year-old kid. You're not allowed to work in the state of Wisconsin under the age of 16. I had a work permit from the Milwaukee Journal as a paper, paper boy. Nobody bothered to look at my age. They just saw I had a work permit, so they put me to work. I wasn't allowed to be in the distributive education clubs of America where you go to school for four hours in the morning and you work from 1 o'clock to 9 o'clock at night at Sears and Robot until you were 16. 
I was only 14 years old in the whole state of Wisconsin. It was going to school in the morning and working at Sears and Robot for two years. And on my 16th birthday, they threw a birthday party for me, only to discover that, hey, you've been working here for two years underage. But you're the best salesman we have, and you make $2,500 a week for the store, so keep your mouth shut. <laughs> Money talks. So, and then when I joined the Air Force from 68 to 74, worked at A.O. Smith as a tool and die welder. But as a tool and die welder, I had technology and metallurgy secrets that superseded the government, the, the, the company's ability. At school, because of what I learned in metallurgy working for A.O. Smith, which, which had all kinds of pioneering technology that wasn't made public because of those proprietary copyrights. So when I went to school and studied metallurgy, I had secrets. I even had my own lab at home so I could experiment with things. But I had mathematics and physics under the belt as well. And when I understood coefficient of expansions of, of metallurgy, I could cross-reference coefficients. Once all the coefficient formulas were cross-referenced, I then could do grafting. And wherever the dots crossed on the graphs were stable molecules. So then one day, Bud Hahn, who was the senior welding instructor, worked for the nuclear power plants at Point Beach in Wisconsin and did worked on the nuclear reactors as being a state-certified Heliarc welder or TIG welder. And he could do all everything X-ray. Makes the statement, you cannot weld aluminum and steel together. And I'm going, yes, you can. He says, no, you can't. Never been done. Can't do it. I can do it. He says, that's impossible. He says, <clears throat> I got my own lab. I can do it. He says, I'll bet you your teaching license that I can do it and I get your teaching permit. <laughs> I was already had a, four years of college under the belt. So he says, I'll take that bet. I'm retiring. I'm 65 years old. So all the welding instructors, metallurgists, engineers in the Milwaukee Area Technical College and 150 students were all brought into the well lab. They set up benches, uh, bleacher benches, so everybody could see. And he gave me a half-inch plate of aluminum and a half-inch plate of steel and a heliarc welder. I set it up for argon and 2% oxygen. Oxygen stabilizes the carbon molecule. And I then preheated the steel to 702 degrees and the aluminum to 702 degrees. And I welded it together and he beat it with a sledgehammer and it wouldn't break apart. He says, there's no application for a 702 degree weld of steel and aluminum together. I says, that's not my contract. My contract is that I can weld steel and aluminum together and you can't break it apart with a sledgehammer. And it's a, it's a I can weld it together. That's my contract. And he goes, everyone in the room, that was Mr. Miller's contract. And he welded it, and you beat it with a sledgehammer, and you bent it, and it didn't break. But he maintained 702 degrees Fahrenheit at all times. When he hit 706 or 695, pink, broke apart. Coefficient of expansion, 6.3 versus 12.6. Molecules separated, fell apart. Didn't even have to touch it. But at 702 degrees, the molecules are stable. I knew where to look. <laughs> and no one else ever, and I got my teaching permit. And I taught college for three years full time. During the day, and I worked full time at night at A.O. Smith as a tool and die welder. What I'm point I'm making here is, if you have knowledge, knowledge is control and control, you can do what you want. So therefore, ladies and gentlemen, if you go through life and you have questions about syntax or about chemistry or about physics or about medicine, about just about anything, and you don't know what to do, I have a cure for cancer. I can cure any cancer you have. I don't care who you are. I can cure your arthritis in 48 hours. No problem. High blood pressure? Eat an ounce of popcorn every day. There's a little tiny molecule in popcorn that will cure your, arth cure your high blood pressure and your artery problem in 14 days, and we have 105 over 70 blood pressure. Yes? My nephew just got diagnosed with throat cancer. Throat cancer? 105 degrees Fahrenheit. 
atmospheric chamber, two atmospheres. That's a barometric chamber used for deep sea divers. Keep you at 32 pounds per square inch air pressure. I mean, 28 pounds of air pressure. Stops your blistering at 105 degrees Fahrenheit. IV drip, put the person to sleep. Use, a, use sodium pentothal to knock you out for five, 125 hours at 105 degrees. You will have tubes in, tubes out for waste, nutrients in, you wake up in five days, the throat cancer will be dead because no cancer can reproduce itself under fever. It's a 100% cure, no side effects. Mayo Clinic, Minnesota. Mayo Clinic, Minnesota will, has, does it. So does Atlanta, Georgia, Mayo Clinic. Only two procedures. It was discovered in, in uh, the American Indians have been doing the sweat tent for 400 years curing cancer. Remember, they go into the sweat tent. They hallucinate, see the great spirit for 72 hours. You hallucinate at 105 degrees. As long as you're in hallucination, your brain is at 105 degrees and so is your body. Because it's in a steam environment of hot rocks with steam, you don't dehydrate. You're inhaling enough water to replenish your sweating. And you drink fluid, all heat. And it's done for 72 hours. That cures about 99%. Some of your things like breast cancer, ovarian cancer, uh, throat cancer, brain cancer, 105 degrees, 125 hours, two atmospheres pressure. Oxygen level is 16.8, not 14. 16.8, because you've got to boost the oxygen by 2%. Creates a oxidized blood chemistry. And no cancer can reproduce itself under fever. 105 degrees stops reproduction, and no cancer cell of the 1,800 different cancers that exist can exceed beyond 125 hours. They will all die, 100% will die without reproducing, and your body will be purged. The human cell can go 90 days at 105 degrees. You only got to do five. And it won't, it won't they will have no side effects. Nope, you're asleep. You're under sodium pentothal, your whole body is completely kept asleep. You have a heart pacer to hooked up so your heart is is electronically monitored and timed so that there's no interruption of your heartbeat. And uh, use the anesthesiologist to create the chemical IV drip that will create an artificial fever. The atmosphere of the barometric chamber is also heated to 105 degrees so it's stable, both internal and external. If you it's not an excuse for murder. So I gave you the cure. You go to the male clinic, they'll take care of it. If he is, if it's, is it a child? Uh, he's old. He's, he's old. Oh, because if it happens to your children, uh, the Shriners Hospital in Chicago will take care of that. For children to have cancer or birth defects. So would they take care of him? Uh, they may if he's if he's poor, but Mayo Clinic will probably take him in if he applies for it. He's also hemophilia. It's a it's a five day cure. So my recommendation is go to Mayo Clinic, explain your situation, and you might qualify. Obamacare might kick in.
else. white rice corn. It's only found in white rice popcorn. It's one, but it when it can penetrate through the cells of a human being, and it will go in and it will clean out the plaque that causes high blood pressure. And in two weeks, you, you know, white rice popcorn. Air pop it, put as much butter and salt on as you want. Has no effect. Popcorn neutralizes cholesterol in the bloodstream. And you'd be right back to normal. <clears throat> Don't have to take your blood pressure. Oh, that's another thing. Anybody on Tylenol PM and you know this person, might be a senior citizen, Tylenol PM and high blood pressure medicine causes Alzheimer's in five to ten days. You won't be able to find your way back to your house if you're on that combination of chemicals. So don't do it. You can take regular Tylenol. But don't take Tylenol PM. Any PM medicines will, mixed with high blood pressure medicine will wipe out your memory. And you'll after in if you're in that condition, you're going to wind up in a nursing home, and there's nothing wrong with you. As soon as you stop taking it, it takes about five days to flush your system. Put a little baking soda, half a teaspoon a day, and neutralize that, and you'll be back to normal. Yes. Sure. Even though he sold the property, he can still go back after his caretaker fees, his guardian fees, from the bank because he was never paid that. They'll adjust. The amount of money can be adjusted for any monies he may have taken out in the form of second mortgages, refinances, stuff like that. Those all get worked out after the fact. But fraud is still fraud. And the U.S. And the US Attorney's Office is looking at $20 million bucks a pop everywhere for one of these files. So... Still cooperate. Otherwise, um, we, we've talked to you about different things. And, um, I guess my question is, do you have the proper paperwork and stuff that we need to take home today for his case? And then the mortgage thing, do you have our stuff? Do you want it today? Or do you prefer it to be... We'll have to get together afterwards and discuss that. Okay. Uh, I don't know exactly what what it is. I can read it in 15 seconds and tell you what you need, okay? So outside of that, guys, uh, I'm always available by the Internet. Uh, this is my, give me my contact information here. My DWAW. Are all my site is D W M address all current and uh, my M and the number lower case. So that's uh, that's how you get a hold of me. If you want to do video seminars for your, if you have a uh, support group, call me, make an appointment. We'll do a two-hour video seminar on Skype. Uh, I'm going to be unavailable until the 20th of October. I'm going to be traveling. Uh, I've got a bunch of seminars I'm doing in California, in uh, Hawaii. Uh, so, those are, uh, you can always get me on the cell phone and on the internet. I will have internet 24/7 as I have my own independent router that I is portable that I travel with. It works anywhere in the United. If a cell phone works, my router works. So that's about all I got for you tonight. And uh, if you cook up some good questions, send me some emails and I'll answer them. And for those that uh, Want to get involved with uh, doing lawsuits with me? Uh, contact me. 
I charge a flat $3,000 for anybody that wants to do the, the mortgage contracts and the syntaxing, the fault judgment, uh, any follow-ups that would take place, the contacts with uh, Tyrone Williams and the U.S. Attorney's Office, uh, any, court, any court issues that come up where a judge is going to get attitude, be more than happy to participate. <laughs> it <would> be fun. <laughs> So thank you for coming to my seminar. Thank you, everyone.